looks like we're on. We'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 9.30 a.m. public portion of the closed session litigation of our December 10th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. Um, in this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for our closed session. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Browns? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Yep. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on any closed session items? I see none. So at this time, we'll go ahead and adjourn our council meeting to our courtyard conference room we'll, where the city council will go into our closed session. Hey, shall we get started? Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, so I'm just going to go there for a little okay. bit. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. If I could get your attention. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you. We'll go ahead and get started. So welcome to our now 1025 session of our December 10th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. And if you could, clerk, please lead us in the Pledge of the League. I pledge allegiance. So we'll go ahead and um, be introduced to some of our new city employees. Um, we'll go ahead and start with our assistant director of libraries, Eric Howard, to introduce our new library employees. Good afternoon. Um, I am very pleased to introduce Rachel McKay, who's been actually with the library um, part-time since 2016. Um, she's one of our outreach um, LA2s. You'll see her often working downtown, but she also wears an outreach hat, which means she supports us in our jail services, um, which has uh, been wonderful, and we're getting lots of praise for all the work that we're doing there. So we are very pleased to, to introduce Rachel today. Wonderful. Well, thank you. thank you and welcome. I'd like to now invite up our park superintendent, uh, Travis Beck, to introduce uh, the new employee with the Parks and Rec Department. Morning, Mayor, Council. Um, very pleased to introduce Sean Sled, Parks Maintenance Worker. Sean is a longtime resident of Santa Cruz. He graduated from high school here and he's raising his own son here in the city. Uh, he worked for many years in the construction trades as an independent contractor and brings a very strong skill set to us in that area. He started with the city this summer as a temporary parks maintenance worker working at Neary Lagoon. And we were all impressed with uh, his work ethic, his problem solving skills, and really his positive teamwork. So we're very excited uh, to be able to offer him a position as parks maintenance worker. He's working with the central zone staff, so covering Harvey West Park, Poganip, and downtown. So if you see him out on his beat, please say hello. Absolutely, welcome. Welcome, Sean. And I'd like to now invite up our Acting Recreation Superintendent, Jill Bates, to introduce uh, the new employee. Hi, Jill. Good morning, Mayor, City Council. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Shannon Cotton, Recreation Assistant for Special Events and Special Classes in the Recreation Division at the Parks and Recreation Department. Shannon was born and raised, um, or born in Santa Clara, lived in Las Gatas, Monterey, San Diego, but was raised in Aptos, and she attended and graduated Aptos High School. She participated in high school volleyball and soccer, and she went on to Chico State with a volleyball scholarship. She majored in recreation administration, 
She had two internships, one at Pinnacles National Park and one at Glacier National Park. And her job experience, she worked with the City of Watsonville Parks and Recreation Department prior to coming on board here at the City of Santa Cruz. And um, she has a lot of hobbies. She loves to run the trails. Uh, she's anxious to get out and run the trails at Poganep. She loves to hike and camp and anything outdoors. She has a very supportive, close family. She has a supportive mother and father who she deeply respects and two older sisters that she looks up to. Shannon has a faithful pet dachshund named Ollie who she rescued in Chico <laughs> two years ago. And um, they have been best friends ever since. Shannon has hit the ground running since she came on board and took over an event down at the Santa Cruz uh, Cow Beach Surf uh, Club plaque dedication, and she did that all on her own with the help of some staff. So we have been very, very happy, and it is my pleasure to welcome S Shannon Cotton to the city of Santa Cruz. Hey, thank you. Welcome, Shannon. And last but certainly not least, we'll go ahead and invite up our water director, Rosemary Menard, to introduce her to employees. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you two new uh, employees of the Water Resources Group. These are two new water resources analysts. It's a new position we created last uh, spring, and these are the first two people hired into this position. These folks do all of our natural resources planning and monitoring. Sometimes you'll see them in the, uh, in the lagoon on the San Lorenzo River doing fish counts. They also do a lot of other work related to watershed management and environmental compliance, so we're really lucky to have both of them. Uh, the first time I'm going to introduce is Randy Holloway. Randy brings to us a master's in watershed science from uh, Cal State University at Monterey Bay, and he has a BA in philosophy from UCSC. So uh, those two things should go together somehow. I'm not sure exactly, but. Uh, and he's, um, he's been a staff scientist at several local environmental engineering companies. He's uh, done water treatment equipment sales and installation and a previous internship and part-time technical assistant before with our water resources group. He lives in Santa Cruz since 1986. He's drummed in many different bands around town and enjoys all of the outdoor activities activities we have here. So please welcome Randy. And next I want to um, introduce to you Marina uh, Sadoric, and she's also um, brings a graduate degree. Uh, she's a graduate of UCSC in environmental studies and biology. She's got a lot of good experience as a, a fisheries scientist, so that's really big, a big help for us in a lot of the work that we're doing. She uh, was a scientific aide at Cal Fish and Wildlife, completing stream monitoring work related to salmon and steelhead populations in Santa Cruz and San Mateo County. And then she also worked as a fisheries biologist for Pacific State Marines Fisheries Commission, managing coho and steelhead population monitoring projects in Santa Cruz and San Mateo County. She grew up in Monterey. She's uh, got water in her blood, I think. She's volunteered at the Monterey Bay Aquarium since high school, so 12 years of that. And she enjoys backpacking and gardening. So please help us welcome Marina. Welcome, welcome all the new city employees. Thank you for choosing to work for the city of Santa Cruz. So we'll go ahead and move right along to our presentations, which I think many of you in, in the room are here for. And it's a real treat and honor to be able to present the 2019 Officer Jim Howe's Community Service Award. And I'll just say a few remarks about the award. So the Officer Jim Howe's Community Service Award is an annual award given to community members and city employees for outstanding service to the Santa Cruz community. The award was created in honor of 
Officer House, who retired in 2007, and after serving as a Santa Cruz police officer for 26 years, and I had an opportunity actually to work with him briefly as he worked at the County Office of Education after that. He was known throughout the city for his positive approach and partnership building between the city and the Santa Cruz community. Officer House Community Service Award honors his legacy of positive collaboration problem solving and recipients of the award are found to exhibit extraordinary dedication and efforts through improving the quality of life in Santa Cruz through constructive solution oriented work to work in collaboration with the city or city departments and other community stakeholders and embody a spirit of cooperation between the city and the community and set a positive tone that inspires and motivates others. And those who knew Jim know he really did embody those characteristics. So this year's nominees included so very many impressive and worthy community members and city employees who were nominated and made it being part of the committee um, for selecting it very, very difficult. And so um, at this time, I'd like to um, really acknowledge all those who were nominated and provide certificates to the nominees, and then we'll go ahead and provide the certificates to the recipients of the awards. So if um, you could um, come and accept your certificate as nominees um, when I read your name, and I'd like to just read a little brief sort of paragraph about your um, the, the uh, characteristics you uh, displayed. So first I have Amanda Rotella as a, a 2019 city employee nominee. <laughs> I'd like to um, just acknowledge her demonstration of extraordinary dedication and effectiveness to improve the quality of life for the Santa Cruz community through a positive collaborative solution oriented approach. As well as Mike Hopper as a nominee. <laughs> and we have Claire Fleisler as a nominee. Is she here, Claire? I'm not sure if she's able to make it. And, and Sergeant John Bush, who was unable to make it. So we'll go ahead and um, hand out these certificates, and thank you for being here and for your extraordinary work. John Bush. Yes. So congratulations, um, your colleagues and supervisors all recognize the amazing contributions that you all provide to our city. And I wanna thank you so much for your uh, service. So this year, our selection committee uh, met and we chose the following recipients for the 2019 Jim House Award. One recipient from the community and the other a city employee. And I'll start with our community recipient of the 2019 Jim House Award, um, and that's Dr. David Ravel. And go ahead and come on up. David Ravel is a PhD, is a uh, principal of Ravel Coastal, and is a well-known and respected member of the community who is dedicated to improving the sustainable quality of life for our community through his professional and volunteer efforts uh, to collaboratively and thoughtfully protect our local coastal resources and watershed from sea level rise, both now and in the future. He has been an incredible advocate, asset, and partner for the city of Santa Cruz, its coastal resources resources, and by extension, the community at large. In the course of his efforts, he has worked co collaboratively with countless local stakeholders. Thank you for your service, David.
And so this year's city employee recipient of the 2019 Jim House Award is Jill Bates. served as a member of the Parks and Recreation Department for over 35 years. Her collaboration with the Santa Cruz Fire Department and the Junior Lifeguards Program and the engagement with youth and families have led to hundreds of youth going through that program, learning about water safety, but most importantly, learning about what it means to be a leader. She has also been the city's leader with all aspects of Little League, youth sports, adult league sports, and is well known for her organization and energy among the local sports community. Her dedication to providing quality services and outstanding programs to Santa Cruz is virtually unparalleled. So thank you for your service, Jill, and congratulations. For like to say this this has actually been an honor and a pleasure to be a part of the city of Santa Cruz and work for our community and all of you and I am in ex great company <laughs> Well, congratulations to the recipients of the award, to the nominees, and I want to thank all of you who are here to support um, this recognition. Thank you for being here and for your service to the community and also the recognition of those who you work alongside. Um, so at this moment, we'll go ahead and conclude this part of the ceremony and we'll move into the next presentation. And um, you're welcome to, if, if you'd like to transition how you'd like if you're not here for the next portion. So our next uh, presentation is the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And we have Felicia Van Stolk, who is the new executive director of the Museum of Natural History. And welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity to introduce myself. Um, as the new director of the Museum of Natural History, um, I'd like to thank you for your time and your support of the museum. Um, and just wanted to share a little update about, about the museum. We are going to be closing our doors very soon for just a brief closure, and so I hope you're able to join us for the holiday or before the holidays. Um, and if not, join us in the new year on January 10th for our grand reopening. We will have a new exhibit focusing on mushrooms. And there will also be some exciting renovations in our historic building that we're looking forward to sharing uh, with all of you. I've also brought some annual reports here to share some of our recent successes, if I can. 
particular, I would like to, I'm particularly proud of how many local students we've been able to serve through the museum's programs. Um, last year, we spent 250 hours outside in city parks with over 7,000 students and parents. Um, and I'd like to add that many of those students and parents are super thrilled with uh, the recent TLC that the whale got in our park, so thank you for that. As soon as the whale was open, it was covered in children. It's lovely. Um, I just love how much love the parks have been getting today and in general, how um, the, the emphasis on loving our trails and the nature we have here. It, it makes our mission so achievable, the connecting people to nature and science and promoting stewardship. I consider the city of Santa Cruz an essential partner with us in that mission. Um, and some of you might know that the city ran the museum for over 100 years before we became an independent nonprofit. So I'm also here to thank you for your support and especially another shout out to the Parks and Rec Department for their support as we have become our own independent nonprofit um, while maintaining that strong partnership with the city. Um, and to that end, um, as a gesture of our gratitude, I have brought a present. Uh, this painting here is by a local artist, Megan Nikau, who has hung her art in um, our Art of Nature Science Illustration exhibit for many years. And it shows a mandala of a food web that supports sea otters and kelp forests things that make our bay very special. And I love that this mandala also emphasizes the importance of interconnectedness and relationships. It reminds us of important relationships like the one between the museum and the city. Um, those are things that make our, our community strong and special, just like our kelp forest. So thank you for your support, and I hope to see you all at the museum soon. Well, thank you so much for that, for the presentation and, and naturally just that beautiful piece of art and the symbolism behind that. And as a parent who had a, a student who just went through your program, I can really attest to the inc incredible services you're providing to our children. So thank you very much. Councilmember Myers. And I just want to uh, recognize Felicia and welcome her as our new executive director. Felicia is born and raised here. She's also the first um, woman executive director at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And and so um, we're very pleased to have her here, and she's going to continue to educate our children uh, countywide on nature and science into the future. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, our next presentation is for Rick Martinez. Oh, and it's bittersweet because it's 30 years of service, but it's a retirement um, moment and proclamation. So um, I'm honored to be in this position to be able to sign this proclamation to mark this moment in your career. If I can, maybe I'll just read a few of the whereases and then let you have the mic. You are the mayor. <laughs> For a little bit longer, so you know what? I'll go ahead and do that. So, whereas on June 1st, 1989, Richard Martinez was hired as a beach ranger, park ranger by the city of Santa Cruz Parks and Rec Department. And I'll skip a good portion because I want you to be able to say your words. But whereas Richard Martinez currently serves on or has served on numerous boards and committees, and on December 19th, 2019, um, Rick Martinez will be retiring and will be honored for being an out, outstanding example of loyalty and a tremendous asset to the city of Santa Cruz, its community, our community, and its police department, and long remembered and appreciated for both his friendship and for his 30 years of commendable service, and he will be sorely missed. So it's my pleasure as mayor for a little bit longer to hereby proclaim today, or to hereby proclaim, excuse me, December 19th, 2019, as uh, Richard Martinez re Retirement Day in the city of Santa Cruz. And I encourage our entire city, the coworkers, and others to join me in expressing our heartfelt appreciation for your 30 years of service and dedicated exemplary service and numerous contributions that I've been able to observe, particularly in education and for the Santa Cruz Police Department in the city of Santa Cruz. We really wish you well in your retirement. So congratulations. Thank you, Mayor.
Yeah, this is definitely a bittersweet moment for me. Um, I think as the mayor mentioned, I've spent my entire adult life as an employee of the city of Santa Cruz. So um, it's really become my home and, uh, and I wanted to, to really share some comments uh, about my journey and kind of how I got here today, especially since this will probably be the last time I'll be talking to you uh, as an employee of the city of Santa Cruz and as your deputy chief of police. So uh, let me start. Um, took some notes because I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, still from the heart, it's just concise from the heart. <laughs> That's for your timeline today. Like my grandparents and parents, I was raised here in Santa Cruz. Despite having a multi-generational uh, community ties, I spent my youth living in several low-income Section 8 housing units throughout the city and county with my mother and my younger sister. That is when we could find housing. So I, fig so I have firsthand lived experience with many of the core issues our community continues to struggle with which is why I wanted to take this opportunity to implore you to continue to collaborate and advocate for an increase in affordable housing and bed space for those suffering with behavioral health issues and those struggling with addiction. Also striving to change the NIMBY-led narrative and political self-interest that has kept us as a community from getting those most vulnerable into a safer, more humane place, simply preserving life. That's my parting plea uh, to you and to our community. Over 30 years ago, I began my employment with the city of Santa Cruz as a beach ranger working on the beach under the Parks and Recreation Department and Lifeguard Service while I was attending college. I actually intended on getting into hospitality, you know, a career running a hotel or resort management actually. But the Loma Prieta uh, 1989 earthquake <coughs> changed that intended path. As a first responder deployed into the downtown uh, the evening of the earthquake, I quickly realized what being a public servant truly meant, and I never left. Despite the adversity I've overcome uh, throughout my career, and adversity is probably being uh, a bit of an understatement, I'm more than appreciative of the opportunities and life the city of Santa Cruz and its citizens have given me. I've had the honor to work and serve with some of the most dedicated and courageous people internally at the police department, across city departments, and externally with community stakeholders, many of which have become close as family. I know you are here uh, to acknowledge my contribution, but still in my mind, uh, I've always been that struggling, seasonally employed kid that is still to this day thankful I have had year-round work in the small tourist town I was fortunate enough to have been raised. For that, I thank Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your 30 years of service and we wish you the best of luck in your retirement it's very well deserved and we'll be seeing you around Santa Cruz we know it yeah. okay so that then concludes our presentations for this afternoon or this morning session so we'll go ahead and jump right into a few announcements um, and then we'll move on to our uh, regular meeting and um, I'll maybe wait just a sec while we transition here. So today um, is a, a unique kind of day in that we have uh, this as our last meeting before uh, we take a bit of a break over the holidays and um, is a, a transition meeting and ceremonial in many ways. And so we'll be concluding our afternoon session at a firm time around 515 and any items that uh, still remain if, if need be will be heard in the evening. Um, so today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge, ledge to my left and it's my job to keep our meeting running without disruption and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of our city council chambers. 
So I'd like to ask now if there are any council members who have any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and see if there are any additions or deletions to our agenda today. There are not. Brief announcement about oral, communi oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to address the council on items that are not on our agenda, and oral communications will occur at or as closely around 7 p.m. this evening as possible. I'll go ahead and turn it to our city attorney to report on closed session. Mr. Kandani. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the City Council. Uh, City Council convened in closed session this morning at 9.30 in the Courtyard Conference Room. Um, there were four categories of uh, matter discussed uh, in this morning's closed session. The first was liability claims. Uh, item A was uh, the claims of James Giannopoulos, David Bruce Press, Denise Elizabeth Byron, Janice Ann Saria, Damian J. Ramirez. Um, those are also listed as item 10 on your uh, uh, agenda this morning. Item B was uh, pending litigation. There were two pending litigation items in which the council received a report from and gave direction to uh, legal counsel. First is um, the 1930 Ocean Street extension case pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Um, that is 1930 Ocean Street Extension Neighbors versus the City of Santa Cruz. Second is the uh, matter entitled Save Our Big Trees versus the City of Santa Cruz. Item C was a conference with legal counsel pertaining to anticipated litigation. Uh, considering initiation of litigation, counsel received a report from legal counsel and uh, gave direction. There was no reportable action on that item. Lastly, the council received a report from its negotiator. Uh, concerning the city-owned property in the city of Scotts Valley, commonly known as Sky Park. Um, council received a report and gave direction, but no reportable action was taken. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, I'll go ahead and see um, if our city council meeting calendar is gonna be revised or if there are any changes as to the calendar, city clerk. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on. So that takes us right up to our consent agenda. And um, those are items five through 18 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who would like to pull any items on our consent agenda? Council Member Myers. I just have a question on number eight, but I don't wanna pull it. Okay, question number eight. Council Member Brown. I have a question on number seven and a question a comment on number 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Cummings. Question on number five. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions or items to be pulled? Council Member Crone. Yeah, I would like to pull item seven and eight. Any other items to be pulled or comments I'll to be made? Change, I'll actually pull five. And pull, pull, five, I, yeah. pull five, okay. Okay. Um, let's see, if there's any members of the uh, public who would like to speak to items on um, our consent agenda, we'll go ahead and have that after we have now just one question of um, item 15 because the other items were pulled. So uh, item 15, Councilman Brown, a question? Uh, yeah, well, it's a question -y comment. It's really a comment. I guess um, the, so the item 15 is the citywide pedestrian crossing improvement project, uh, which I totally support. I'm really glad to see the uh, map and see the locations where these improvements are gonna be made. I think they will improve health and safety, or safety, excuse me, of, uh, for pedestrians um, along some of our more dangerous corridor routes especially. And I, I just wanted to, because I've had, uh, we've talked about the SoCal Frederick intersection at the Regional Transportation Commission and I understand the delay in um, making the broader improvements to that intersection, but I, I just am, am interested in um, why that intersection wasn't included for pedestrian improvements, for at least for the, uh, 
now in the interim, uh, and just again express my interest in moving that project forward. Yeah. Do you want to come speak to that? Uh, good morning, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. Uh, Soquel Frederick is a fully signals, signalized intersection, already has pedestrian warnings and uh, push buttons. Um, the other HSIP grants are all associated with unprotected crosswalks. Any other questions for item 15 or any other um any other items on consent aside from item five, seven, or eight? Question? Just comment on this. Oh, on 15? On 15. Um, so I know earlier this year, um, a member of the public reached out to me about the intersection of Fern and Lime Kiln, um, and then Lime Kiln and Ensenol, and I was just wondering, because those in intersections, um, the folks who live in that area said that it's been very dangerous with cars speeding through, kind of going towards the Costco area, and I was just wondering if there's any update on what might be happening with those intersections as well. And Schneider again. Um, we are, uh, in traffic engineering staff is looking at those intersections um, or those crosswalks. Um, the ones that are in the project currently are based on collision histories and data, and that's how we got the grant. Um, the ones over in the Harvey West area that you're referring to don't have that level of um, collisions or anything like that. So, but we are taking a look at it, evaluating them, and I believe uh, Jimber uh, responded to your email to that effect. Thank you. Uh -huh. Seeing no other questions, we'll go ahead and see if there's any members of the community who would like to address the council on our consent agenda. This is for um, any of the items on cons consent aside from item five, seven, and eight, which have been pulled and will have an opportunity for public comment at that time. So is there any other members of the community wanting to address the council on consent? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back to the council for action. I'll move to consent. I'll second. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by myself. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and start um, with um, item number five, five, which was pulled, and I think there was also a question on item number five, and was it? That was me. That was you, <laughs> Vice Mayor Cummings. I just had a question because um, it came up um, when speaking with some members of the public around the final motion that was made um, when we were discussing the camping ordinance and sending it to the catch and when it was ret to return in at the end of January. And I just wanted some clarification because I wasn't sure if that specific date of January was actually in uh, the motion or if it was suggested afterwards. Um, I did respond to your, e your email and upon re-watching the video, it was part of the motion because I actually had it up on the screen and I was adding to it and it was part of the motion then. So it would be our understanding that that was the intent because nobody said anything at that time. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Council McCrone. I, I, maybe you got back to me also, but just a question about the um, uh, directing count, uh, council yeah. when someone I, speaks. You guys have a copy of a red line at, your, at the dais right now? and we will edit it to add that direction. Thank you. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. Any other comments on this item? Item number five of our consent agenda. Is there any member of the community who would like to address the council on item number five in our consent agenda? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back for action. I'll move item number five. Okay, we have a motion. With the amended With the amend language. amended language, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Council Member Crone. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and move right along to item number seven in the consent agenda, and I believe that was pulled by Chris. Council Member Crone. The, yeah, I just wanted to get an, more of an update on what we're talking about. Are we only paying, um, the taxes on these properties, should we ever acquire them? Uh, and has somebody, I'm assuming, done the math and what, like which properties exactly and why just 200,000? Uh, yes, uh, so the uh, state law puts forward the sort of general process for, for the sale of tax defaulted properties. Um, the owners currently have up until the date that the city or the, any other agency would close on them to pay off that debt. Uh, but under the state law, public agencies can acquire those properties for just the outstanding debt and any other uh, like uh, transfer taxes and things that would go on it. Um, so the prices that you see 
uh, listed on the property profiles page. Uh, that's the outstanding debt and the those fees estimated by the county um, that we would pay for each of those properties. The amount requested in the budget adjustment is enough to cover those uh, total costs plus some ancillary unforeseen costs that might be related to quieting title or other actions. So you've actually worked with the county and they've told you this is what it's gonna cost for the properties. That, that's when they publish their list out to all the public agencies, that's the amount that they expect to get okay. from us. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Brown. Uh, yeah, so I see that the auction is scheduled to be held in March 2020. I'm just wondering if we could get a report back on the outcome uh, to the council so we, we know <coughs> what happened with these properties and the action the, the city took. Absolutely. I, I can't say exactly when the city would wrap up its process, supposing that the properties aren't redeemed by the owner. Um, but as soon as we do get a, you know, a, a determination from the county, I would be happy to put a report back together. Great. And it could just be a FYI memo sure. or something. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the council on this item? All right. Is there any member of the community who would like to address the council? This is item number seven on our consent agenda. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and return back for council action. I'll move approval. Okay, Councilmember Matthews, a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. And then last um, item on consent that was pulled is item number eight. And I believe there was a question or a comment on that by Councilmember Myers, and then it was pulled by Councilmember Crone. Do you want to ask your question, Councilor? Yeah, Mayor? I just had a question. Um, I'm not sure if it's um, for finance or um, I just had a question regarding really the city attorney um, costs. And from what I can tell, it looks like the top two things, um, uh, Cheryl, are, are, would be adding up to those services. And is that specific to us? I guess I'm kind of looking at Tony and, and Cheryl both at the same time. Um, could you speak to a little bit of that overrun so far through the mid-year budget? I think I could do that. Be specific or I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and Cheryl's more familiar with the numbers, but I'm more familiar with the work, so I think that would be appropriate. Can we refer to the thing that you sent us? Um, the itemization? In, in general, I, I will refer to that. Okay. Um, so beginning with the 2017-2018 uh, year, um, the contract was amended to provide for up to 260 hours of general legal services per month for a flat rate and a blended hourly rate above that of $210 per hour, which is very well below um, even what a junior associate uh, would charge from an outside counsel firm. So um, the blended hourly rate means management partner, junior associate are all charged that same amount. Um, the workload has increased significantly over the past few years. And in the 2018-2019 fiscal year, we modified the agreement to um, increase the number provided at the f initial flat rate to 275 hours. And that was done in recognition of some of the budget uh, uh, concessions that were being made citywide due to a lot of increased, um, mostly pension and healthcare costs. Um, However, the amount of legal services provided to the city over the same period of time has continued to increase significantly. Uh, I would say the most significant uh, user of city attorney resources um, in the city is by far the city council. So it's um, uh, both uh, many actions responding to changes in state law that have necessitated a lot of work putting ordinances together um, a lot of work developing uh, those, working with staff, working with the council. Um, one of those is on your agenda this afternoon, um, the small cell wireless facilities ordinance that has just required a lot more time. Um, and frankly, also um, one factor is the meetings are going longer. So it just takes more hours out of the month. Um, and so that's, that's in general I, I, what I would say. Um, also, I think the same impacts on public works, on planning with regard to many changes in state law that have had a major impact on the way the city does business. 
Um, also, the Water Department has been gearing up for several hundred million dollars in infrastructure upgrades, and we've been working extensively with them in developing the contract templates and documents necessary to move forward with a very aggressive capital improvements program. So, in general, there's just been a lot more um, work. Thank you. Did you have additional questions, Councilor? Just wondering, um, so that on the attachment you gave us, there's 1.2 million. Is that what we approved for the budget for the year? I'll let Cheryl answer the budget question. Uh, right. The budget was lower than um, than it should have been. Uh, what we discovered was it should have. It's increasing each year, and for some reason, this was lowered from the previous year. So uh, we needed to put more appropriations in it, but um, it's, it's, it's increasing each year as we go. We did an analysis of it, and the cost of legal services is, is, is needed, so it's, uh, we're having to put more and more in the budget. The 2020 budget reflects uh, an amount that's more uh, equal to what the services are being provided. The, um the, discrepancy, the differences between 1.2 and 1.7, what, what is that the 1.2 is general fund and 1.7 is overall from enterprise and general fund? Uh, these are all general fund. No, is, so, it's, yeah. so basically it's 1.775 million um, that changes hands from the general fund to the city attorney's office? Uh, Tony sent that schedule. Is that the one you're talking about? It's a summary of total billing over the course of the fiscal year for general legal services, special legal services, and litigation. And what was the amount budgeted for this year for the city attorney? Uh, I'll have to look that up. I'm not sure what it was, but uh, it's the difference between what the, uh, you just, uh, the difference is uh, the 300 and something on it. So um, I can get that information for you, but I don't have it readily available. It's, it's increasing each year by about two to $300,000. And um, maybe a question for the city manager, how do we, um, where do we get this money from? Uh, where do we find it in the general fund? How do we uh, deal with this? <laughs> right. So it's not, uh, first of all, it's not unusual that when you adopt a budget, then as the course of the year progresses, that the, you know, changes occur, not everything is exactly as estimated. And so there's always variations. And so typically what we do is we look at what other offsets are in the budget they can adjust for that. Uh, and in this case, that's a lot of that. Some of the other adjustments were where there was uh, less spent in the appropriated budget, so that offsets that. Uh, if that's not available, then we come to council to do a budget adjustment, in which case it would come from fund balance. So we always have to balance our budget. So it's pretty typical that you know, throughout the course of the, of, the, of the fiscal year, we make adjustments uh, based on um, the, you know, what's actually happening versus what was actually uh, estimated. Um, so this is a, we do it, we used, we do it uh, now, we kind of combine everything into one as opposed to doing it piecemeal. Um, so we, we have changed that in the past. We used to do it, at, you know, every time something happened now, we combine it to uh, either mid-year adjustment or end of the year sort of adjustment. I'm just trying to understand how unusual it is for a third, it looks like a 35% increase in the city attorney's budget for the 2019, 2020 year. Does that sound right? Yes, and, and I think it just reflected, as the uh, city attorney pointed out, the fact that the services have just gone up and they've continued to, to go up. And so it's, it's basically just reflected on, on that. We've had just a lot more legal issues. Even if you look at just the just this year, this calendar year, the, the, the increase in, in legal issues uh, has been pretty significant and uh, for the reasons that the city attorney noted. So that's just reflected in and uh, what uh, the budget is. And so How much should we be worrying about that? I mean, I just, I'm just putting out some concern, that's all. I mean, if you can remember another 35% increase in a department's budget in the past five years, has that ever occurred in one calendar year? Uh, I can't recall off the top um, of my head. Um, however, uh, and certainly what we do is, you know, there's a difference between things that, uh, w that we have the ability to control and other things that we don't. So uh, we, you know, we definitely monitor it. And if it becomes an overall issue in the budget, uh, we would, you know, alert the city council or, or make the adjustment uh, at the appropriate time. But I think we have enough uh, flexibility in the budget, at least we, we felt at, at this time to be able to, to, to make that adjustment. Uh, but certainly I think, uh, um, uh, you know, 
if you'd like us to look at, you know, we, we, we do work with the city attorney pretty regularly on monitoring the budget uh, and we, we meet on a regular basis to go over issues um, and uh, uh, track it so that uh, if there are significant you know, deviations or issues that are sort of inconsistent that we would alert the council to do that. So again, I think we were just, we were pretty aware of, of the changing issues and the needs. Uh, some of the costs do get allocated to the enterprise funds as well. Like for example, the water work uh, is, is really the enterprise funds. It's not all general fund. Uh, so the increases are not all in the general fund. They're, they're, they're both in general fund and in the enterprise fund. So it just gets all allocated. So the overall impact of the general fund, while it's an increase, it's not to the point where it's uh, having a detrimental effect in terms of uh, increasing our, our ongoing budget deficit moving forward. <coughs> Sorry, I thought you said all 1.775 million is from the general fund, because I had uh, asked. I believe so. And that's where the 35% increase is. So well, the problem is the appropriations were much lower than they needed to be for fiscal year 2019. Uh, they were, I believe they were somewhere around 200 to $300,000 less than 2019. So we weren't following the trend and, and the hours, and I'm not, I haven't done enough research to see why that, that uh, appropriation was too low, but that was part of the problem. Yeah. And, and um, Tony, um, is that all the money that changes hands from the city to the city attorney's office, 1.775, or is there enterprise funds as well? To my knowledge, that's the, the total sum. So I'm, get, I'm confused because you just said about enterprise fund. Do do, does their enterprise let me, fund let me the general fund? Yeah, so what we do in this case, and Sherry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the city attorney's department is in the general fund, sort of, and then we have a cost allocation uh, system that then uh, goes and looks at how much was allocate, was spent on the various funds, and then there is an adjustment that happens. And that this is the total budget. It's, this does not reflect the uh, the adjustments that happen. We can provide that Correct. for you. Yes. Uh, so this isn't the the actual net cost to the general fund. It's the total cost of the department, which is in the general fund, just like the city manager's office, just like the city council. You're in the general fund the way you're structured in the budget, but obviously some of the the costs are of the city council of the city manager of the HR department, of the administrative functions of the finance department are allocated to the to the uh, uh, the enterprise fund. So the net cost is lower. Uh, so I don't have that number in front of me, but it is a net uh, lower than this. This is not the, the total cost of the general fund. Last question. Um, I don't mean to be a nudge, but people have brought this to my attention because this is the only thing we, ha we got in our packet. Um, about the overtime, it looks like about seven, almost $800,000 in overtime. Where's that coming from, the overtime? Uh, this is fire, and it's actually uh, uh, reimbursed. Uh, if you can, you know, a lot of this is, uh, it's, uh, the overtime is, they do, uh, let's see, they uh, they go out on strike teams, they have, uh, they we have a, a revenue offset to this. So it's just that it, because of the fires, it exceeded, yeah. So it exceeded what we, we had originally budgeted. Right. It's just responding to the, the wildfire season and typically the, we have mutual aid agreements and so the state reimburses uh, municipalities for when they need to have firefighters uh, go out and help uh, with fires. And we've had you know, pretty uh, significant fire seasons uh, the last uh, few years and so uh, that's reflected here. But it doesn't have a fiscal impact on the city, a direct fiscal impact. We're reimbursed. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Brown. Just a quick comment, and thank you for the additional information, uh, because I, I too had questions about both of these, and you know we speculated a bit. But um, it would just be helpful, I think, in when we get these, especially when they're or in the case where there are significant overruns, just a, like a brief explanation of what that's about um, in our agenda report could kind of help clarify. So knowing that in advance, we could probably move through. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions at this time, we'll go ahead and see if there's any member of the community who would like to address us on this item. This is item number eight in our consent agenda packet. And we'll go ahead and see if there's anybody here wanting to speak to us. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back for council action. Councilor Matthews. Second. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, uh, seconded near tie, but I think Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, Councilmember Myers Glover voting in support, Councilmember Crone voting against. Councilmember Matthews. I just want to note that we did get some um, information after the published agenda that uh, specified the city attorney. Um, 
breakdown of hours and also something from finance um, explaining some of the adjustments. So for members of the public who are curious, there is the later arriving time. information available. Okay. Thank you for that specification and it seems appropriate if there are interested members of the community who would like that could maybe potentially reach out to our city manager's office or something like that to be able to find access to Absolutely. that. Okay, Councilor McCarthy. It seems like we might consider at some point a, an item on the agenda that would discuss, you know, where we're going with the city attorney budget and are the council, are we on board? Do we want to temper ourselves in what we ask for? It, it, it's a pretty significant, 35 percent, it's pretty significant. So I'm just bringing that to the council at some time in the future, putting it on our agenda. Okay. And I, I think if I could, um, my understanding is sort of, there is an interest in kind of understanding a little bit more about when we're going in this direction, some of the costs. And so I think that maybe some open communication could help that as well, potentially. I think it, it is also reviewed annually as part mm -hmm. of your budget process. Budget process. Okay. And, I, and I'm happy to have that discussion at the appropriate time. Okay. Yeah, as well as mid-year. So the mid-year and the budget process is, are the two also opportune times to discuss that. Okay, thank you. Okay, well that concludes our consent agenda portion of today's meeting's agenda. So we'll go ahead and move right along to our general business portion of the meeting. And um, for those uh, in the audience, um, the general order is there will be a presentation by our city staff um, and, or, and or by the council members who may have brought forward an item. Uh, council will then have an opportunity to ask questions for clarification. We'll go ahead and hear public comment and then return back for council action and deliberation. So our first item in our general business portion is our admissions tax ordinance and we have economic <coughs> development team here. Good Welcome. Good evening, or actually good morning, um, council and uh, mayor and members of the council. My name is Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. And the item before you today is um, some clarifying amendments to our admissions tax ordinance. This is something that we've been working on um, in collaboration with the city attorney's office and the finance department. And um, it really is clarifying um, just some challenges that we had um, working with the business community to make sure that there weren't unintended um, just challenges as far as um, making sure that people were paying their admissions tax and we didn't have others un unintended being billed inappropriately. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca Unit, our business liaison. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. Um, to provide you with a little bit of background on the admissions tax, um, it was first adopted in 1986 as a 5% tax on the price of admission um, charged, uh, including a season ticket or subscription for the privilege of admission to any event or in or at a facility. The tax is charged to the patron or attendee of an event and collected by the operator to be paid to the city. Uh, the tax defines an event as any entertainment, amusement, or recreational activity for which an admission charge is made um, and includes a long list of event samples, um, examples. Uh, in 2013, the city council considered the first substantive amendments to the uh, ordinance since its adoption, um, which exempted charges for membership or participation in or use of health clubs, athletic <coughs> gyms, martial arts studios, yoga studios, and physical fitness facilities. Uh, which advance active bodily health and uh, and fitness and for which payment is made on an annual, quarterly, periodic, or advance basis. This amendment was intended to clarify terms to improve compliance and enforcement and support activities that advance bodily health and wellness. Um, Based on recent uh, enforcement efforts by our finance department, as well as some trends in new business operations, economic development and finance staff, as well as the city council, have received a number of inquiries um, from uh, businesses and individuals based on the application of the tax. The tax currently has six exemptions uh, that can be requested by operators and must be approved by the finance director. The item we're presenting today is intended to clarify these exemptions. Uh, to provide definitive answers to businesses and individuals who have made inquiries about whether or not the tax applies. There are three proposed amendments to exemptions for council consideration today. Uh, first, the proposed amendment would uh, explicitly <laughs> reference meditation studios, Pilates studios, massage facilities, health spas, and other physical fitness facilities which advance active bodily health and fitness in addition to the currently referenced health clubs, athletic gyms, martial arts studios, and yoga studios. 
Um, it would eliminate the requirement that the health and fitness exemption only applies when payment for use of the facilities is made on annual, quarterly, periodic, or other advanced basis. Um, See. As referenced in the staff report, this provision is unnecessary because all health and fitness uh, facility users ultimately pay for the use of these facilities in advance. Um, and this adds to the confusion for businesses and organizations and should be removed. The second proposed amendment seeks to clarify that the ordinance does not apply to businesses or individuals who offer academic tutoring, uh, music lessons, art lessons, dance lessons, and craft lessons. As defined in the ordinance, the tax applies only to costs for admission to an event. Um, and an event is defined as any entertainment, amusement, or recreational activity for which an admission charge is made. Uh, lessons of this type do not fall within this definition, meaning the admission tax ordinance does not apply. And this proposed amendment will sim uh, similarly serve to clarify this point for these businesses and individuals. And the uh, final third amendment um, is uh, proposed to clarify that when an operator obtains a certificate of exemption, which absolves the operator of tax collection, um, this, that certificate of exemption also applies to the operator's subcontractors and, and employees. Uh, so the recommendation before you today uh, on our staff report is um, to introduce for publication an ordinance amending so as to clarify section 3.36.040 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code entitled exemptions and pertaining to the admissions tax. And we're happy to answer any questions about this item. Thank you for your presentation. Do any of the council members have questions on this item? Council member Crone. Thank you. Um, I'm pretty okay with the changes that are being made here, but I guess it'd be nice to get some background on um, one and two on, pay, on our report 19.3. The following charges shall be exempt. The charge to play or operate an amusement ride, amusement device, or amusement game where the total cost to play or operate is less than 30 cents. Um, I'm not sure what year that's from. And number two, the charge to play or operate any coin or token operated pinball machine or electronic game. How, I know these aren't, how did these get in there? I guess is my question and what does it mean? So I, I can answer that because I, I looked into it over the weekend. Um, the item one, the charge for uh, amu amusement rides that are less than 30 cents was part of the original ordinance adopted by the council in 1986. I'm not sure um, what the policy basis for that was, but given that um, the Seaside Company is such a large uh, contributor to the admission tax uh, revenue uh, stream, and um, my guess is that in 1986, most amusement ride tickets were more than 30 cents each. Um, so, so I speculate that that was intended to get at the kind of thing that when I was a little kid, they used to have out in front of supermarkets and that sort of thing, um, like the little rocking horses and stuff like that. Um, but, but that's my speculation. The second item with respect to coin-operated pinball machines and, and arcade games was adopted by the council in 1997, I think in January. And I've not been able to dig up any um, reliable information on what the impetus was for that modification. But as I looked at the ordinance over the weekend, I think an argument could be made that it merely clarified what was already the intent of the ordinance. If you look at the definitions of admission and advent in the beginning of the chapter, um, it seems to imply that um, the charge is intended to apply to entrance to a facility or entrance to um, uh, 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 an event. And, and so I think the question is, does putting a coin in a coin-operated uh, arcade game uh, constitute participating in an, event, in an event? And so that's my speculation. Um, but, but again, how, what initiated that discussion and why the change was made in 1997, I, I haven't been able to track down any reliable information. Do we know if the boardwalk is paying the admissions tax on number one now? They, on all the, the rides, that's, they generally pay that? 
the boardwalk is certainly paying admission tax for um, the tickets that it sells for admission to the boardwalk, yes. And you see where I'm going with this is because it, it just seems like we're doing apples and oranges, like we're talking about meditation studios, Pilates, uh, health spa, um, after school tutoring, and then we have this um, electronic uh, games. It just doesn't seem to be in the same category. That's, that's why I just raised it to your attention. I, I mean, I can comment on that too. It seems to me like the admission tax initially as drafted was very broadly worded to <laughs> encompass things like movie theaters, uh, boardwalk tickets, certainly, um, entrances to concerts, uh, that sort of thing. And over the years, if you apply it literally, it, it, it just goes well beyond what I think anyone ever envisioned mm -hmm. when, the, when the tax was adopted, such as admission to a health spa or admission to a yoga studio for a yoga class. And so the exceptions have been carved out over time. Um, this, this wasn't um, something that started out as a, I mean, it started out as a, a, a revenue mechanism and the exceptions were carved out because of what was perceived as the redeeming social values of these different activities for which exceptions were, were written. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions from the council at this time? Is there any member of the community who would like to address the council on this item? This is um, item number 19 in our general business portion of our agenda. Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back for council action. Council member, or Vice Mayor Cummings. I just want to thank um, the city staff for taking this up because I know a number of people in the community who reached out to us with concerns who were music teachers and tutors and how it was starting to impact their business. And so I just want to thank you for, um, for helping to clarify these exemptions. And I'm more than happy to move the item. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilman <coughs> Matthews. Any further discussion? Uh, Councilmember Crone, I mean Councilmember Glover. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was some correspondence that came in yesterday, I believe, from a uh, institute called the Seven Directions Institute, addressing concerns. They're a STEM institute, apparently, that focuses on teaching art, biology, astronomy, physics, engineering, and many other valuable subjects to children. And they were their plea essentially is to take pity on small education facilities like our own and please amend the tax not to include businesses that offer educational or teaching services. I was wondering if there's any staff member that could speak to that or if there's been any communication with the Seven Directions Institute of Art and Science. Uh, we haven't, to my knowledge, we haven't specifically contacted them, but we will do so after this meeting, and the exemption that's um, being considered by you today would cover that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Matthews. I also just want to express appreciation. This is something I'm asked about periodically in response to questions that have come from the community, a whole range of um, generally small locally owned businesses. So um, I'm really pleased that this um, is um, a common sense and contemporary update of the ordinance. You're here. Okay. Um, seeing no other <laughs> comments at this time, we'll go ahead and take the vote. So we had a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we're, we'll go ahead and take maybe a short recess and then we'll return at 11.35. I'll tell you what, I think this was Because I, I wasn't. You guys have to get angry, let me know. Okay, we'll go ahead and come back now to our next item. Um, this is item number 20 in our uh, general business uh, council meeting for the afternoon session. And this item was brought forward by three council members. So we'll go ahead and have the presentation by the council members who brought this item forward to bring context. We'll then go ahead and see if there's any uh, council questions, at which time we'll open it up to public comment and then return back to the council for action and deliberation. So I will look to any of my colleagues who brought this item forward to introduce the item. That's Councilmember uh, Crone, Glover, or Brown. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover and then Crone and then Councilmember Matthews. I just do have a question if I could ask it at this point. Is it before the presentation, about the presentation? Well, it's, it's relevant because we've had a request for a continuance. So at what point um, do, we continue, do we consider that? Um, we have a, a procedural question by Councilmember Matthews before the presentation with the question for continuance, if that were to be brought forward. 
the, the matter could be continued by the city council at any point in the proceedings. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and maybe have the presentation then. Um, I, I'm just asking the question procedurally. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I just have a very brief comment by way of introduction. So this is a uh, consideration of a, ref a referral to the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, consideration of uh, and recommendation on the property's designation as a local historical landmark, and that involves uh, the Historical Preservation Commission, Historic Preservation Commission reviewing the historic report that has been conducted. And so I just wanted to say by way of introduction that this came based upon uh, requests from the community members. They have been, uh, from what I understand, trying to uh, get the Historic Preservation Commission uh, to review this for some time now. Um, I believe members of the Historic Preservation Commission have also uh, made that request that they look at the historic report officially. And that because that has not happened through other channels, they have come to us asking that we make that referral. And so that's why it's before us today. Um, and it, it, was, it, it was a request that came from the community. Councilor Booker. Thank you, yeah, so this was a result of many statements over a period of probably a, a couple of months of community members coming to public comment or oral communications uh, in the evening sessions to express their desire, and as well as providing uh, petitions and letters signed by litanies of surrounding neighbors uh, to address the issue of sending the decision as to whether or not to mark the building as a historical site to the Preservation Commission. Uh, something that was troubling was their uh, communication to myself specifically about the difficulty that commission members have had in getting the agenda on the item to be able to address in general, saying that they've been obstructed by the process and some of those uh, by, by the process in general, specifically of the representatives that have been overseeing that commission. So that was really problematic to me for a lot of reasons, uh, especially the whole point of the commission is to be able to analyze and look at potential historic sites. Uh, also, it's important to have that uh, opportunity for democratic process in these development projects. So um, in uh, bringing it to the, you know, and with regards to this, the request for continuance, uh, these representatives from the neighborhood that want to see it go to the Historic Preservation Society have come continuously to ask us uh, to prioritize it. Now, if there was a concern from any individuals that may have been observing or seeing that, they were more than welcome to write and or come to city council meetings in uh, opposition to it being referred to the um, Historic Preservation Commission and in us um, referring it to the Historic Preservation Commission that no way precludes those that are interested in expressing their perspectives, especially those that are asking for the continuance, to participate in the Historic Preservation me Commission's meeting and express their perspectives. And it's important to acknowledge also that the recommendation from the Historic Preservation Commission in no way binds the City Council from taking any action. It only acts as a reference point for us to make more informed and democratically inclusive decisions. So this, in my opinion, is an item that could just have gone on the consent agenda, but since it's here for us to be able to discuss, I think it's really important for us to be able to provide that opportunity for as many people to participate in the discussion as possible, and especially take action uh, in order to make the conversation happen before there's any potential issuance of demolition permits or they're able to move forward with the destruction of this historic site or potentially historic site. Thank you. Um, I'm a, won't repeat what uh, Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Glover said. Um, it just seems to me that we're the city council. We are approached by a group of people consistently over time and this is sort of our job. The item's coming back to us uh, regardless Folks want their day in court, and I think that's what's uh, what's being asked from the council today. Um, I believe Councilmember Myers had a question, and then I have a question. Yeah, I just have a question. I think for the planning director. Um, so my understanding is, um, once the applicants would have um, would would complete their application with regards to planning department process, this project would then make its way through our planning commission and ultimately to the city council, is that correct? 
That's correct. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members Lee Butler. I'm the Planning Director, and um, the application, um, as proposed, um, requires a Planning Commission uh, recommendation and then a Council final action. And so the so once the, so and at Planning Commission or City Council, either of those bodies could refer refer the question of the the historic significance. To the, preserva to the Historic Preservation Commission, which could then uh, make a recommendation or review the materials, is that correct? The council can certainly do that. I believe the code also specifies that the Planning Commission uh, can make a, rec a, a referral uh, to designate a historic site, and I'm going to in fact, I'm getting a head nod. Yes, the Planning Commission is also listed. The Municipal Code spe specifies which um, uh, individuals and bodies have the ability to do that. And so with this step we're doing today, this step would still would, have, would, would happen as we go through our approval reviews with the two uh, approval bodies being the Planning Commission and, and uh, City Council ultimately. So this step could happen as part of that, yes. Um, we uh, as staff would not be including that as part of the agenda um, for those items. Um, that would not preclude the Planning Commission or the City Council from doing so as part of their deliberations. Um, the historic reports that have been prepared um, the, and the peer review have concluded that it is not an eligible site and so that wouldn't be um, a recommendation that we would include as part of the, um, uh, the recommendations to Planning Commission or to Council. However, it is completely within the purview of the Planning Commission or Council to um, make that referral to the HPC. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand a little bit. Um, I guess I'm also just curious with regards to my colleagues, did you meet with any of the applicants regarding the, the property or the project at all. Thank you. So uh, none of the applicants have contacted us with their perspective or their um, concern except for the letter that came in asking for a continuance, which those concerns and questions can be addressed either at the Historic Preservation Commission when they're making their recommendation or uh, when it comes back to council for the discussion. I think also to be pointed out here with regards to the process, and you know, Lee, I might have a question for you here, is if this is not done up in the forefront, then is there potential for, let, let's say that later down the line after it goes through the, the process that you delineated or laid out, that it does eventually get found out to be a, uh, or decided that it's a, a historical relevance, then is there the potential that the applicants could have spent a considerable amount of money in the preparation and the application process fees and permitting to get to that point only to find out that there would be a historic preservation kind of roadblock if it was found to be a historic preservation commit to the site? Um, that's the case either way. Um, I mean, where they're at in their application process is very much towards the end. Um, they are um, close to being ready for planning commission. If not, if not ready, they were working through some last um, stormwater issues. And so um, what, uh, what ultimately could happen um, just to, um, let the council know about the, the process and the public understand the processes. If the, um, if the item is referred to the HPC for potential uh, designation on our historic register, um, and then the count, it comes back to the council, the council decides whether or not it is, um, uh, it should be identified as a historic resource. If the council says yes, it should be identified as a historic resource, then um, that would mean that the proposed project, uh, it, which includes demolition of that structure, would represent a significant impact under CEQA. And so then an environmental impact report, a focused environmental impact report would need to be prepared. That would, um, uh, that would involve a, a fair amount of time. Um, just procedurally, there's a fair amount of time that's required, even though some of those technical reports are already um, available. The, the process does take a, a good chunk of time. And um, then when it comes back, 
having been listed, it would then go to the Historic Preservation Commission for a recommendation on the project, then to the Planning Commission for a recommendation on the project, then to the council, and the council would have to adopt a statement of overriding considerations, recognizing that there would be a significant environmental effect as a result of the project, and yet there are overriding considerations that still um, warrant its approval should the council want to approve it if it is listed. Thanks, yeah, because one of the things that I've noticed that's uh, kind of a pattern is that the, the argument that things are so far along in the process and planning and applications that it's hard to change direction or change uh, the course, which is why I'm dismayed that this hasn't gone to the Historic Preservation Commission prior to this point because, you know, we, uh, it gives us the opportunity it gives us the opportunity to make an informed and inclusive decision hearing from the neighbors in the process, not just on who has the most amount of money to be able to purchase the property and move forward with plans, but also to be able to give the voice to the surrounding neighborhood that are gonna be impacted by the project, not in the resistance of the development of housing, because I've spoken to the people that have requested for this to be on the agenda, and they are in no way in opposition to the development of affordable housing in some way or shape you know, on the site or in the area, but it is, uh, I mean, there's multiple things to this, not only, and we're not, we can't talk about the proposed development in question because that's not what we're talking about today, but uh, that we could make a more informed and holistic conversation, a decision with more community input if we had moved forward with this sooner. So if we were to wait even longer and draw this out and wait through all the planning departments and recommendations, and it's not even guaranteed that it will go to the Historic Preservation Commission through that process as was uh, mentioned by Director Butler, uh, now is an opportunity for us to take a second and pause, address what's going on with the community that we're hearing from, which is something that's very consistent over in, in different um, neighborhoods, but especially in the Dufour neighborhood, in the uh, now in the Eret Circle neighborhood, where they have uh, come out with a litany of signatures on petitions and letters that have said from the surrounding neighbors, hey, we need to hold off and reassess the situation. And I think it's our responsibility as council members to act on that uh, request from our community. So we had a few more questions. Uh, Councilmember Myers wasn't finished. Then we'll go to Councilmember Brown and Vice Mayor Cummings. Well, I kind of wanted to answer Councilmember oh, Myers' please. last question. Okay. But right I can ahead. wait till and answer them all in turn. That's fine. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Director Butler. I'm, I, so I just want to, again, clarify this referral could occur during our approval process as the application moves forward, correct? It could, it could go through the uh, process now, it could be continued, it could happen as part of the uh, future approval process, that's the, the purview of the council. And is, I, I understand that the applicant has prepared, I think, I know at least one, um, I may, I think possibly two um, of the reviews, the DPR, um, process, so, and those are on file as part of the, that, that would be distributed to Planning Commission and, and moving forward through our process, correct? That's correct. There, um, there was an earlier report um, that was prepared and a subsequent report that was um, prepared by a, a different firm. That second report was um, peer reviewed. The, the three, uh, the two reports and the peer review concluded that the site is not eligible for uh, designation locally at the state level or at the national level. And those are available on our website for review. And so when you say that, when you would bring this forward to planning commission first and then city council based on planning commission's um, process, the staff report would say based on the, the materials presented that this would not be referred to HPC. Um, but planning commission or council could direct that, correct? That's correct, that's the process. I just wanted to make sure, thank you. Okay. This, and this is an alternative, you know, the council does have the purview to, to do it through this manner, or it, typically it would go through that standard process, and, and usually when there's a report like this, you know, it, it, wouldn't, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't get referred. Um, you know, there's nothing in the code that specifies that we need to re refer this action at this time. It would be an action by the Planning Commission or the Council that um, would refer it, and that could be now or through that uh, review process. So thank you for the time, and I am, um, I would be, I do wanna put forward a motion to continue the item. We received a letter from the uh, applicants yesterday 
Um, I don't believe they sort of really understood what was happening except that they were going through the process. And I have met with everyone on every side of this question and um, I think we have to honor our process. There will be opportunities for referrals and these questions to come up, but I think um, with respect to the applicants, uh, I will put forward a motion to continue the item. There's a motion to continue yeah, the item. Public comment yet. I know. Um, would you like to reserve that until after public comment? Yeah. Okay. So we have Councilmember Brown, Bryce Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Crone. So to answer your question, Councilmember Myers, no, um, I did not meet with the developers before bringing this forward. The developers have n never contacted me. I wouldn't even know how to reach them without, you know, moving that through our city planning staff. I um, uh, move forward with my colleagues to bring this to the agenda in response to community members who have contacted us. Um, I did not reach out to them. They reached out to us, um, as well as members of our Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and I believe that they had a significant enough interest that it was our responsibility to consider that request. Um, so I, so that's a, just a response quickly to your question. I believe we, that we here are here to represent the public interest and in the case of community concerns um, that are, seem to be significant, bring that to this body for consideration. Um, I have a question r related to the um, the timeline and the process. I um, I just want to be clear because I, I thank you for clarifying the process for making that referral. I don't know why making a referral later on in the process is it would benefit. And I'm not sure what benefit that would be. If we're going to do it, we ought to do it and then keep, move down that road. Um, and then the question I have related to this process, because I, I do have concerns about the potential for a demolition permit being issued in the interim. So that's another concern. I think a sense of urgency was coming from the community. So can you clarify um, where that is at, what, at what point, um, and how that um, would, would occur? And would that be... Um, potentially happen before getting to the process where we might make, make a referral down the road? So they would need to um, come in for the, uh, the project approval and um, that would come through the council in advance of issuance of building permits and associated demolition permits. I will verify from a commercial building perspective that's the same. Yeah, we, we I'm aware of uh, provisions that specifically relate to residential and I'm getting uh, confirmation that the same provisions are in place for commercial. Um, and, and so the project needs to come through the approval process before even demolition permits could be issued. Um, and uh, that would then trigger building permits and demolition permits at the same time following those council approvals. So just just to confirm, council approval would be required before the zoning administrator can issue any a demolition permit. Before the building official can issue sorry, a building, demolition. Sorry. Yes. Building official. Sorry. Yes. It's yes. okay. Staff. Yes. <laughs> Vice Mayor Cummings, then Council Member I just have some questions for my colleagues. So my understanding is that the intention is for the reports that were created by. <clears throat> the developers to go to the Historic Preservation Commission, correct? It's uh, that as well as any other pertinent information analysis, research, or data that would associate the potential need to register it as a historical site. Um, my other question is when is the next, is, does anybody know when the next Historical Preservation Commission meeting is taking place? held on the third Wednesday of each month. So would this item potentially be able to go on this month's agenda? It can't go on this month's, uh, you know, so it requires a public hearing. So there is um, roughly three weeks lead time in advance of uh, any Historic Preservation Commission actual meeting date, roughly three weeks in advance would be the, the soonest. Okay, thank you. And I'd just like to say that, you know, one of my concerns, because I met with the developers, I've met with um, the folks who are from the west side who want to protect the Circle Church, um, 
And one of the big concerns I have that came out of the meeting I had last night with some of the developers was that they didn't feel like they had enough time in advance to actually um, have some of their um, legal team and, and other people come out because they found out on Friday and this uh, came on this week's agenda and so many of them worked during the day and didn't have enough advance notice. The issue that I have with continuing this item is that if we continue this into January, that means that if it's gonna go to the Historic Preservation Committee, that wouldn't happen until February, and then it would have to go through all the steps of going to the Planning Commission and coming back to the City Council, and I actually think that if the intention is to have this, these reports reviewed, which it seemed like um, folks were pretty okay with the reports going to the Historic Preservation Committee, um, I think that it would make the most sense to have this go to the Historic Preservation Committee so that we can actually reduce the amount of time that it's gonna take for this process to unfold. Um, I do understand concerns from, from the folks who have been working really hard at trying to meet all the goals and deadlines for applications and the development, but part of our job is to um, meet the needs and the concerns of the city. And um, a lot of folks have been coming out over the past couple weeks, if not months, wanting this to go to the Historic Preservation Committee, and if we further delay, it's gonna substantially delay this project. Councilmember Cohn? Um, I would, since I didn't hear a um, second for Councilmember Myers, uh, and our rules do say that you can make a motion before or after it goes to the public, I will make a motion to direct staff to refer to the historic report for the 111 Eretz Circle property to the Historic Preservation Commission for review and to make a formal recommendation to the council as to whether the site should be listed as a local historic landmark. Okay, well we have Mr. Kadani. We will need to hear from the public before the council can take that action. Okay, okay. All right, so why don't we just go ahead and, and do that at this, at this time uh, and we'll see. I'll, I'll second that motion just so that it's seconded. Okay, okay, well then I'll just as um, kind of for process acknowledge that it, Councilmember Myers was prepared to make a motion after public comment, but given that uh, a colleague here now has made the motion before public comment, we'll go ahead and revisit that motion when we return from public comment. So all those who are interested in speaking on this item, please line up to my left and you'll have up to two minutes to come forward and uh, share your perspective with the council. Hello, my name is Jana Breyer. I live uh, two blocks from Circle Church and have lived there for over 35 years. And I'm hearing lots of different um, sort of uh, planning and um, sort of political kinds of things batted back and forth. And I'm just coming forward as a neighbor as a as a person living in the in the neighborhood itself and um, want to really impart to all of you how important it is to keep neighborhoods cohesive and together and that um, our Garfield Park Library is a uh, historic site and I imagine that the little Baptist church that's in our neighborhood is also uh, a historic site. And so it seems to me logical that our church and that, and that whole um, property would also be a part of that. And um, to demolish it is to take away um, a long, long history there, long, long history before even our houses were, were there. And um, that we need to keep neighborhoods intact. And um, so I'm, you know, making a plea to please, you know, prioritize getting these reports to the historic society what are the Preservation Commission so that we can have 
Your time, your time is up. Next speaker. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today on this subject again. And I wanted to follow that woman because I actually reached out to another um, a company that's on the list of the Planning Commission that's authorized to do the historic resource analysis. They're called Interactive Resources. They're uh, located in Richmond, California, and I talked to a historian, Charlie Duncan, to ask, tell him what we were trying to do. I sent him some information about the history of the Circle Church, and it just so happens his daughter lives here in Santa Cruz, and so he came down for Thanksgiving, actually drove around the Circle areas, and when he we talked on the phone again, he goes, I think this can qualify as an historic district. What he cited is he cited the original grid from the 1800s, the streets, with the original names of the pastors with the tabernacle. He cited the original Garfield Library. The original stores and post office are still there. They're on Eretz Circle. Then we have these, these uh, also the historical market on California Avenue, as she mentioned, the historic Baptist church. But he said most significantly are these those little tiny shoebox houses that represent the original tent lots from the tabernacle. So to me, it's even more imperative that we get this in front of the HPC and try to preserve the culture of this neighborhood because what's in the center of this potentially historic district is important. And what's being proposed is kind of this um, mini country club that's very exclusive, completely incongruent with the neighborhood. So, and again, it's just like some of you have said, we're just getting their input. It doesn't hold you to any decision it's just doing due diligence, just really being very careful about making this decision. All right, thank you so much. Good, Good morning, my name is Andrea van der Loo. I live on 230 Walk Circle. I inherited my home in 2005. And when I heard the history of the neighborhood, I was so moved. And it seems that that property, the circle, the center of the circle, is the heart of the west side. That's right. And um, from my perspective, I would hope that the city of Santa Cruz would take a hold of that property and designate it as a permanent community center, like you have Loudon Nelson in the center of town. From the center of town all the way through the west side, there's nothing. There's no community center. And what we need more than anything is to to build community, to be more connected with one another. And that is a perfect place for it. That's all I have, thank you. I like that. Uh, Bruce Thomas, I live on Dufour Street. I'm across the street from a building that is considered historic. So I want to point out, well, first of all, I want to say I'm really sad to see this progress to a state. Um, I really wish the planning department, and maybe Lee could listen to this, Eric as well, could really engage the community more thoroughly and not let things get so far along when there's really serious concerns. That's an endemic problem in the city of Santa Cruz that I really think should be addressed. But this, this place is the heart. I live across the street from a former bank building that's deemed historic, and we're still having delivery trucks with no loading zone in the middle of the streets. So why is that a historic building and yet this other one? There's a double standard going on and I really um, think there could be a legal challenge since um, this building is by all observations is of historic nature and it's it's older actually than the one that was uh, across the street from my house so I really think out of respect for the community and due diligence really this should go to the Historic Preservation Commission for further re co public comment and consideration Hi, I'm here on behalf of uh, Sue um, Powell from the Friends of the Circle who couldn't attend today. She asked me to read this letter, so I have uh, distributed it, but it's important to get this on the record. My name is Candace Brown and I'm uh, from East Morrissey. Um, the Historical Preservation Commission has repeatedly asked staff to allow the commission to review the, the Eretz Circle Project historical report at regular public meetings because they believe that the Circle Church and Eretz Circle property could be eligible for historical designation. The role of the Historical Preservation Commission is to advocate for the cultural and the historical heritage of our city, to listen to community concerns, and to advise the city council about sites that merit preservation. The Historical Preservation Commission wants to review the Everett 
Circle Historical Report. So both parties want to do this, and they want to hear from the community so that they can assess the historical significance and cultural importance of the Circle Church and the Eret Circle site. More than 1,000 petition signatures, neighbors, and friends believe it is imperative for the City Council to respect the role of the Historical <coughs> Preservation Commission in preserving our city's historical and cultural heritage, and to respect a request by the commissioners to review the historical report at a public meeting with input from the community. We fully support this agenda item and we urge the City Council to refer the Everett Circle Project Historical Report to the Historical Preservation Commission for review, which is before you today. And I just want to say that this does feel like it is the part, the heart of a community, and I think it's really important to give it special deference. We lost, during the earthquake, the, um, the Cooper House, and for some people, it's really never been the same, and we're still searching for the heart of downtown. So really consider the heart of the West Side. Thank you. Hello, my name is Freya Sands. I live on Wilkes Circle, and I just am here to thank you for your service and implore you to refer this matter to the HPC. The property has been a spiritual and community center for over 130 years, and we need the, the opportunity to have an independent review of its historic significance. Please, thank you very much. I want to thank you for your service too. My name is Ellen Bass. I have a really deep investment in Santa Cruz County and the community and our culture here. Um, I'm this year's Artist of the Year. I was last year's Poet Laureate. I started uh, poetry workshops in the jails. We now have six weekly poetry workshops in the jails. And decades ago, I started two nonprofit organizations in Santa Cruz County, um, Survivors Healing Center and Kid Power uh, Inc. for self-protection of children. Uh, I've lived in Santa Cruz County since 1974, and I've lived on Young Love Avenue for over 30 years. It's only reasonable for the Historic Preservation Commission to be able to assess Garfield Park. I know how important it is to me. We had our wedding reception there. I think everybody in the area has had some really significant experience there. And when I walk by Garfield Church, I think about that. I love Garfield Library. I'm crazy about it. I go in there all the time. I love walking by the little church. This is the heart and soul of our community. And when I walk down Walnut Avenue, when I, I walk a lot, and those of you who walk down there, when you see those houses that have been preserved, it does your heart good. You know, that we are, we don't want to just look like every other city in the world, and we don't want McMansions where those Walnut Avenue houses are. And Garfield Church is really important to all of us. I didn't know about the history until we thought we'd lose it. And I am astounded. If you haven't read the history stuff, you will just be knocked off your feet. It's 130 years old, and it has served as so many things. After World War I, maybe you know, it was barracks for black soldiers. It's amazing. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm Ron Pomerantz. Uh, I'm here in full support of the staff report recommendation to refer the property of the Old Circle Church to the Historic Preservation Commission, whether the site is a, a local historic landmark. This is a very, very reasonable request, given the entire neighborhood was built around the church 130-odd years ago. When my children were growing up in the area, we spent uh, a lot of time enjoying the open space of the church and the activities that took place there. <coughs> Even though I no longer live near there, this property has a personal and historic importance to me and my family. I don't understand why this property hasn't already been evaluated and designated as a local historic landmark. What's taken so long? I would recommend taking this process a step further and establish a list of all potential historic <clears throat> Santa Cruz properties. With this list, the Historic Preservation Commission can review and determine if these properties should be designated as historic 
landmarks. This would help avoid this kind of confusion and delays in the future. Additionally, once this historic landmark evaluation is completed for the Circle Church, I hope you'll assure that an environmental impact report is done for innumerable reasons, and I don't have time to go through it right now. I want to recommend in a very small way that story poles <coughs> are a, 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 a small way to physically see and get a feel for the height and massing of any proposed projects. I hope that you will uh, uh, require it for this project as well as future ones. And as Vice Mayor Cummings has said, that this I don't understand why you'd want to continue it. It's just going to delay this thing for months and months. I hope you'll support the recommendation you have before you today. Thank you for your time and consideration. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members, for being here and for listening. My name is Caitlin Wild, and I'm part of the Circle of Friends, the folks that purchased the property two years ago. And um, <coughs> I'm feeling very blindsided by what's happening. Um, we have followed the letter of the law, all of the plans that have been set forth before us. We've spent two years, hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have gotten not one, not two, but three historical evaluations, um, one by Paige and Turnbill, who we have a representative here, Christina, and the second one by Dudek, as um, Mr. Butler says. And um, we've had meetings all summer, um, listened to the community. We actually did send out emails to all of the council members on October 19th asking to meet. Um, we feel like we've done our due diligence and that this is a very last minute move to, to really derail our project. And just wanna say, we are not developers. Um, this is really scary for us. This costs us a lot of money. I'm an outdoor guide, for example, and um, we are, trying to bring housing and affordable housing to the west side. We are not building a fancy country club. Um, we're not building McMansions. Um, we are locals. Um, we are teachers. And like I said, I'm a guide, local business owners. We're not destroying the neighborhood. And I really, yeah, I wish we could get off that um, narrative because we're not removing any tact of this neighborhood. And what, what gets really lost in this is um, we're building co-housing. We're building a co-housing community. Um, different sizes of homes, ADUs, um, a community gathering space. And we feel like this is a really great project that's representative of Santa Cruz and representative of the West Side. Um, so yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Brett Packer. I'm a member of the Circle of Friends and thank you all for hearing us. Um, so yeah, we, received notice about this um, this hearing uh, just by looking on the council website on Friday by accident, found that this was coming up on the agenda and um, feel that that's not, that we should have been notified, feel that um, we should have been notified that this meeting was happening now so that we could get our consultants here and our supporters. And it feels very unfair that no one took the time to let us know that this was happening. Um, we've been working really hard for two years on this project. We've met with several of the council members. We've reached out to the other council members um, and didn't get responses. We've held community meetings for most of the summer, for several weeks during the summer where the entire community was invited and um, including the people who would not like to see this circle change. They were there uh, <coughs> often. Um, and we're trying to bring housing by locals, for locals, to the west side at what is affordable. Um, we're all working people, teachers, outdoor guides, um, and this is our way of trying to get housing for ourselves here. And we're maximizing the amount of housing that's possible on that site um, with, uh, 16 units and with the ADUs that we're committing to build will be 30 units of housing on that site, which is considerable that we don't have right now. And this move to send this to HPC is just adding another couple of months, few months to this process and a lot of money. Um, thank you.
Hello, City Council. My name is Ginny Stone, and <clears throat> sorry. This is Ginny Stone, and I was born and raised here in Santa Cruz, and I'm a member of the Circle of Friends co-housing project. I'm really dismayed at the um, vilified nature that some of the locals around here um, are coming across and presenting us as developers. Um, I'm also dismayed that we got no notice to um, attend this meeting. Therefore, a lot of us um, who actually support our project were not able to make it um, to this meeting today. And these people do not want a Lauda Nelson. They do not want a repeat of the checkered past that this property has had. And we would request a continuance at this time. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, uh, for the opportunity to reconsider demolishing this property. My name is Jan Chafin. I've lived in Herit Circle since um, one of those little original cottages, 1890, across the street. Um, it is, of course, the heart of the community. Uh, it was the intention of the original um, creators of the property to always serve as a community center for ceremonies. Uh, if you Google the property, um, you will find over 3,000 references in the Sentinel. If this is not uh, eligible for significance under the uh, criteria, I can't imagine what would be. I don't want to vilify anybody for trying to create more housing. I, I, I completely applaud and commend that, that opportunity. What I don't feel the community was given was an opportunity to respond to purchase. That purchase was somewhat um, sudden and surprising, um, not a lot of response, and I'm not sure the community was actually listened to during some of these meetings. Um, please, 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 please don't take this opportunity away to reconsider. <coughs> Once it's gone, it's gone, and if this church isn't worth saving, what is? Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Smith. Um, I belong to the group called the Circles Women's Coalition, which developed from um, another group of people who have been involved with engaging the City Council um, about this issue, uh, moving it forward to the Historic Preservation Commission. I've also been a person who's had numerous conversations with members of the, friend, of the Circle of Friends, including before they went through their escrow process, and I'll let them know that this, this site was highly used, and at the time of its purchase, it may have been representative as being underutilized, but I illustrated at that time that it was actually very well utilized. It was the home of numerous sports events, sports teams, high schools and middle schools throughout the community that don't have places for their own uh, basketball teams, uh, volleyball teams, fencing teams. There's uh, AA meetings have been held there for years. I taught Waldorf children on that site, Aikido. I'm an Aikido instructor by uh, passion and trade. Um, I've also taught Ellen's children, and I go back, a or a child, <laughs> a long time Aikido, and I go back, and my, my investment in the community is also deep. And what I see is something that I feel, without, with all due respect, and please don't, I know this can feel very personal, it feels personal to us too, but it feels like a greenwashing that what looks like a co-housing project is really something that can't be defined. When we met with Ryan Bain and asked him, well, what's co-housing? He says, well, it's not really defined. And when we looked at the plans, they were, you know, 10 or 12 separate parcels with such setbacks that they could each be sold separately. They could be sold at any price. They could be sold to anyone at any time, and there's no plans in place for those buildings. There are people in this community who are teachers who are teaching there. One or two of the people in the circle of friends is, but is you get the idea. Thank you. Right, next speaker. Hello, my name is Robin Stone, and um, I have lived and worked in this community for um, many years. I've raised my children in this community, and one of my, um, my daughter is part of the circle of friends. And I'm really sad right now to just hear what um, some, of the, some of the things that are being said about the circle, because I have taken um, time over the past couple of years to really get to know some of the people. 
and actually pretty much all of the people. And I have seen a lot of people come together and work really hard to try and create a vision that looks does not look like a mini country club to me. It looks like a community housing project that um, would really add a lot of benefit to the community, um, where they're really taking environmental uh, consideration, in, considerations into how they proceed. And I also am aware that um, there are some structural and code issues around the church, and these people bought this property in good faith, knowing that um, the way the church has been is not able to um, be sustained because it would cost probably too much to, um, to, to be able to do the repairs that are needed. So I just want to make a plea to um, honor the request for a continuance um, so that the circle can have enough time to um, just gather what they need to do to make their case. And, um, I, and I really just, I really hope that um, somehow this community, because it, what really saddens me is that there seems to be a lot of divisiveness. Thank you. So. Next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Joseph Combs. I'm part of the Circle of Friends. Um, I just wanted to point out a few things that in addition to the two non-biased historical reviews that we had and the third party review of one of those, um, the last historical survey was completed in 2013 for the general plan of the 2030 by Leslie Dill, historic art tech and local historians, including Jessica Coos, who is on the historical commission or preservation commission. Um, and this survey was defined the historical properties in here and they did not list air, uh, 111 air circle. Um, the historical status of one one historical has been thoroughly researched and defined as not historical. So I feel like this is a direct attempt to block our project and doesn't really have to do with the facts. Um, I'd, we're definitely not there to make a country club. We're trying to build a community. I grew up here in Santa Cruz. Um, it's hard to have these kind of community hubs and with the time that we've been owning the circle, We've had maybe one or two events over the two years of the community coming in and doing or even requesting anything to be done there. It's basically been using more as a dog walking park right now, besides people who rent it from us. And we wanted to, in addition to create the center circle with us, we wanted to open that up to the community at least four times a year. There'll be more events happening there than are happening now. But I just wanted to say that I'd like to request a no vote on this or continuance, thank you. Marilyn Garrett, I have friends who live in that neighborhood and uh, the historic preservation really needs to be a top priority, I think. I The history is fascinating and I often wish I could step back in time and see what it looked like then and before all this huge contamination we have of chemicals and radiation and car pollution. And I appreciate and applaud all those who spoke up for the character of their neighborhood and maybe having it a, like a park or community meeting space. Um, I also think of sea rise uh, going on and how there's uh, more projects near the ocean. <laughs> I think they're gonna go under. I was here in 2006 when we were talking about another historic site, the Palomar Inn, uh, and the um, incongruent nature of having cell towers on top of that building. And it uh, never, it was going to go to the historic commission, but somehow it didn't. But I think it's very important to do that. And any neighborhood, 
anywhere throughout the city and county is going to be facing this 5G microwave onslaught, which uh, on utility poles and light standards everywhere, every few houses, that isn't with the historic nature or the natural attraction of Santa Cruz. And right. that's Your the next item. I hope people stay Your for Your time it. is up, and we'll have public comment on that topic after this item. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Elise Casby, and I'm here to speak as a community organizer and activist. Um, there's two parts to what I want to say today. The first is about access on a private piece of land, um, which the church is. And the second is about justice and the process that we go through in our system. Um, whether we get justice in the end, um, there's a process that helps us all feel that we had a voice. So, okay, so the first thing that I want to just start with is, um, we are, as beings, historical beings. When somebody loses an arm or a leg, they often have a phantom arm, and like for a long time, somebody talked about the loss of the Cooper house. That's a phantom that hasn't gone away yet, and part, part of the reason that we still feel it is because there's nothing quite like it that we've found yet in downtown. So here out in the circle area, um, we have a space that actually has public access. As the neighbors are talking about who are not the circle of friends who want to build a private enterprise there, largely about housing in their homes, still private. While it's a church, it affords access. I want to say that during the civil rights movement, it was the free spaces in the churches that provided the space for people to be able to come together to organize. That was the public space, the churches, because it was free. They could freely organize in there. So a church that brings in soccer teams and games and has open space for children to play is different than a bunch of private properties that maybe they'll open up their space a couple times a year. If you send this to the Historical Preservation Commission, they're gonna go through a process as a community organizer. I've seen the process before. It may not get designated, but the problem, but the point is it will go through that process and the neighbors and all of us will be able to collectively heal and so forth. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is uh, John Sears and um, so the, the way I understand this motion, this is a motion just to have you refer it to the Historic Preservation Commission to get, uh, they work at your pleasure um, to come up with a determination um, and I understand, yes, uh, maybe uh, someone could help me here. When was the last time a developer paid for a uh, report that didn't support what they wanted to do? This is a, uh, something Jillian Greensight brought up in a, her blog in the end of October. So I think it's, it, I can guarantee you that if this goes forward and you decide in the end, because you're gonna be the ones that decide it, to uh, approve the demolition. This neighborhood is gonna be in grief. It's gonna be devastated. So early intervention, sending it to the Historical Preservation Commission, getting some their question, getting questions answered is gonna be part of that process of healing farther on down the road. So I don't see any reason to delay it. I think it's, it's going to, uh, need to get done. And a lot of the things that were brought up here today are things that are right, correctly addressed uh, by the planning commission. It, it's, they're not a question in terms of this motion. The, the uh, appropriateness of the property and the, the proposed development for the neighborhood, that's pl planning commission makes those decisions. This has to do with history. Uh, our, my neighbors have been uh, I've spent almost a year on this, trying to get this analysis done by a board that we have charged with doing that and serves at your pleasure. <coughs> so I don't know if any of you are aware of this. You can get it at the library. Thank you, your time is up. All right, please come forward. Are there any other members of the committee wanting to address us on this item? Okay, you'll be our last speaker. 
Hey, um, as a member of the catch, I really appreciate uh, that you are listening to everyone's views and making sure people get heard. That for us is sort of the same kind of thing. Um, I just came from the Board of Supervisors and I had to speak about our intake site being uh, at the jail. And I'm gonna go ahead and pause. Are you here to speak to us on item uh, 111, Eric Circle and the yeah, reference? I'll come right back to it in a sec. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I had to speak, and I, you know, I've known naysayers of people not wanting things in their community. And that's something that you definitely have to analyze in this conversation about whether you're talking, you know, it's a, it's a historic thing or it's just a naysayer thing or what it's actually used for. Like, that's something that you have to decide. I just had to speak because I, just thought naysayers was about the housing. Well, it's about staff too, who they, all the staff over there didn't want it in that jail because they didn't want to deal with the people, the homeless people around, like it would be dangerous to staff or they'd lose their parking. So just trying to separate that of getting people's needs met, making sure people are heard. Um, it's, people definitely want to be heard and that's something we need to move forward with Santa Cruz. And that's a nice tie. Next speaker. <laughs> Hi everyone, I live at uh, 1139 Walk Circle. I'm one of the, in one of the oldest houses. In fact, it's the um, first house that was built at the corner of Pendergast and Walk Circle. Um, my husband and I bought the house in 94. All of our kids went to Santa Cruz High School. One of our daughters was married in the Circle Church. But the Circle Church is everything that these people that, that want to save it is. It really is the heart of our neighborhood. And it does draw each other to one another. And that's really important to me. And I think it, it could be improved, but that's what we need to do. We need to stand behind it and make it pump like a heart for this part of Santa Cruz. It's unique. It's the center of a cake. What do you put in the center of a cake? You put the cherry in the center of the cake. Okay, and I'm not against affordable housing whatsoever. It's very difficult to find housing here, but not in that historical site. And if there's a purpose for the Santa Cruz Historical Preservation Commission, then it will address this. There shouldn't be any delay. And if it doesn't meet the criteria, so be it. But if it does, then that's why we have a preservation Commission, you see, this is what it's for. We need to look at this. And I really believe that it meets 130 years of history. Uh, Amy Semple McPherson, a fiery woman, was in that place. You can look at the history there. Our house was part of those small tracks, you know. We're in the circle. So please, no continuance. Let's have this, let's not delay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So it seems that will conclude a public comment on this item. Uh, thank you for being here and sharing your thoughts. I have a question for you, um, uh, Lee, in regards to process, because um, although there was a indication of a motion and then there was a subsequent motion made, um, had that process ensued, I, I would have likely seconded it because I feel that it would be fair to have um, notice if an applicant was to go to have their specific pro project go to be um, referred to the Historic Preservation Commission. Would that be general process, although this item was brought forward by council members with the planning department? notice the the applicants as well as the sort of surrounding area if this was the direction it was going to go in or how does that process work this referral itself is not a public hearing however the um, typical process i guess around a, uh, if this were to be your 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 approach to wanting to move in this direction would there be a notice to the applicants as well as others or how would you so uh, I guess usually something like this um, would come about with an individual requesting it, um, you know, a property owner could request it, or you know, when we did our historic building survey, for example, there were a whole series of properties. Um, the, so the latest version was uh, 2014 or so, 2013, and um, there was a large um, you know, community conversation because there were uh, you know, many properties that were proposed to be added. Um, so uh, the, uh, this, this doesn't require public noticing. Um, there was an indication that um, it could 
um, occur. Um, I understand that confirmation didn't occur until the, the agenda was published for this item. So it wouldn't necessarily require public noticing, but you would likely notice the person or the owners of the property or the the potential designation, or no, not at all. Right. I mean, if they're if if something's involving their property, yes, there okay. would be a, a conversation with them surrounding it. Okay, that's I guess I thank you because that's sort of where I am hearing kind of um, that process not necessarily ensuing, and if they're not in a rush to have it go through, then I wouldn't I wouldn't mind continuing it for the reasons that they could actually have notice of it. And I did hear from certain folks that were teachers and otherwise that couldn't make it. So absent that, it seems, um, it doesn't seem to hurt to not necessarily have them weigh in at a certain time, in my perspective. Um, Council Member Glover, and then. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, wonderful. I really appreciate all of the perspective shared, both from those that are uh, in support of it going to the Historic Preservation Society, as well as those members from the Circle of Friends that came to speak. Um, I was going, just did a quick search in my uh, emails, and I couldn't find any correspondence on October 18th. So um, would love to connect with you after this so that we can chat more about what's going on. Also, uh, I do want to just express my uh, Apologies for if you felt blindsided, which is uh, of course not the goal with this, because with this process it would allow for y'all to be a part of the conversation throughout the process of it going to the Historic Preservation Society, uh, not necessarily, you know, which I would hope it would go through anyway through the process, regardless of third party or outside uh, consultants that were brought in from whichever party to do the analysis. We have the Historic Preservation Commission specifically for us to be able to refer these kinds of issues to them. Uh, so the goal would be to, was, in my opinion, to open it up so that y'all would have the opportunity to participate as wholeheartedly as possible and prepare all of your arguments for the Historic Preservation Society, or commission rather, as well as if it comes back to the council based on their um, suggestion. Also for those on the dais here that are expressing concern about the the notice that was given um, seems a little strange, uh, personally, because of how the agenda setting process is created. Um, the three council members, myself, council member Brown and council member Crone, submitted this agenda report on or before Thanksgiving, which means that those who build the agenda, specifically the mayor who decides on what goes on the agenda itself, um, knew that this was an issue that we wanted to see happen. Uh, also, in association with that, the agenda setting process is very secret. So we as council members have absolutely no idea to know when or if an agenda item is actually going to come on the agenda. So when that is decided, I believe it's on the Tuesday or Wednesday before the city council meeting, that would have been a, a fantastic opportunity for those on the council, especially those in involved in the agenda setting process to reach out to the applicants to let them know that you were planning to put it on the agenda. So I don't think that, that is a viable or logical argument as for us to delay it um, any further. Uh, on top, I just wanna just mention with the timeline and the, the request for continuance, one of the arguments or issues that was brought up was a feeling it would delay the project. Um, I think what we heard from the planning director as well as uh, was expressed by Vice Mayor Cummings was that if we are to delay it or do a continuance, if we come back at, in January and then decide after listening to the arguments to send it to the Historic Preservation Commission, it will delay it at least another month, if not longer. So if we can do it now throughout the, you know, get it set up throughout the holidays to be heard uh, in the January meeting, then that could expedite the process, assuming that your uh, reports are correct and there is no no need for historical preservation, so it could work in your favor in general just to be able to have those kinds of things going on. I can't talk about the merits of the project because that's not on the agenda, but I'd love to meet with uh, y'all from the Circle of Friends so that we can talk about your vision because we haven't had a chance to meet on that project in general. Um, also, just uh, want to acknowledge the importance of the site and uh, to the community. You know, I, I am not, I'm not indifferent. I grew up in Santa Cruz. I was born and raised here, did some things there uh, over time, but I, it doesn't hold as deeply of a meaning to me as some of the people that have spoken. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, so I have no personal agenda in the preservation aspect of it, but I do want to make sure that there is an open and transparent process, both in the historic preservation uh, analysis as well as the opportunity for people to come on the record and share their perspectives. So just to give you a, an idea and respond to some of the things that uh, were brought up during the public comment. 
I'll just briefly clarify, and then I know Councilmember Myers and Vice Mayor Cummings and Councilmember Brown wanted to add. As mayor, you do look at different items that are being brought forward, and the assumption is that those items have been vetted either by the staff or the council. And based on what I heard is that the three council members who brought this item forward uh, did not meet with those on the opposing side or the developer side. So that it, it wasn't necessarily holistically included with all input as designed. So there's that. Councilmember Myers. Just a quick question. Um, Lee, when, when would this project be coming to the Planning Commission? I know we have a lot of work, a lot of projects coming. Um, are we is this months away? Is it just trying to get a sense of the delay part of this? And if I could, related to that, it's I, I think it's part of the timeline question. Okay. Um, go ahead. That. What I see is uh, if this goes to HPC, uh, HPC considers it, either finds it eligible, in which case it goes on one path, or finds it not eligible, in which case does does it die there? Does it come back to us? So, so those are to, just to counter yeah, my. So maybe if you want to describe the process, just, I'm really sure. I'm really trying to understand the process, <coughs> and I and I completely understand the emotion around this building and around that space. I lived on Woodrow Avenue for many years. Um, been in the building a lot. This is an emotional thing. Neighborhood change is is, is emotional, and um, but I want to just recognize and most importantly state that change is hard for all of us. There's risk on each side, and so I'm I'm just trying to understand our process. A lot of what I'm trying to do here is just make sure we understand timelines and process. Uh, we sure. should discuss that in relation to what's on our agenda. Sure. So I I just confirmed they. Um, have finished the last, they had one outstanding item that they were still working through and um, that's been completed. Um, so they would be able to, they would be ready to move forward to planning commission um, in the very near future. I would expect, you know, sometime early next year. Um, if, um, and, and so uh, then to address Councilmember Matthews, uh, question, if the HPC, regardless of their recommendation, um, the, the code says refer that back to the council. So if, if the HPC recommends yes, it should be listed, it comes back to the council. If they say no, it should not be listed, that still comes back to the council, and then it's council's decision. Vice Mayor Cummings and Council Member Brown. And one question in particular, if this comes, if the recommendation comes back from the Historic Preservation Committee, can we then send it to the Planning Commission for their recommendation as well as to whether or not it should be a historic site? Because it, my understanding is that they also have the authority to designate buildings as historic sites. That's something that came up earlier. So the designation is solely within the purview of the council and the code does not specify that the planning commission um, provides recommendations on that. So um, the, the code says HPC recommends on de designations to the council. The planning commission would be in, in, and is mandated to provide comments on the other applications. Um, so the tentative map and the plan development permit, uh, the design permits, for example, those um, are required to go through the planning commission for recommendation to the council, but the designation itself is just a recommendation from HPC. Thanks, and then uh, one other question. Um, I know that members of the community, it sounds like members of the commission expressed on a number of occasions wanting this to come to the Historic Preservation Commission. And I'm not sure if you or someone from the planning department can just briefly speak as to why. Because I think that when that when these reports came out, we could have just had this go to the Historic Preservation Commission. And this is kind of, this feels like the public's last opportunity because they haven't been able to get it on the agenda, which is why it's come to us at this point. And so are you able to speak to that at all? Sure, so the the reports um, do not 
indicate that the project qualifies um, for listing. And the um, both the Planning Commission and the City Council have the opportunity to make that referral as part of their deliberations. Um, the code does not state that these um, projects go to the HPC when they are not listed structures. And in this instance, when we've got um, reports that further support the um, indication that it is not eligible, um, that was something that um, we discussed with the applicant team and um, there isn't anything that mandates that we do that. There is the ability for the um, planning commission or council through their deliberations to make that recommendation. That's one of the decisions that's, that is the decision that's here before you today. Yes, I'd just like to say to the public that um, it's been, I want to thank the folks who've been kind of working on this project because I know that you all have been very responsive to us with more, you know, increased outreach to the community. And I want to say that, you know, that's, it's really great that you all have been taking the time and going through the steps to really try to get community input on this. Um, it's, what's difficult about this is that, um, you know, this spot in particular is so um, kind of, it's a, I wouldn't say it's controversial, but for the community, it's a, it's a very important site and major shifts to this. Obviously, there's a lot of people with a lot of emotions and we're trying to balance all these emotions and these decisions that we're making. And um, for the community, you know, they've come to us and what they really want is the, the opportunity for these documents to be reviewed. I understand that there is a desire to move forward with this as well from the folks who are interested in developing the site, but just kind of looking at the calendar, um, moving this to the, sending this to the Historic Preservation Commission, will, it's, it would likely come if it's the third Wednesday of the month on January 15th. And so that gives about four and a half weeks for folks to kind of work together, to plan, to show up to that meeting with um, all the folks who they want involved in that conversation. And from my perspective, um, it seems like if we were to further delay this, it might not come back until potentially February. And then if it's to go to the historic preservation after that and continue down this route, it could be much longer. And so. From my personal perspective, I think that sending this to the historic preservation will actually save us time. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to make a couple of comments responding to some of the concerns that uh, were raised during public comment and in post packet uh, production communications in writing. Um, so in terms of the, the timing and being blindsided by this, I completely understand that, that would, that's a feeling that you might have by only seeing this when it was published on our agenda. But um, I just wanna be clear that that's when I found out it was gonna be on our agenda. That's when most people found out it was gonna be on our agenda. Um, so it's it's it wasn't that the um, the circle of friends was excluded in some way from learning about this, and that we all knew in advance. We made the request um, after the last council meeting, uh, and then it moved through the process. So I just want to be clear about that. There was no intention for exclusion in terms of previous uh, attempts to communicate. I'm sorry if you did reach out and I didn't respond. I have searched my email inbox and I haven't archived anything since August. So I looked everything through since August of 2019 and I did not see um, uh, a request to meet or uh, reaching out from you all. I apologize if you sent something and I did not receive it with the caveat that our search engines sometimes miss things, but I just did a quick search and I, d I didn't find anything. I'd be happy to talk with you about the project moving forward. My um, interest in moving through this step of historical historic preservation commission review in no way is intended to be a commentary on the project, the merits of the project, or um, you know, a, a, any attempt to uh, prevent the project from going forward. I believe as somebody 
in uh, a public commenter said, you know, once this is gone, it's gone. And so we, we do need to do our due diligence and I wish that it had happened sooner. Um, it was, uh, you know, I, I believe that in my attempt to be responsive to the community, I mean, that those requests came uh, pretty recently um, because of the, um, their inability to get it on the Historic Preservation Commission agenda in another way as Director Butler suggested it wasn't required, so it didn't happen. Um, so I'll leave it there and um, look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Right, I had Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Cron. Um, I'll say just very briefly, I was um, uh, supportive of continuance. It's pretty clear to me that the, the votes are here to send it to HPC uh, for review. Um, I was um, uh, concerned that there hadn't been uh, adequate um, time uh, for um, pulling together um, uh, from the applicants' um, uh, support. I understand that everyone apparently learned about it at the same time. Um, uh, I do un also understand that um, continuance would just kick this ball further down the road um, and that um, really the outcome of the HPC hearing comes back to the council sooner or later in either form. Um, and uh, as others have said, uh, still to be determined are the merits of the project. Um, uh, it's clear as others have said, um, um, there's a prospect of uh, change of use. Um, uh, I, I have to be really honest. Um, I think the, um, the hope of um, uh, the city acquiring this for a community center uh, is uh, remote. Um, and um, it's important to focus on that. I also, I've, I've had years of experience with historic preservation um, endeavors of various scale here in Santa Cruz. There are lots of possible outcomes of historic uh, designation um, and those all remain to be determined in the future. Um, I, I think I'll let my comments stay there. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you. Vice Mayor, too, for your for your words, because I, I, I do think, I actually thought this was going to be a consent agenda item, because why not give the neighbors their, 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 their a time to talk to the Historic Preservation Commission? Um, it always was going to come back to the council. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just not sure what the issue is here, and it's very interesting being up here and trying to peel away this onion administratively. I did have a question for Lee. Um, I see one of my old buddies from education graduate school in the audience, and we used to talk about teachable moments, and I think this is a teachable moment for me. How does something land on the, the uh, Historic Preservation Commission if the, if the council hasn't put it on? Have they asked the planning department to have it on there? And what is the um, nature of putting together an agenda um, I'm assuming there's a commission chair, gets together with a staff member, and they talk about um, putting an agenda together. The latter process is correct. The commission has not requested that this be on their agenda. And um, I would just add that um, if, if this site were deemed eligible by a um, historic report, that also would not be referred to, the process that we would go through likely would not refer that to the HPC. The way that process would go is if it is deemed eligible, then from a CEQA perspective, then it has the same protections as if it is listed. And so in that instance, we would go through an environmental impact report, assuming demolition would be proposed. And we would then, um, proceed through the hearing process and the planning commission or the council could um, have it listed. There could be an instance where we believe, hey, this, uh, this really does need to be listed and um, we could refer that. But if it was an instance where um, for whatever reason, there was staff support for that proposal, there wouldn't just, just, to design, just a historic report saying that it is eligible would not necessarily um, trigger referral. What does trigger referral is if it is actually 
listed. If it's listed, the code says that there is a um, historic alteration permit that's required. And so anything that's listed, if you're making some of the specified changes, that's required to go to the HPC. I do understand that there have been, uh, that there was one individual um, at the HPC um, who um, at a public meeting requested that um, this be brought to them. But it's my understanding that HPC has not voted and has not made a formal um, request to have it come to them. Thank you, Mayor. I have one um, legal question that I know the <coughs> Vice Mayor has a question as well. All, as well, if the um, prior reports indicate that it doesn't meet that designation criteria, but the Historic Preservation Commission finds that it does, and they're in conflict with one another, what does that reconciliation process look like in terms of the legal extent of it? Well, I assume it would come to the city council, but it would have to be right. done in accordance with the standards that are applicable for that designation. Gotcha. So you would have to evaluate the evidence okay. and make a determination. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Kelly? My last question. Um, even if this were to be considered a historic site, would it still is there still a process whereby it could be demolished and turned into this housing project anyway? Yeah. Yes, so the process uh, that would trigger then um, an environmental impact report. So there are thresholds of significance under the California Environmental Quality Act and one of the local thresholds that we have is uh, designation of a structure, if it's designated, and any action that would be taken that would cause that structure to no longer be eligible to be listed in the inventory. And obviously demolition would um, cause it to no longer be eligible. So because it would exceed that threshold of significance, that would be a significant unavoidable impact under CEQA, and that triggers an environmental impact report. And so that's the process. It would be an environmental impact report, and then in order for the council to to ultimately approve a project where there's a significant unavoidable impact, there would have to be a finding of uh, overriding considerations. So essentially, the council would recognize that yes, there is a significant impact, but we're approving this project anyway for X, Y, and Z reasons. All right, so um, before we go ahead and take the vote, I'll just maybe clarify briefly about this process for the agendizing process. Um, this was brought forward to my attention by the three council members that brought this forward, really requesting it come to this meeting. And um, and it's assumed that the uh, report is uh, holistically complete at that time. So that's why it's on this agenda, and that's why um, we're hearing it today. So that said, we'll go ahead and uh, revisit the motion. We have Council Member Crone who made the motion to move the recommendation as presented, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Do you need a clarification? No, I didn't know if we do meant. The no, I'm gonna. I I, I also can can see that uh, I think we're we're we've got the continuation is is not going to be supported. So I won't make a motion. Okay. So all those in favor? Can, can I ask for a friendly amendment? Council, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. That this go to the next possible historic preservation commission meeting. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's that's great. Exactly. That's, that's what we want. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any consider considerations that we need to have before we make that into the motion? Is that possible? I was just checking with the workload of our staff member that uh, is working on it. And, and from our perspective, I think, you know, we're, we're able to bring that um, at, during that timeline. Okay. Okay, so the motion is to have this on the next um, commission meeting for the Historic Preservation Commission. So that friendly amendment was accepted by Vice Mayor Cummings. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone and Glover in support, Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to the next item. And that is our consent public hearing. And that's for um, items 21 and 22, and we'll give you a second to transition out. Are you waiting for 21 and 22. We're going to wait for the transition here. Yeah. Yeah. 
have a presentation or no? No. All right, so we'll go ahead and jump right into our consent public hearing. That's items number 21 and 22 on our agenda. Um, are there any council members who want to comment or to poll either of the consent public hearing items? Council member Brown? <laughs> I see you going for your, sorry. No, no. Um, yeah, I would like to pull item 21. Pulling item 21, okay. And that is the um, second reading of the small cell ordinance. Um, any other uh, comments at this time? Okay, is there any member of the community who would like to uh, speak to the council on item number 22 on our consent public hearing? Okay, please come forward and you'll have two minutes. Meditative things is okay. Anyway, Garrett Phillip, it, this is health and all policies, right? Yes. No, okay. The second I, <laughs> Okay. I doubt, wait a sec. <laughs> I doubt many people understand the significance of this policy. No one doubts the universe around us affects our lives. The question is always to what extent the government has the wisdom or the right to micromanage lives. Our founding fathers answered this question. They chose the individual as the unit of sovereign authority and a limited government to service it. Instead of legislating behavior protecting sovereign rights, this seeks to legislate an expanded redefined health and equity along leftist globalist dogma, which has problems similar to, for instance, legislating morality. Equity should really be decided in the domain of courts ultimately and a general consideration of fair and objective community standard of equity would be better. Your high up says in so many deceptive words, I paraphrase, all people are entitled to an equal life outcome because of our factors we define as unhealthy or an inequity in any way we choose based on loose correlations of this to that in the social studies, which are not science and may confuse correlation with causation, or it alludes to the right of people to achieve their potential being obstructed by, again, whatever you define as potential or causes of preventing potential that theoretically results as a definition of an inequity. This is a sea change in American thought that we didn't exactly vote on as a people and is actually blatant totalitarian. It will be used to decimate individual liberty and based on some really sounds good but actually very unsound ideas. One such is the idea that you can measure someone's potential or know what it is and the government should then pass laws to ensure that it is fulfilled. However, potential truly is an unmeasurable, abstraction at best, unknowable, and here is an excuse for abuse of power. As the underpinning of this policy, it begins with blatantly defective logic. Tell me what my potential is, I dare you. Its purpose is really to establish a leftist globalist template not approved in the court of American public opinion to push all policy through warping priorities without acknowledging the infinite array of other considerations. Your time is up. All right, is there any other members of the community who want to address us on this item? This is item number 22 of our consent public hearing, second reading. Have two minutes. Thank you very much. I just wanted to um, ask the council to please consider the that we've, the way I see it, um, there's been a kind of a streamlining, streamlining of design policy that end up being built and manifest in our <coughs> in our cities and neighborhoods, and basically those are both uh, rather bureaucratic and they definitely serve the greater good. One is, for example, on the more um, capitalistic side where you have development happening um, and hopefully the city is correcting for things like affordable housing and so forth. And then on the other side, I'd really appreciate if any of the council members other than one or two would pay attention to me, please. Um, on the other side of this, there's the kind of um, bureaucratic, uh, what you might call um, public interest side that tries to correct for public interest such as health and sanitation. So I just wanna say how much I really appreciate this, um, the health in all policies and that you're adding the word sanitation is interesting to me and my point today in speaking to this is to ask the council to consider that there's a third way and that third way was gaining um, some light of day back in the 60s and the 70s with new designs that were being brought forward. I really don't know why that happened. Maybe it was our affluence as a country at that time. Um, but 
What I'm trying to say, there are ways of doing real sanitation that are not as common or mainstream that have to do with things like composting and ways of dealing with our waste that are not very much visited. And so I'm asking the council to please retain an open-mindedness because these designs have been buried and that they can provide a wonderful third way for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, really uh, appreciate this being brought forward. Um, I think we all agree on health for our community. Um, for me, it's the devil's in the details. Um, I don't, I, I have some sort of image of what uh, it would mean when somebody's putting a report together, but I'm not quite picturing what the health and all policies would be on the addition to any report that comes forward in the future. Um, so I, I think that maybe we should just clarify that, perhaps saying that it would cover all the different populations. For me, I mean, as you know, I'm always talking about homeless stuff um, to say whether if the addition of health and all policies has to include who, like who is it referring to? So that's just my, my thought on that, thanks. Any other member of the community wanting to speak to us on this item? This is item number 22 on our consent public hearing. Hi, I'm, I'm the, my name is Drew Lewis. Um, I, uh, this just kind of caught my attention. I was gonna speak on another issue, but um, one thing I'm, you, you, you talk about health and sanitation. I would like to uh, draw attention to um, the fact that uh, historically uh, human society has had been uh, ravaged with uh, uh, disease and uh, uh, epidemics and stuff through the hundreds of years. And that pretty much, um, was resolved a few years, uh, uh, the last century when we started in installing uh, public sanitation systems, water treatment, sewage disposal, those diseases pretty much disappeared. And I am uh, really concerned about the fact that uh, this city shuts uh, down and locks up uh, public restrooms to the public, to certain, I might say certain sections of the public. And I think that puts us all at risk because if we have a section of our population that is denied access to um, clean drinking water, uh, uh, um, toilets, and that sort of thing, that we are ex exposing ourselves to the very serious risk of uh, contamination and um, serious epidemic epidemiological crisis by doing so. I think that's really a big mistake. And we did, I believe, have a hepatitis spike um, uh, last year or a year before because of that policy of shutting down public bathrooms. People didn't have a chance. The people were basically, that were homeless, were relieving themselves in the bushes and other places. And I think that's really bad public policy. So I'd hope that you would start thinking about about that, uh, that we're being put at risk in terms of health and sanitation ordinance. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead. Are you here for item 21 or 22? We're on 22. We're on 22. Are you yes. here to speak to that? Health in all policies, and I agree with what Drew Lewis just said. It's essential to provide uh, public restrooms available for everyone. I have a card here. Uh, I like when things are happening in reality, that it's really health in all policies and not just words. And all policies then, not just some, microwave radiation is a health hazard, has known biological effects, and the World Health Organization labels this radiation as a possible carcinogen, same category as lead, DDT, benzenes. You've all been provided with DVDs and literature on the topic. So when you talk, or have health in all policies, we need to be preventing and removing the sources of microwave radiation onslaught. And I'm gonna give you this card, public health warning put out by Stop Smart Meters, that's another source. Uh, this is one of the most unhealthy 
uh, sources of, uh, you know, damaging our health. It's, it's one quintillion times the radiation in the environment we're getting than is natural. That's one with, it's either 18 or 16 zeros causing functional impairment, harming firemen who have these antennas near or on their buildings that they can't perform their duties due to being in a brain fog, coordination off, slowed reaction time. There's a big problem here. Your we need to remove the harm. Thank you. And I believe you'll be our last speaker. Thank you, um, Satya Ryan. I really do appreciate this um, Health and All Policies initiative. My friend Barbara River woman who couldn't come today was talking to me yesterday about the difference between equity and equality. And what she reminded me of is in uh, equality, everyone has equal rights to the same services. But in equity, if there were three people of different heights, the short person would get to stand on a box. So it, it's just given me something to think about because I know equity is one of the pillars in this health and all policies. So I can see how it applies to the issues I'm concerned with and others as well. So um, I'm sharing that for her too. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and return back to council for um, action on this item. Council member, or Vice Mayor Cummings yeah. and Council Member Matthews. I'll just go ahead and move the item. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, Council, uh, seconded by Council Member Matthews. Any further discussion? Yes, I want to acknowledge your leadership. This oh, was, yeah. this was yeah. your Thank baby. You. <laughs> I'm excited about that. And I, I appreciate your work and your input to make it as inclusive as it is at this stage in its second reading. So thank you for that. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and return back to now item number 21, which is the second reading of the um, ordinance. And I believe we have staff here. If we have any questions, is that correct? Or oh, do you have a If you have any questions, I am I'm right here. Okay. Are there any questions from the council on this item? Councilor Brown. I, I don't have a question right at this moment, although I will just say that I've heard from members of the public who have concerns about um, some of the change, the proposed language changes um, <coughs> because they were not in the original published packet. They were given to us after that, um, that packet went out or w was posted to our city website. So I think I'd like to just let the members of the public who are here, I know there are a few, speak about that. And then I, um, I did want to um, try to propose just uh, uh, just a very small change, what I consider to be a very small change. But I'd, I'd like to hear from the public first. Unless there are any other questions before we hear from the public. No, seeing none. Okay, we'll go ahead and open it. Who is uh, interested in speaking to us on this item? This is item number 21 of our consent agenda. Okay, please come forward. Hello again, Satya Ryan. I'm speaking on behalf of EMF Aware. So I'm here asking for your help one more time. <laughs> At the last meeting, I submitted an item F for the purpose and intent section. I was told that the item would be included, which I was very happy about, but not that my wording had been significantly changed. I didn't find that out for s until several days later. It wasn't read aloud, it wasn't explained to the council. Had I known at the time what the wording was, I, n I would have opposed its adoption. The current wording will discourage and prejudice ADA accommodation requests, which is the exact opposite of what I intended. So I ask that uh, this be stricken from the ordinance. And I also, um, I also want to speak about the five-day time limit for ADA accommodation requests. Uh, this was added just before the last meeting. It wasn't published in the agenda online documents. I didn't catch that at the time, but I saw it later. And I've given you a copy of the original published version. 
You know, and I agree that requests should be made as soon as possible, but what I have since learned is that the city cannot legally refuse to consider a disability or a fair housing request for accommodation. So whether the city does this or not is up to you, but I, it's not, um, cannot legally be done. This really honestly feels like a step backwards to me from all the really good work that we've done together. So my hope is that you will reconsider and delete that five day time limit. Um, we also need to include specific contact information for the city about where people send these requests. That's not included currently in that item. And I also have another recommendation regarding item number four under the applicability. Okay, I'm gonna have someone else read this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the community wanting to address this? This is our second reading for item number 21. Hi, my name is Drew Lewis, as you know. I'll also uh, start with uh, finishing what Satya was saying. She's saying she'd also like to recommend that item four under applicability section 1538-030 be deleted. This is an, an exception of wireless facilities that are suspended on communication cables and lines. These facilities are already prohibited in the aesthetics design standards. I feel concerned that if this pro prohibition were to be removed in the future, these facilities would be left unregulated. I would also like to speak about uh, uh, support uh, the re removing the five-day limit uh, for ADA accommodations. Uh, I'd like to point out that the city also like to like to point out that the city does not have the legal right to deter or prevent disability requests for accommodation. And I'd also like to ask why uh, or who this time limit was added one day before the previous council meeting without direction from the council. Um, I'd also like to ask that, uh, that you remove item F from the purpose of an intent of section, which was changed to link ADA accommodation requests with FCC regulations. We were told that this, that it was approved, but not that our wording had been significantly changed. This prevented us from explaining why this wording was so damaging to ADA accommodation requests, codifying a position by the city that the FCC takes precedence. Thank you. Hi, my name's James. I guess I got here right at the right time. I had an unusual callback after a final inspection with the County of Santa Cruz. Fortunately, using the scientific method, got handled really well. So I could repeat what I said before the first time I was here. I'm not at this time. What I am gonna say is due to me being corrected about improper language in this maritime courtroom, I believe that jurisprudence should be changed slightly and that people should be welcome to comment on whatever they want to comment at the seven o'clock time. And I'm gonna hold all of you to that. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak to item number 21 on our consent public hearing? Mayor Renette Senum of Nevada City Council, California states, 4G, 5G and the public right of way is a corporate and hostile takeover of our public right of way with no concern for public health and the environment. As this hostile, hostile takeover progresses, Right now, we are under continuous assault with microwave radiation warfare frequencies. Please view and review the DVD I provided each of you titled 5G Apocalypse, the Extinction Event for substantiation and thank you, Council Member Sandy Brown for already viewing that. Liability issues and fire. Crown Castle and Verizon, according to its 2014 SEC filing, does not have liability insurance for health effects. If residents sue for radiation caused illness due to small cell towers outside their homes in the public right of way, cities like Santa Cruz will be left defenseless. 
The city, not Verizon or Crown Castle, will likely incur significant costs for liability damages. And I will give you a picture of one of these cell sites that caught on fire in Clovis, California. By entering agreements with Amoral Telecom Corporations, you are mandating an intensification of the radiation destruction that has already taken place over the last 23 years with 2G, 3G, 4G. No resident or child has authorized 24-7 you're bodily microwave well, you're, you're welcome bound. to leave your- um, We do not consent. Okay, your time is up. All right, I think you'll be our last speaker here. Oh, listen to Dr. Carl Merritt at three o'clock on the radio okay. today. You're welcome to on leave any documents with us. Are there any other members of the community who want to speak? Okay, <coughs> I understand then, then you'll be our last speaker with the hat on. Go ahead. This is not my issue. So um, <laughs> I just wanna first of all say, I remember uh, Ms. Myers speaking about the fact that she did not feel very happy about the federal government telling us what we could oppose legally or not when it comes to these uh, 5G t towers. And I appreciated that statement because we are in, at a time when the type of um, dominance and exploitation that we are going through in terms of our democracy, in terms of our ability to even sue, which we are prohibited supposedly from doing um, on paper, it's, um, all I can say it is very extreme. And, and these types of he hegemonies happen in our time through laws, through uh, economic domination, forms of domination. So I just want to switch at this point to the fact that my nephew is um, suffering with a form of leukemia. My sister, was his mother was just diagnosed with breast cancer and uh, she also suffered a divorce and lost her house and uh, I found her on a GoFundMe website because we're estranged at this point. So I just wanna talk about the forms of violence that are being pervaded through all of our families, through all of our networks and institutions at this point. And we are just having such a difficult time standing up to these toxic uh, policies. So when it comes to cell phones and computers and so forth, I was just told by somebody who knows about the minerals that go into all these gadgets and we are destroying the global south to get these materials and now we are going to destroy ourselves. It's likely that my, my nephew uh, got a fat dose of radiation from Fukushima because of the way the weather patterns hit. They live in Portland. We don't know, but I sure wish we did know and I think we should be very careful at this time. Thank you. And you'll be our last speaker. Uh, honorary Ms. Watkins, honorary council members. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, show us the health and safety study, FCC, independent of the FCC. Um, we already know overwhelmingly that um, through scientific evidence that microwave radiation is dangerous to humans, plants, and animals. And being of such a biodiverse region as Santa Cruz, such a beautiful Monterey Bay, which where I've grown up and lived my whole life, um, Keeping that uh, quality of life here is very, very important for all of us. I think 5G uh, in public thoroughfares would definitely affect, um, you know, our overall our overall health of people not wanting to be exposed. Uh, this constitutes a uh, violation of the Nuremberg Treaty, uh, being tested upon without the willingness of the citizens of the United States. Um, we, we do not want 5G in our neighborhoods. We do not want new cell towers in our neighborhoods. We do not want crowd control weapons used in Iraq and Iran that is now called phased array. Don't, don't get it confused. This is a laser, okay? This is not microwave. This is new technology that hasn't been thoroughly tested. So I would uh, encourage, uh, as we have done already in Carmel with a ban by the city council on 5G and a lawsuit against Verizon in Monterey County by the Santa Cruz City Council against 5G. Now they wanna go to the planning commission. 
uh, the Coastal Commission, but uh, that's a whole nother thing. But we, um, there's, there's nations all over that are stepping up, including uh, Russia is now going to fiber optics over 5G. Uh, Poland banned 5G. Many, many countries have proven it unsafe, uh, according to the, the tests that were done in The Hague. Birds dropped it out of the sky with internal hemorrhaging. Um, so there's many, many things here, including you know, headaches, insomnia, dizziness. <clears throat> Thank you very much, but I encourage a ban on the 5G till further testing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and return back to the council now for action on this Just item. giving you a Dr. I'm sorry, ma'am, we're all article. done. You're welcome One to hand our each. stuff over. Okay, yeah. Okay, Councilman Brown. Yeah, um, so I hope that we can move through this pretty quickly because we have spent quite a bit of time on it. I wanted to ask um, for clarification on um, the requirements around uh, second reading versus first reading. Were we to delete item F, which came to us um, late, uh, was not, uh, so as a member of the public suggested, this was at the request of that um, the EMF aware group and with the amended language that ended up in the version that we saw for today, um, they're not support very. They're not supportive of that. If we just strike uh, item F under on uh, ordinance 2019-11, um, chapter 15.38 F, can would that require an, another second reading? Would this be? A can you give reading? me just a minute to sure. ponder that, and perhaps while sure. the council continues its discussion. Thanks. So um, that is, uh, you know, I, my hope is that we could just do that today and, and um, take care of that. Um, with respect to the request about de the deletion of item number four um, in 15.38030 of, of the ordinance 2019-11, I, um, I understand that concern that if the prohibition on design aesthetic were to be <coughs> removed, then the, those facilities, um, the overhead line facilities or, um, uh, yeah, facilities, I guess, I'll catch all word for it, if though that would be left unregulated. And I think that um, that is something that I, I completely understand. And I think that um, that's something that we ought to monitor and should those, um, that other prohibition be removed in other some elsewhere um, that we could then revisit that um, rather than doing it now um, because I do want to try to if we can uh, resolve it today um, with respect to the guidelines which um, and the five-day turnaround um, on guidelines I um, I take it that uh, that we are whether or not we say it we can't require the five days um, under the ADA. So I'm, you know, at this point, if we leave it in there, I, I'm inclined to say, let's just take it out. But I understand we've had this conversation multiple, on multiple occasions. And if uh, it is the will of uh, the council and um, based on recommendation from staff to leave it in, we can leave it in and we will, it will get resolved if and when the time comes that that such a, an accommodation request is is made, um, and uh, if the law is on the side of not requiring, not not limiting to five days, then that's how we will need to proceed at that time. So um, that's so, all I was going to say for now. So if the ordinance is altered after its introduction, um, then it has to come back for another second reading. Um, there's an exception for clerical or typographical errors, and I think the deletion of that paragraph goes a little bit beyond what I would consider a clerical or typographical error. So um, what I might suggest, just given the extensive time that the council has already devoted to this topic, um, not to mention the amount of time, staff time and city attorney time that's taken, should that be the will of the council that you uh, recommend bringing that narrow uh, uh, amendment back for introduction at a future meeting. So you could proceed today with the final adoption and we could come back with an ordinance amending just to delete subsection F. 
I would be supportive of that if that's the direction we want to go. And I just want to appreciate and acknowledge your comments because you referenced that a good portion of your staff time has, and as an example, when we were talking about the legal fees earlier on this item. So hopefully we can, although as complicated and difficult it is, in a, a difficult position local jurisdictions are in, that we can eventually try to move something. Well, and I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to diminish the amount of effort that has gone into this, both by council members and members of the public, to what I end up with what I think is a is a very good work product, um, but it has been a long time getting here. Yeah. Okay, Councilmember Crohn, and then. What about the other two issues that were brought up here? That Councilmember Brown just said. Those would also have to be brought back. So if you want to make that change today, it would come back for a second reading in January, or you could direct that those amendments be brought back for consideration as a separate ordinance. And what about adding city contact information for, the requ for all requests, where people can, you know, where they go to? <laughs> if I might, uh, I believe that's gonna be provided on our website for small cell. Uh, and at this point, I mean, I don't think that's something that belongs in the ordinance itself. Maybe the, maybe the, um, department perhaps but mm -hmm. and does it matter if we take out the five day and I call my team up here to help with that good afternoon I first of all the five day public notification that's in the permit guidelines so that's not before council today but obviously we could revisit that um, I believe that council member Myers asked a question about the five day public notification at the last meeting and I just explained that, you know, we had put that time limit with regards to the FCC shot clocks and before that meeting we had received several letters from Verizon, AT&T, suggesting that the city's proposed process perhaps wouldn't meet the <coughs> shot clock. So this was our recommendation for a proposed timeline to protect the city from that. Does it matter as Councilmember Brown and member of the public talked about five days? I mean, it's, you can still make, um, still appeal it, I guess, if, for, through Americans for Disabilities Act or not? So do you need the five days or is it kind of moot? It's just what, I, what I would suggest is that, that you consider um, keeping it in there because really talking about two different things here. Uh, and I think it's right that a person could bring an ADA claim um, past the five day period, but what we're really talking about is the process for permitting of these facilities. Even a facility that's in place might be the subject of an ADA claim at some point. And so, um, so, so I think the reason why it's important to have a, a, a limit is so that our process is able to meet the shot clock. Um, should someone bring an ADA claim um, outside of that process, then that would just be handled as any other claim against the city would be handled. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Thank you for the clarification. So um, w given the direction that our city attorney has given us, I'd like to make a motion then uh, that we adopt ordinance 2019. This is the, uh, it's already, established here in the, in the staff recommendation that we um, adopt ordinance number 2019-06 amending title 24 of the Santa Cruz Muni Code um, <coughs> at, as per uh, the staff recommendation that we to adopt a resolution authorizing and directing the city manager to submit the adopted amendments as written um, in the agenda and staff report and three, that we adopt the ordinance number 2019-11 um, as uh, written in the agenda. And four, that we direct staff to return in January, is that possible? At second meeting in January with uh, narrow um, ordinance, revisions uh, proposal, an ordinance revision proposal uh, to delete item F in ordinance 2019-11, section 15.3803, oh no, that's, I'm um, sorry, sorry, 15.38010, subsection two, item F. And, 
um, section 15.38.030, item three, uh, number four. Delete, to delete those two. Narrowly, to consider narrowly the deletion of those two items. And that Bonnie? Okay. Uh, just want to point out that there's also a resolution authorizing the city manager to transmit um, did I not? You, you did say that. The amendments I, yeah, to the Coastal that Commission. That was number two. Yeah, the resolution. Yes. All right. So we have a motion by Councilmember Brown. Is there a second? I'll go ahead and second that. All those in favor, unless I there's a, any further discussion. Question. You have a question? Could we divide the question? Um, I have some questions on number four. The re, the on, revisit. On the, on the, to bring it back for consideration. Yeah, I have just some questions on that. Do you want to have those questions heard now, or would you like to have those questions when they were brought back? I think it would be great to have the questions, but I don't know if we'll have the answers. Um, Okay. I would like to just say that we will be providing comment and our recommendations on those modifications when we bring them back, okay. because I'm not prepared to, to do that today. Okay, so given that information, do you wanna reserve your questions after there's preparation on behalf of the city attorney for comment on those potential changes? I suppose so. Uh, I'll just say briefly, um, my recollection is that there were real reasons for those, the language that we have now. I, I don't need to get into it now because obviously the votes are there to bring it back. Um, I will say an item for exclusion about the being strung between utility poles, um, it refers to um, facilities um, strung between utility <coughs> poles in compliance with applicable safety codes. It doesn't talk about a design issue. So um, that's just one example. I think um, uh, it will come back, but by sending it for coming back, I'm not at all certain that I'm going to support them in the end. Okay, okay great. I don't know if this is the correct time, but I'm prepared to speak about uh, subsection F and the purpose intent of the ordinance, if you would like Sorry, to hear our I'd thoughts now it. or. Okay, yeah. I'll take, we, we are running late and behind, I would say. Oh, I'm we sorry. Need to take a okay, well then. But it's fine, because this is just, you know, as a second reading and the amount of discussion that we've had um, subsequent on this specific topic, um, we weren't really allocating this amount of time for this level of discussion uh, again. But if we want to briefly have is that brief? answered. I can, I can be brief. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So this is in regards to uh, section F. We did add in section F in resp response to Ms. Orion's uh, comments, which came after the agenda packet went out. So that was the reason for that change. But we did make some modifications as we advised city council. And namely, we just added in that the city was going to you know, not limit an individual's ability to seek a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, but we would still be in compliance with the law, applicable law, and we kept it very broad. So that could be the Telecommunications Act, that could be the ADA. And as we've explained to council, there's some disagreement among the courts as to whether the ADA preempts the TCA or not. And so our recommendation from our office has just been for council to continue forward that we need to comply with the TCA. But I don't believe that this language necessarily changes much. It just says that council will comply with applicable law. So I'm we felt like we kept the language very broad so that it would work. Um. Okay, Councilor Brown. I'll, I, I appreciate the uh, comments and I, I understand that it was a late request and the, so I was, there was no commentary on having not received it earlier. I'm simply saying that given that this was never, this was not proposed by the city, by city staff or the city attorney's mm -hmm. office to even be included in the ordinance. It seems like a, it shouldn't take that much conversation and con, you know deliberation to just remove it entirely. We weren't gonna put it in there, so it's clearly not necessary from the city's perspective. Correct. Okay. okay. Right. So given that, do you still want to divide the question? Okay. okay, so then all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We're gonna take a 10 minute break and then we'll return back for item number 23 on our council meeting agenda packet. All right, we'll go ahead and come back if we can at this time. So we're on item number 23 of our public hearing um, agenda for the afternoon Santa Cruz City Council mm -hmm. December 10th meeting. And we'll just go ahead and jump right in. What we'll have is a presentation from staff. Um, any clarifying questions as needed from the council, we'll open it up to public comment and then return back for action.
Great. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, members of the Council. Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development, and with me today is Lee Butler, um, Director of, of Planning and Community Development. And in the audience, I have uh, Jessica DeWitt and Jessica Meller, who also have been working on, on this item over the last two months. We have a, uh, a short presentation and then we're open to answer any questions that you have. I first just wanted to start with a very um, brief background of, of how we got to this point. Um, this has been an 18 month process um, through the amendments and then through the additional direction that we've been working on recently um, through to the Planning Commission on November 21st and then back um, to um, the, you know, this, the settlement um, that we had over the last couple of meetings. And so um, without going into a lot of detail on the background, we did agree um, and settled um, for a 15% citywide um, inclusionary amendment that um, was passed in the second reading at the, at the previous council meeting. We did go to the planning commission on November 21st. Um, they reviewed and, recomm and made recommendations regarding any additional proposed changes. Um, and they did, at per council direction, review and have a recommendation regarding the inclusionary percentage, and I'll go through um, those briefly. Overall, um, for this afternoon's uh, meeting, these are the items we're going to be reviewing with you and asking you to take action on today. First is to review the Planning Commission recommendations, then to review the staff recommendations and take action on the following. Uh, consider amendments to the inclusionary ordinance consistent with state law. Consider additional staff recommendations for future Planning Commission for some cleanup items um, related to uh, any ordinance changes proposed today and then to take no further action related to the plaintiff proposed additional red line amendments. Um, and then finally, and I think the main discussion is to discuss and take action on whether to increase the current citywide inclusionary rate from 15 to 20%. And we'll take these one at a time. So the first one is to review of the Planning Commission recommendations. Um, the recommendations are specifically to conduct a feasibility analysis by a qualified independent financial consultant to evaluate the effect of increasing the inclusionary ordinance citywide for all housing developments, both rental and ownership, prior to consideration of increasing the inclusionary rate. They also recommend that we amend the inclusionary ordinance by making specified changes um, to reflect newly enacted state law. Um, they directed staff to review and bring back any cleanup amendments related to identified inconsistencies created by um, amendments to the ordinance back to the Planning Commission for further review and recommendations, and then to take no further amendments um, to be made to the ordinance in relation to the settlement agreement, additional red line changes. So um, briefly, um, those are the Planning Commission recommendations that are related to the staff recommendations, and we'll go through those one by one as well. So the first is review of the staff recommendations. The staff recommendations are to, uh, the first one is to consider uh, amendments to the inclusionary ordinance consistent with state law. And the specific law that we're referring to here is Senate Bill 330, which is the Heis Housing Crisis Act of 2019. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Butler to briefly go over these changes. Thank you, Bonnie. So <clears throat> we are, um, <clears throat> recommending that a reference to the new government code section that will be coming into effect on January 1st of 2019 be included, or excuse me, January 1st of 2020, be included with the uh, <coughs> ordinance. And that is because it specifically, that section of the code specifically identifies when um, we can add new fees and it specifies that if an applicant has uh, prepared and submitted a complete preliminary review application that the fees are set in place at the time of that complete application submittal. So for ease, we would have to comply with that regardless of whether it's here, but for ease of the development community and the general public understanding that we're recommending that that be added in here. We've also included a couple of clarification items to um, address what we think thought may be some concerns from the appellants and also just to, to clarify for the council and the public that if we are using another um, uh, another provision, we it would be something else that the council has adopted and not just uh, another provision that's not a part of our code or um, something that hasn't been adopted by council. 
Um, additionally, um, we <coughs> recommend that council um, consider uh, future planning commission consideration of any cleanup amendments following council direction. And specifically, the point of this is just to address any inconsistencies. It's a pretty complicated ordinance, and when um, you know you ch we change certain things, there are often linkages to other sections, and, w and looking through them, we think there are a couple minor ones that we need to bring back. We wanted to wait until to see what action you took today to see if we needed to make additional ones. So we're just recommending that you have us, once you make your decision today, to go through to see identify any inconsistencies, and then go back to planning commission to address those and come back to you for the for those. And so we do recommend um, doing that as well. And then finally, um, we recommend, and this is also the Planning Commission recommendation, to take no further action related to the additional, um, this is beyond the settlement agreement, um, plaintiff proposed uh, red line changes. And those are um, in your packet as um, attachments five and six. And specifically, this is six, which is the um, staff analysis, um, the uh, summary of the proposed changes in the staff analysis. And our recommendation on this is to take no further action on the grounds the changes would either, um, in some instances, violate state law and government code, or have a potential or real adverse impact on this, the city's affordable housing production. So um, to recap, uh, the discussion and actions for tonight's meeting is um, the review of the Planning Commission recommendations, um, the review of staff recommendations that I just went over, and then finally, um, to discuss and take action on whether to increase the current citywide inclusionary rate from 15 to 20%. So the balance of the presentation really focuses on this third, this third area. Um, the recommendation, the staff recommendation, is to consider an increase in the inclusionary percentage citywide for all housing developments, both rental and ownership, after consideration of a fe feasibility analysis prepared by a qualified consultant evaluating the impacts of such changes. And I specifically wanted to, to just go into why we're recommending this at this time. We want to make sure per that we're doing informed decision, um, that there is an informed decision based on credible analysis and market data. Um, we want to avoid any unintended consequences of negatively impacting affordable housing production. And um, finally, the most recent study that we uh, did have um, Kaiser Marston prepare in 2018 was for rental housing only. We haven't done a recent study in a, in a, a number of years um, that has really looked at the impact of increasing the inclusionary rate for ownership housing. We were intending to do that following the amendments in 2018, um, but given what happened with the lawsuit, it, it, the timing wasn't right to, to, to do that until that was resolved. You know, our concerns um, about increasing it without having some additional data as a baseline, it's one data point. So we're not saying that, uh, you know, that that's the only source of information we, we look at, but it is an important one to really um, be aware of what market rea realities are in addition to the context of other policy changes at the city level. Um, the, the inclusionary requirements that we have significantly reduce income from rental units and sale prices for for, for for sale homes. In our tight housing market, compliance with inclusionary requirements may make many projects fin financially um, infeasible. Density bonus does provide one method for developers to improve the economics of their project, but it may not completely address feasibility. Obtaining greater density can help the developer uh, of any project bring costs and financing sources into line by putting more homes on the land, reducing the per unit costs. However, developers need to make a cost-benefit determination, whether the cost of compliance is worth the, is worth the benefit. It is not a foregone conclusion that all builders or developers will be able to take advantage of the density bonus provisions. So that's just an important element to keep in mind as we, as we move forward with this. Um, in context, as this has come up, um, we've looked at nearby jurisdictions. We've actually looked at a much broader swath um, across um, across California of what other jurisdictions are really looking at as far as their inclusionary ordinances, to put that in perspective, and Santa Cruz is the third down. Um, both Monterey County, San Francisco, and Watsonville are specifically called out here because some, there's some elements of their ordinance which does include a 20% um, or greater. It's also important 
important to recognize that Santa Cruz, when you're considering offsite, does have a 30%. So um, that we have in comparison, actually, even though ours is, is 15 um, on, the, on the rental, um, it's important to, to recognize um, that you can see the other three jurisdictions, um, whether it's a county or, or the city of, of Watsonville, all have more flexibility on the area median income. So you can have a higher income and qualify um, for those units. You can sell them at a higher rate. You can rent them at a higher rate because it goes up to 100% or even up to 130% in the, in the case of San Francisco. Additionally, if you look on the threshold project size, some of them only start for projects, um, in the case of San Francisco, for 10 units or more. And then some have different uh, flexibility for projects under 25 or more than 25. So my point in showing all of these um, and just going back to the cities is that we have a, a currently a pretty inflexible program. It's very tight and when you compare it to other jurisdictions, it's not a clear across the board apples to apples comparison. Um, when you look at our housing element, because this also comes up frequently, um, and you go to the far right column, um, you'll see that the total remaining regional housing needs assessment numbers by income level that we still need to, and we have you know, basically four years uh, left, not including the current year we're in, to create 168 very low units and low units. Um, low units is 80% of area median income. I think it's likely that we'll, we'll be able to meet that during this period. The very, very low is going to be challenging, but I do want to point out that typically for those very low units, those aren't created by private development. Um, those are generally created by publicly assisted projects, affordable housing projects with city funding, um, other traditional combination funding of, of financing sources. So I do think we need, really need to look at what our goals are and how do we achieve that and what level of income we want to put on private development to achieve our inclusionary goals. Um, again, if you go a little more t closely and look at some of those neighboring jurisdictions, when you really break down their 20% and look at, they have a lot of flexibility. So I've circled in green um, at Monterey County um, that you can see that those that are either at or lower than our AMI is actually a lower percentage than our 15%. So it's 12% in Monterey. San Francisco, it's 12% and 10% um, when you get for projects larger than 25 units that's actually lower than our 80% at ANMI. So again, uh, the point in showing this is just that there's a lot of variability and it really depends on the community. And I think there's a lot of options that we really could have as we go forward and look at what, what our ordinance is. Watsonville um, is also worth pointing out because they're you know, our, our, our neighbor. Um, they have a 20%, but they have a lot of flexibility. They have 5% of that is at 100% of AMI, um, and 5% is, is similar to our 15%, and then they have 5% at low. Um, and then they have a 5% Section 8, and that's really interesting. That's based on um, whether or not there are uh, households seeking uh, units at the time that a project is put on the market. They have one month, and if someone comes forward, that can qualify. If that doesn't happen, then that 5% that gets waived. So again, I'm, I'm just pointing these out to, 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 sh to really share with you that if we are looking at flexibility, I think we have, um, there's a lot of room that we can do to really look at um, how we craft our ordinance, but our current ordinance at, at you know 15% at 80% of AMI is very restrictive and it's really hard to meet. And if we increase that to 20%, with a, that existing 80% of AMI, it, it really may be too uh, infeasible for developers to move forward. Um, to just sort of recap this, I think if we're, we really need as, as a community, as a city, to determine what our affordability goals are for the city. What are we trying to achieve with this ordinance? Or ordinance? Are we trying to meet our regional housing needs goals? You know, are we trying to meet our Measure O commitment? And our Measure O is, um, is looking at 15% at average income, which is considerably higher than our 80% of median. Um, create an inclusionary requirements that can be feasibly achieved. You know, I think uh, looking 
speaking from my perspective, I want affordable housing to be built. So when I, it just on the surface of it, say 20 or 25 percent, that sounds great. But if we, if it's actually not feasible because we're imposing this on private development, um, we're not going to be achieving our goals. So uh, uh, hoping that we can, as we go forward, we can create inclusionary requirements that incentivize affordable housing development, um, that don't inhibit housing development, and that we also can look at some of the smaller projects, because you typically, for those projects, either under 25 or under 10, um, have different financing and potentially different development um, expertise at some of those than the larger projects, and they finance them differently. So looking at those as well. And then finally, to look at other jurisdictions and to see what's working, what isn't, and why. I'd love to sit down with the city of Watsonville and really talk to them about their Section 8 um, component that they have and to find out how that's working. Um, finally, um, this is the last two points are just, the, the, I think one of the, the goals of conducting a market feasibility analysis for Santa Cruz for rental and ownership, for ownership as I mentioned, we don't have baseline data for that right now. Um, it's been some time since we've <coughs> modified or looked at our inclusionary for ownership and I really feel like we need to do that. Um, and again, to look at what is the range of how we could achieve if we are going to a 20%, um, if we're looking at 20% up to moderate income, which would be 120% of area median income. Um, are we looking at maybe trying to incentivize some of those lowest, uh, deepest levels of affordability? Maybe we want to provide some flexibility of how we get there. Maybe if a developer want, is willing to go there or if we even have some funding to go there that we could look at a lower percentage if they're meeting those deeper affordability. Or maybe um, we want to provide some flexibility or a combination of options of how we get to, for example, if we go to 20%. Um, so just to recap the recommendation, and I do have copies of that coming coming around, um, it's a, to introduce an ordinance today amending specified changes reflected of newly enacted state law, recommend that council direct staff to review and bring any cleanup amendments related to those, to any inconsistencies created by ordinance amendments back to the Planning Commission for consideration. Recommend that council take no further action on additional proposed red line amendments in attachments five and six. These are beyond the settlement. Um, and I, sh I should just add right here um, that uh, recommendation number three is also the Planning Commission recommendation and that comp component of the recommendation was unanimous by the Planning Commission. Um, and then finally, to consider an increase in the inclusionary percentage citywide for all housing developments, both rental and ownership, after consideration of a feasibility analysis prepared by a qualified consultant to evaluate the impacts of such changes. And um, that's, um, I have some backup slides if we if you have specific questions, but that, that concludes our staff presentation. Great. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question. Are there any other council members with questions or are we wanting to go straight to public comment? Or maybe, do you, is there any additional questions? I don't have additional questions. Okay, I just have one brief question just because I know that we have our superintendent here, uh, Chris Monroe for Santa Cruz City School. I'm wondering how the ordinance applies to any type of workforce housing development and how it could be designed um, to or modified to accommodate some of the interests around um, different types of projects like they're proposing for workforce housing. So when we were talking about typically 120% is considered, uh, you know, uh, workforce housing, sometimes up to 150% is considered workforce housing, so I think that would be part of the flexibility if we wanted to include a, a, a variety of ranges of income that qualify. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Unless there aren't any additional questions at this time, why don't we go ahead and open it up to public comment, and those who want to come forward, please do, and you'll have up to two minutes. Good afternoon. I just want to start by thanking all of you for your service to our community. I know it's not easy for council or staff, and we just appreciate what you do for our community. Um, in, on January 1st, 2017, Senate Bill 1413 went into effect, which authorized school districts to establish a program aimed at helping teachers secure affordable housing. Um, as a school district, we've spent the last three years, three and a half years, investing, getting the possibility of workforce housing projects. Uh, there's a national teacher shortage, and in the last five years, we've lost 50 teachers because of the cost of living in our community. That's a really significant percentage of our, of our teach, teaching workforce. We um, get young teachers here 
Um, oftentimes they're living multiple people to um, apartments and or couch surfing or living with friends and um, they can't get established here. And our goal is really to help um, young people get established in our community and we wanna recruit the best and brightest people to serve the, the children and youth in our community. Um, we've also seen a high turnover of our support staff, particularly our part-time staff that work in classrooms with students and serve in our cafeterias. Um, and as you're considering your inclusionary housing ordinance, I really want you to consider language that would allow a waiver to inclusionary ordinance for workforce projects. Our goal is to provide below market rents for all of our employees. We wanna build an 80 unit complex out on Swiss Street um, at the old Arc Monarch property. Um, although our young teachers can't afford to live here, they make too much to qualify as low income under the, I'm sorry, I'm talking. You know, if we, if we have questions, if you are gonna be here, we can maybe have you come back up. Can I just really fast? Um, so, I know, you know, I'm pretty consistent. Let me, let me okay. just, if you want, you can leave it. And then if, I think we might have questions. So we, we will likely have you come back up if that's okay. Okay, so we'll go ahead and keep going and then um, we'll reserve maybe some further conversation or questions around your specific circumstance. Please come forward. Thank you, uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor and City Council. My name is Jesse Bristow with Swenson Builders. I'm a development project manager and we did write a letter um, echoing uh, support for Planning Commission's recommendation to, um, to review an analysis uh, for that affordability increase, but strictly with, with a study that supports that. Uh, currently we, we feel at 15% and there's a certain amount of challenges when it comes to development with construction costs, with, uh, with demand, supply and demand, lack of, of supply across the, across the state in the region of the Greater Bay Area and Santa Cruz Monterey um, Bay Area. So we just like to um, further support staff uh, for recommendation number four that there should be a, fe a feasibility study that justifies this increase uh, from 15% to 20% because currently uh, as staff said um, it's it's very fixed it's very um, it's not flexible in how we can make projects work and and the the increase the more we increase the affordable it's subsidized by those market rate and you're further pushing up market rate rents making it even more unaffordable for people who would uh, afford it under uh, 15 percent and so um, we feel that you know current density bonuses right now the the 190 Westcliff is a perfect example they took advantage of the density uh, bonus where you were able to get 8% of um, low, or I think eight units that were low or very low. And those wouldn't have been able to be achieved if those extra units through the density bonus on the extra floor weren't uh, provided. So uh, as you kind of shrink it on both ends, it becomes more challenging to provide those units and those affordable units. And just quickly, as far as the study for the for sale, to just to give you some perspective, our phase one of Aptos Village, we had five Measure J units affordable, and because of the government shutdown and problems with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it took uh, it took a year to close those. Thank so, you. anyways, thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please. Hello, uh, my name is Rafa. You all know me from my work on homelessness. Um, I'm speaking now because the lack of affordability of housing in our community appears to be contributing to a trend of increasing housing instability, which is a, a significant contributor to homelessness. Uh, that said, I support the staff's recommendations on this item and concur that simply increasing the inclusionary requirement in our ordinance will not necessarily result in real life increases to the actual number of affordable units built. Um, I think that the hope is that raising the inclusionary rate will force private developers to add more affordable units, but at the same time, doing so amounts to a tax on development that may lead to less development and thus less affordable housing. If we're raising inclusionary rates, we need to offer more incentives for developers to build affordable units, perhaps things like raised height limits for inclusionary projects. Uh, the staff mentioned a few other things like uh, looking at income limits as well. Um, still relying on private capital to meet all of our affordable housing goals is just with wishful thinking. We should decide what role private capital should serve in our affordability goals. 
a few weeks ago, uh, Council Member Glover hosted a community forum on affordable housing where lots of good ideas were discussed. Uh, we talked about uh, ways that we could uh, bring in things other than private capital to meet our capital requirements. Things like municipal bank financing, affordable land trusts were just a couple ideas that stood out to me. Um, we, uh, we should take seriously those ideas uh, so that we're not so dependent on for-profit lenders and their loan risk assessments for providing the capital we need to build affordable homes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Evan Soroki, and uh, I also like to give Drew Glover credit and thanks for having a good meeting on uh, how we can create affordable housing. And uh, yeah, uh, Rafa mentioned a number of good ideas that I think are good ideas as well. Uh, one thing though that really stuck out to me in uh, Glover's presentation was that there's a need for 12,000 affordable homes, 12,000. So here we're today revisiting a measure that is potentially gonna get us towards that goal of 12,000. I hope that's a goal for, for everyone here. And so apparently the goal is to get us towards that number. So I wanna know like how many of that 12,000 is this particular policy that we're gonna get us there. And I did some, some thinking of like, you know, we had that 190 Westcliff project and then that was uh, there's 10 units there. So like maybe if this was like 20%, maybe we would have gotten three more in there. So like three homes is 0.025% of 12,000. So then that uh, Pacific in front, uh, let's say that despite, you know, an expert saying that the developer probably was gonna have a financially infeasible project, if they did, you know, 15%, let's say they still did it with 20%. And so that means like, you know, let's say it was 300 units and with the 15%, that would have been 45. And so this policy changed 20% may have upped that to 15 additional affordable homes. So 18 homes is 0.15% of 12,000. So, I don't see how this particular topic really gets us close, and I hope you just spend time doing something else that does. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Ron Pomerantz. Uh, I think all council members are in strong support of increasing affordable housing, and the question merely is, how do we do it? Some believe the private market can achieve this. I do not. <clears throat> More government involvement is essential, and there's a number of ways to do it. You have before you one of those, the 20% increase. Just on the side, to know the project that was approved by Council at 1010 Pacific is charging $4,221 a month for 692 square feet. If you had required the 15% minimum requirement, do you think the rent, the rent would be any lower? No, but you would have had 15% affordability there. So government must step in to achieve affordable housing for many of our residents. The state legislatively supports these goals. State law allows for in-lieu fees instead of uh, building the units in the project themselves. In your section 17 today in your ordinance, the council way undercharges developers for their in-lieu fees. I would hope that you would revisit that and uh, do as San Francisco does and the in-lieu fees would be cost of developer more than if they provided the units themselves. I also would encourage um, the city to hire someone to look at the in-lieu fee options as well as research and apply many other state and federal pots of money for affordable housing. Additionally, time is of the essence. The 20% inclusionary is essential to move forward with. There was no minority report from the uh, Planning Commission that persuasively uh, talked about the need for it and how that could be achieved. Authorizing another study kicks the can down the road. If you pay enough money, you can get the results you want. The Karsten study said the project on front would only provide, could only pay for five and a half percent. Well, they got 15 and they can still afford it. Thank I hope you. you'll go ahead with the 20%. Next speaker. 
Yeah, Council Members, Gillian Greenside. Well, obviously this is more complicated than at first sight, and I appreciated the presentation. I remember when um, inclusionary measure O was first introduced, and it seemed to me that every development since that time uh, has not included <coughs> inclusionary units, but an in-lieu fee has been paid, and as the previous speaker said, that is too low to achieve much. Um, I, I don't know where the figure 12,000 comes from, that it seems like an artificial figure. The figures were presented were 168 new, very low units are needed, and we provided 12. 30 low income units are needed, and we provided 88, if I read it correctly. So the need is for the very low. I would strongly suggest that you raise it to 20%, and uh, that you do, not a feasibility study to look at the market, because that is a changing um, variable, but that you look into the, take the time, there's already been 18 months review on this, that you take the time to look at in detail at what other communities have done, including Watsonville, and see where their successes are and how many units they have been able to provide over the years compared to us, and that that's where the research and effort be made. Um, and I would add to that that uh, it's all very well to say that developers can't afford to build if we require 20 per cent, but the books should be open. I'd like to see the profit margins, and maybe that's just not public information, but without that, we have no idea whether the, the, um, um, the profits that are being made are way high and they could afford to lower the profits rather than just raise the cost of housing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. Um, just to speak on that last point, if you want to see a pro forma analysis of projects that factor into your inclusionary study, look no further than the studies that have already been done that looked exactly at pro formas of existing projects and developers moving forward with projects to see exactly what those margins are and where the costs are from. Um, really, today uh, is just a tale between different models of getting towards the inclusionary housing that we're needing. Um, I would point you into the direction of two different cities that have really recent uh, trends in terms in terms of two different directions. One is Portland, uh, which in 2016 increased their inclusionary percentage to 20% um, in certain, uh, certain parts of the city. They saw a net decline in the number of housing units produced, both affordable and market rate. Whereas if you look at somewhere like San Diego, where in 2014 they increased their density bonus, they said, if you do deeper affordable housing at deeper levels, we'll give you more of an incentive to do it. And they've seen a 600% increase in the number of housing they've created of all types, both affordable and market rate. So if you want to look at the tale of two policy approaches empirically in two recent case studies in jurisdictions that, you know, while not perfectly analogous to Santa Cruz, are certainly suffering from the same construction considerations, urbanization uh, considerations, all the things, the main economic trends are still affecting these cities in the very same way they affect our economic market, I would look at those two cities and make the decision for yourself. The evidence is very clear. We've been studying this issue for so long, and we'll, I'm sure we'll continue to do so, but we just made the change less than two years ago. Um, I would say stick with it or reevaluate and look at it with a study, but frankly, I think the, the empirical evidence is quite clear. <clears throat> look at the two different cities, look at the two different approaches, see which yields the results you want more of. If you wanna see an increase in the production of housing of all types, including deeply affordable housing, I would say San Diego is probably a better case forward. Thank you. I wanna take a moment to talk about people that are kind of stuck in the middle right now. Uh, we have friends that, one of them is a school counselor in Live Oak, uh, and the other one is a muralist who, who had to become a program manager uh, so that they could, become, they could afford their current rent. They're trapped in the middle. I mean, they're basically right around the median income for their family of four, right? They're, they're never gonna get on the lottery for low income, and they're never gonna make enough to, to get past the, the current trap that they're in. Um, I, I speak for them because if we, if we don't increase the housing that's available, and especially for the <coughs> place that they live in right now, if it, it, it's got problems. And if, if for a certain reason they've reported on it and it got red tagged, they'd be homeless. And I don't want that to happen. So in general, I wanna see more housing, please. Thank you.
Hi, I don't have a prepared statement, but I've gone to a lot of hearings and I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, um, first of all, my name is Candace Brown from East Morrissey. Um, Portland is a study, an interesting study, but there were a lot of factors that affected the downward trend. So I think that, you know, when you look at that, you need to sort of be, look at it with a little bit of skepticism about what was just said. Um, <coughs> there's one consideration that's not really been brought forward, which is when you reduce the amount of inclusionary housing or keep it the same, you're also bringing in so much market rate housing that you're increasing the average AMI. And I've seen that trend in the last five years, which I think is a really serious problem because basically people will never be able to grab the golden ring because that number is constantly moving forward because you're saturating the market with market rate housing. You're also taking a city that it's built out essentially, and then you're taking the best parcels for instance, at Laurel Street, that really should have been student housing, and that's luxury condos. And it was just at the DWC, which it was said by a public official, that 10% of our homes are vacation homes in this county, um, and that 90% of the homes that are being bought right now are from over the hill, and half of them are second homers. So who are we trying to serve here by market rate? We really need to focus on affordability, there's a lot of projects that will be coming in with preliminary applications, and once they lock in, we cannot change it. And these are huge, huge projects. And so I would recommend sticking with the 20% because you can always go back and modify it. Watsonville is really a good example. They've done the studies. I'm a little bit surprised that that wasn't presented here today because that is a great example of what can be done, and they are building you know, 20, 25% affordable housing in some of these projects in Watsonville right now. And of course in San Francisco, it's 25%. So I think there's some adjustments and amendments, but I think right now we need to stick with 20%. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other comment, we'll go ahead and return back for council action on this item. Um, I, I can't make a motion, but I will just sort of um, put out my perspective. I agree with the recommendations. I think it's critical that we have to have data to substantiate any type of policy decision as it relates to the percentage of inclusionary. Um, for me, that is looking at an outside um, consultant to help us get that information and to have that information to have an informed policy decision. So that would be sort of my two cents on that piece. I would also like to see, and we can see where the council goes with this, is some language in reference to what um, Superintendent Chris Monroe brought up with how we're gonna be uh, mindful of our ordinance language as it relates to workforce housing projects, whether that be in the form of the waiver or if it meets the needs by having that range, but definitely wanna work <coughs> to support um, that project as best we can, given obviously the, the concerns that she rose, but, um, and then also in the future, how we're thinking about our, our policy applying to to future workforce projects. Um, so that said, we'll go ahead and see where the council is. Council Member Brown, then Council Member Matthews. Yeah, so, and I um, I am prepared to make a motion. I wanna make a couple of comments. I sent it to you. Um, Bonnie can put it up for us in a moment, but I just wanna make a couple of comments um, with respect to the uh, staff presentation, some of the comments we've heard, and, and kind of the, the general um, direction of the, you know, our deliberations and, and just say, you know, I, I totally understand the concerns. I think that they're legitimate. I, I mean, I understand the concerns of developers. My goal here is not to suggest that we want to do this to shut down housing production in any way. Um, but I do believe we need to <coughs> do something now. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about this for a very long time, and, and our re more recent actions have been to reduce the number of affordable units required uh, for from developers. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments about the things that I think we know. I mean, we know the private market is not going, is not helping us meet our arena goals by any means. Um, we know that developers will tell us that it's not feasible to do anything more than what's required. That is standard. That is an, a no judgment there. That is just the way um, things go. Um, we know that increasing supply is not going to reduce <coughs> the cost of housing in this community in the current, under current circumstances. That, it's just not, it hasn't happened. Evidence shows that is not happening. It has not happened. Um, 
And while I don't believe it's developers or the private market's responsibility to uh, take care of all of our affordable housing <coughs> problems, uh, challenges, I think it's reasonable to ask them to do a, you know, a, a fair percentage, given the, um, you know, the increasing landmark, the increase in land markets and the increase in rents and uh, sales prices um, that we have seen. This is really urgent. I want to see more affordable housing get built in our city. I in no way um, want to tr preclude that, to prevent that. And I know we have a difference of opinion here about whether or not that will be the end result. At this moment, I feel that we need to, we need to take a step forward and try. And um, because what we have been doing has not worked uh, to achieve that goal, and so I'm with that, I want to make a motion. I'm, I'm not um, insensitive to the concerns and the need for some flexibility potentially to make this work. Um, but I think that's something that needs to happen once we have said, this is our baseline, this is what we want to see happen. Um, and it's our job as um, public servants to work in the, in the public interest, in the community's interest, not in developers' interests. It just is. And um, as one former mayor uh, said the other day, recently to me, um, and also to some uh, a member of our staff who works in housing, um, in line for uh, for a meal, it's our job to push the private private market actors to do better. And I think that to have those conversations and negotiate about how to make it effective um, can be done. But I think that that needs to. It's not going to happen if we don't require that it happen. Developers are not going to come to us and say, hey, we'd like to get to uh, in, increase, you know, to 20% affordability, and here's how we, we're going to try to make it work. They're not going to come wholesale and do that. So if we set the standard and we say, this is what we want you to do, now work with us to figure out how to do it, I think that's the way to go. And so um, I'm going to make a motion. And it is up um, for you all to see. Those in the audience can also see it. Um, I, uh, I'd like to do this actually in two motions. I have a feeling that, that somebody will ask to separate them. Um, so um, I'm going to make a motion to adopt the ordinance revisions contained in attachment two that increase the inclusionary housing requirements to 20% for rental and ownership units and return for a second reading at our next meeting on January 14th. Second again. Can I just I had Councilmember Crone as the seconder. The language would actually be to introduce the ordinance, introduce. not to Oh, adopt. sorry, to introduce mm -hmm. first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Apologies. So that's the motion on the floor that was made by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Crone, and then Councilmember Matthews. Did you have your hand oh. up? To speak, I was prepared to make a different staff way. recommendation. Okay. Um, and uh, your motions uh, do not cover the waterfront of what's they do not. here. No. So some of these others um, will be possible. Um, so yours is really um, in place of the staff recommendation of number four. Yours is to just proceed directly with the increased inclusionary percentage. Um, uh, I feel strongly about um, not wanting to uh, rush into that before doing an updated um, uh, s uh, study that would include the um, ownership units as well. And I do have a question for staff. Um, uh, I'm very sensitive to the kinds of figures you showed there that it's not just the percent of designated affordable, but where on the affordability range they fall and how much flexibility is built in. Do you see that as coming back as part of the study that we would do? So <clears throat> the market study, whatever you're saying, is how do we get more <laughs> bang for our buck in terms of not just the percentage but also the flexibility? And it gets to the uh, workforce housing issue, among others. Yes, I, I see coming back with sort of a range of, of, range of options mm -hmm. that would include different affordability, different area median income levels. Well, I, I see this is kind of a blunt instrument, frankly, and I'd much rather take a little bit of time to do that updated and expanded study that includes the flexibility of ranges as well. And if I could just ask one more question, how, how long do you anticipate that kind of study might take? 
Um, I, th I think it could be done in a couple of months. There is a question um, which was we discussed briefly at, at a previous council meeting of whether or not council wanted to select, if we did go that route, the actual consultant. Um, so if there was a panel or a subcommittee that was involved in, in choosing the consultant, we'd have to work that into the schedule as well. But I think the actual study could be done within two months. Um, well, those are, those are my feelings. Um, I, and you're correct, I would want to <laughs> separate those motions. Um, uh, I would uh, propose a, a, a substitute motion then to, um, which would be number four of the staff's recommendation, consider an increase in the inclusionary percentage citywide for all housing developments, rental and ownership after consideration of a feasibility analysis prepared by a qualified consultant to evaluate the impacts of such changes. So you're putting that. I would like to propose that as a substitute motion. Okay, I'll go ahead and second the substitute motion. We can now at this time um, take the vote to adopt the substitute motion, which would then replace the Whether motion. Whether to accept the substitute or motion. Accept the substitute. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think for the reasons that uh, Councilmember Matthews brought up, for the interest of, I feel there's a lot riding on this, and if we don't have data to inform it and sort of just go by what we know we all sort of really want and aspire to, but don't necessarily have the outside kind of information to help us make an informed policy decision, it's it's absent that for me, and I don't feel comfortable, and I think that it's, um, it's our responsibility to have that kind of information between before making this type of decision personally. So I uh, definitely support moving forward with a feasibility analysis so that we can better understand how to either get there or just the considerations um, we should take into, con to, into play before we make this type of decision. So that said, we can go ahead and take the vote if we want on the substitute motion. Just very briefly, I just wanted to point out that uh, I believe that by, uh, going ahead and moving forward with this, it would impact the school's project. Uh, I think we as should, far we, as maybe the we timing can, is concerned. I just wanna make sure that, 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 that that's clear. Okay. We'll make that in subsequent, yeah. Okay, thank you, I'm glad that, that was specified, yeah. Okay, so all those in favor of adopting the substitute motion presented by Councilor Matthews, seconded by myself. Accepting. I'm sorry, accepting, <laughs> I'm looking, okay. Accepting, um, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. Okay, so that fails with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone, and Glover voting against. Councilmember Matthews, myself, and Myers voting for. So we'll go back to the original motion, which is to have the 20%, also these additional considerations and potentially have some language that we can modify to accommodate the workforce housing projects. Well, is that correct? Well, so uh, these are two separate motions. I, want, I, I intentionally wanted to introduce them separately because I imagine to see. that Okay, and then they're also not included in so, some of the other. Yeah, and I'll amend, I can I can make a question item for the second motion when we're ready. We get there, okay. Okay, Council Member Myers and Vice Mayor Cummings. Just have a question, I guess, for staff. Um, how are we doing on meeting our 15% as projects are coming in as proposed uh, in terms of development projects that are currently sort of spinning up right now. Do we have a sense of that at all? So projects are required to meet the ordinance as it is in place based on certain timing. Um, if there's a tentative map involved, it's when that is <coughs> complete. As of January 1st, um, it'll be whenever there's a complete preliminary review application in place. And so depending on which rules apply, all projects are, are complying with the applicable rules. And there are different ways to do that. We've seen land dedication, as was the case with the Pacific Front Laurel project project and we've seen um, incorporation of units into the project um, along with um, utilization of the density bonus as we saw with 190 Westcliff, for example. So there are a variety of ways in which um, projects can achieve that, but the rules that are in place they have to meet them somehow, whether that's um, through the provision of units on site or through one of the alternative means that's specified in the ordinance. Okay. So and um, Well, I guess I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, so one of the things I, I agree with, <clears throat> with a number of my colleagues in this, in the idea that, you know, 
having another study and gathering data, understanding, you know, what other kinds of models we might be able to use. And I also very much have been interested in potentially even creating a subcommittee around um, looking at housing, affordable housing incentives. I've already had some preliminary conversations with Councilmember Brown about creating that, that subcommittee for next year and really focusing on that um, as, a, as I move forward as becoming mayor. The one issue <clears throat> that I have, which is why I voted against this, was because um, I think that Councilmember Brown brings up a good point. And um, one of the things that I think that we should do is, while we're working on these things, you know, if we put, put this 20% in place, we can see how well our community is able to respond and how developers are able to respond to working on this. And we can really try to work on what kind of incentives can actually help us get to this 20%. And additionally, as we kind of, if we're gonna move forward with gathering more information to understand how we can change our, our ordinance and our affordable housing programs around, at least we'll have this in place such that um, we don't see, for example, um, a lot of developments come out where they're just meeting the 15% and then it turns out months later we figure out a way where they could have reached the 20, but given that those areas are now developed, we won't have that opportunity to have that increased affordability in those projects. So um, I'm very much interested in, in you know moving the 20% now, but I, if there's any um, interest in either putting in language that creates a subcommittee now to come back in, in January, or, um, and, and in that subcommittee we can actually discuss you know, um, whether we want to um, have a feasibility analysis, I think that that's a good place for us to expand on those discussions, so. I, again, I'm, I'm very interested in pursuing that. I think for the purposes of um, allowing council members to vote um, on all of them in ways that they would like, rather than putting t putting that together with this uh, motion number one, that we just move through that, but I'm absolutely, we can make a motion about the establishment of a subcommittee or um, include it. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I guess I just, um, I, I, I guess I just will state, I'm, I'm not gonna, I won't be able to support the motion, the first motion. Um, I do think that our market is changing. Um, I think there's some good models out there. I think those need to be explored. Um, I think the one assumption that I'm hearing is that private developers will somehow get there. Um, and I think it's important to note that because you own something doesn't mean that you're ever gonna change it. So we can hope that someone holding a piece of land or an older building in town um, is going to want to jump into the development market, um, which is uh, right now really um, a really volatile place with regards to um, how much things cost to build, um, the escalating price of um, materials, the lack of labor. Um, it's a very pre unpredictable place. And so if you're holding a piece of property in Santa Cruz right now, um, and you have a sort of vacillating policy framework that you're trying to understand as well, as well as looking at your loans, your actual construction loan that you'll have to get, um, possibly um, paying for you know people who are using the, the building to move, um, it's a volatile, market and so um, because we've lost the ability, we don't have a redevelopment agency anymore, we don't have that tool in our toolbox. And so much of our affordable housing was built by our redevelopment agency. Um, and so I, I, I'm not supporting the motion, not because I, I'm not in favor of trying to get as much affordable housing as we can, I just am not I'm not assured that this is going to be a good tool in this period of time that we're in. Um, if I held property right now, I'd probably sit and wait and kind of see what's gonna happen. We don't know if there's a recession coming. We don't know what's gonna go on with materials. Uh, I don't think this kind of approach is going to um, render the kind of response that we're hoping to get. Um, and I appreciate my colleagues absolutely, and, and uh, I don't disagree with your intent to get as much affordable housing as we can, but I think we have a lack of information. 
And I think right now we just have a really volatile situation with people who may be holding properties and uh, not really willing to kind of maybe try this out uh, and see if it pencils out. So I won't be supporting the motion, but I did just want to make those statements. Thanks. I have a brief question and then maybe um, if if the if we had an aspiration to get to the 20%, could we direct a study to make those policy recommendations on how we could get there? Yes, and, and that would be our recommendation if, if you are going to approve that today because we I do believe if we can build in some more flexibility, we have a way of actually making it feasible um, but still meeting the, the, the city council and the community goals. So that would be our, our recommendation. You know, when I showed a few of those slides comparing to the other jurisdictions, right. they all have considerable more flexibility than Santa Cruz. If we raised it to 20% without doing some other adjustment, we'll have the strictest policy in the area and I think as a result, um, it, it really may impact development here locally as people wait to see what we do. Okay. Well, that makes sense to me. Okay. Councilmember Matthews and Councilmember Brown. So uh, a follow-up to that and also to the school district's concerns. If, as anticipated, uh, motion number one passes, uh, I guess I should ask um, Councilmember Brown, what's your proposal to deal with the school district's concerns? multiple motions on the floor, we keep doing that. And no, no, I, I'm just years. asking because I am yeah. very concerned that I know they've been spending three years on that and it's it's an absolutely critical concern and um, part of our inflexibility is one of the reasons that it's so hard to, to actually get the kind of returns that we want. Um, so your anticipation is that that concern would be solved in a second. And then that. relative to the mayor's question, is your thought that the first motion should have something about the, um, well, I guess the first motion is just the ordinance revisions as contained right in front of us. And then the um, desire for greater flexibility is included in the intent of the second motion. Is that what you're? No, my suggestion is or that tell if- Tell me what your suggestion is. Well, my <laughs> suggestion would be essentially the recommendation, but to say in the feasibility analysis to have the consultant aspire to get us to that 20%, but also identify the levers we would need to pull or the flexibility and ranges we would need to have to make sure that that's possible in a, at a more I, I, feasible type of model. Mm -hmm. That would be my suggestion. Absent that, right. I, I, okay. I don't know. Okay. Councilman Brown. Just on, on that, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna support any more um, studies. I think that the second part of the motion says it sends it to the planning commission and then I'll, I'll wait to see what they come back with. But I think um, throwing uh, after another study, no. I guess I have a question about that because didn't this already go to the planning commission? The planning commission may, made a recommendation for us to do a study. So the planning commission saw this and made the re recommendation that we have a study, correct? Okay. That's correct. Okay. Um, Again, I just want to emphasize that the timing the timing of the school project, if you adopt this recommendation number one, may impact that project. I, I know that there's an intent to, with the second, uh, to to cover that, but again, the timing may not work, so you might want to uh, just, because as I understand, they want to get the project started within the next six months. So unless you amended <coughs> somehow, so I just want you to understand that their timing is they want to move on this really quickly and it might happen. So if I hear you, you're saying if we as a council adopt this without any amended language that it would impact the project. So yes, Councilor as I understand, they wouldn't be able to move forward with the project. Okay, yeah. Councilmember Brown indicated that she had some amended language. Do you want to go ahead and suggest that? I'm not amending the first motion. Um, that is not my intention. Um, I, I hope we can just move through this one so we can get to a second motion. I can, I'll remind my colleagues that this is a motion to introduce the ordinance for a first reading today. It was included in our packet with that language attachment to. That will go to a second reading on January 14th and then will, I imagine, require 30 days for to go into effect. So we do have some time in the interim to have more of that conversation. And I think that with 
there may be some additional incentive with, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of blunt instruments myself, but in this situation, I feel we are, it is so urgent and so dire that perhaps a blunt instrument will uh, lead to some uh, more robust discussion among stakeholders in the community about how to make this work. And if, and if, if we can move to motion number two, um, maybe we can kind of include some language to direct that process to include a discussion about the schools. Um, sit, I'm not gonna say project, but situation. So I'd, I'd like to just move forward with that. Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I uh, would tend to agree with Councilmember Brown on many points. Um, also, there's that classic saying that perfection is the enemy of progress. So, um, I'm going to make a motion to call the question. Second. Okay, there's a motion to call the question. Councilmember um, Glover, seconded by Councilmember Brown. All those in favor to call the question, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Glover voting in support, Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. That ceases all conversation on this topic. So we'll go ahead and take the vote on the motion before us. Um, and that is to essentially have a first reading of this ordinance. Uh, and and then we'll separate this second one out. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 So that passes with Councilmember Brown, <coughs> Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone, and Councilmember Glover voting in support, Myers, Matthews, and myself voting against. So this will be the first reading for the 20% inclusionary. Do we wanna go to the su subsequent areas? My understanding before we do that is one through three um, is part, part of the recommendation as well that we'll need to take action on. Is there any um, hesitation or uh, changes to those at this point? Those, those seem to me as uh, pretty straightforward and I'd like to just move all three of those. Okay, I'll second those. Oh. It, it, just to clarify, so number one on the recommendation handout in front of you was actually included in the attachment two of the second ordinance option as well. So it's really only two and three that you need okay. to address. Okay. So there's a motion by Councilmember Matthews for two and three, seconded by myself. Any further discussion on those? I thought we were gonna take up the second We'll do that part after, if that's her. after. So we're just covering the recommendation areas. I do have a question. On two and three? On two and three, on okay. three. Okay, do you wanna, do you wanna say that now? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with taking no further action on those proposed amendments, but I'm not sure uh, that I'm prepared to recommend that we take no further action um, if that means that all just future discussion will be curtailed about those. Talking about Amendments. Number three. Number three. Sorry. Talking about number well, I think three. it's just for for today. That's the. So that's if we're not going to take action, we, do we need to, by motion, not take action? I guess this is my question. I guess uh, I'm just sorry. I was clarifying the, the previous motion. So can you? So number so t items two and three um, on the recommendation that you provided that can go up there is with that we direct staff to review and bring any cleanup amendments and then also recommend that council take no further action. So do we need to we move do, to take no further action? We do on the, uh, cause those are on the remaining action that we agreed to in the settlement, which was to bring forward to you to take an action on those red line uh, proposed changes to the ordinance. So you do need to take an action on that. Um, because that was part of our agreement in the settlement agreement. And then the other one, um, depending on your action today, we'll, we'll go through it and identify any inconsistencies. So we'll come back to you at a future time anyway. Okay. But it would be great to have direction that you support that. Okay. So given that information, are we clear on two and three? Or do we need well, further discussion I'm on three? I'm just going to ask about if the maker of, or have we made this um, Matt, Councilmember Matthews. Yes. Um, it, can we just take the take no action? Can we take out further? Because it just, to me, um, suggests that we, as a council, are saying that no further action will be taken on those um, proposals. I don't really want to foreclose the possibility of that happening in the future, if there is discussion, for example, in the process. And I'm hoping we us to engage in. Is that word particularly? I think if the language were take no action, I think that's fine. I think it's it, it's at, at this time. I mean, I think there may be other changes at a later point, um, but at least we could put this particular set to rest now would be would be the recommendation. Okay. 
So that seems um, that, that the maker of the motion as the seconder, I agree, we can go ahead and cut out delete further. The word further. Yeah, delete further. Okay. Okay, no problem. Any further discussion on items? I, I'm, I'm not going to support that just because I, I think that I do support some of those. And so if we're not going to, you know, c continue to explore those, um, is that, that your sense that they're going to continue to explore it or they're not going to continue to explore those five redlined? Um, well, I'm hoping to get to the second motion that I intended and, you know, that, that could be a <coughs> space where there's potential for it to be discussed in what we will hopefully become a process of engagement on this issue. Okay. Thank okay. Okay. So are you, uh, we'll go ahead and then take the vote on two and three. We've struck in the word further from three. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. So that passes with council member Crone voting against. So then we'll go back to the second uh, recommendation that council member Brown brought forward and they're going to be different. Well, I'm hoping it won't be too different. Um, but it will be different. Do you want to restate the motion or the, the next version of the motion at this time? Okay, so um, I'll make a motion to refer the revised inclusionary housing ordinance to the planning commission and direct the planning commission and staff to work with community stakeholders to consider options for making the ordinance more effective, including one, provisions to streamline its operation and to increase incentives for developers to meet the requirements. Two, uh, discussion regarding <coughs> uh, possible exceptions or Workforce housing projects. Sorry, I'm, I have to write it to be clear. Um, workforce housing projects intended the needs, uh, the housing needs. I don't want to necessarily make it exclusive to teachers, um, intended needs of, of the local workforce. Second. Okay, so there's a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Do you wanna say more? I was gonna add the um, establishment of uh, an affordable housing subcommittee uh, to be uh, initiated in January 2020 by the mayor. Second, second. Add that. Motion, I'll just if unless you guys want it separated, I, we can let's go ahead. As a separate, okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll go ahead we'll and separate that. that. So we'll do that as a separate okay. motion. But that we'll have that as a documented motion that's been seconded by Councilmember Glover. I um I have a question before we move forward because I have concerns in regards to the timeline. And if we're referring it back to the planning commission in the second reading and we don't have any exceptions in place and we're in a window of time that it appears that our um, local school district is really trying to apply affordable housing project for teachers. I, I guess I just have a question maybe for you, Kristen, if, if you wanna come forward or if you, if you feel comfortable answering. And um, I appreciate the council allowing me to do this. I think it's a lot riding on this to not have this question answered. If we move forward in this direction and given sort of the six month window our city manager brought up and sort of the window of time that isn't necessarily clear in terms of us having something in place for you, do you feel you can bring your project forward? Or do I, you? I think it could potentially delay, delay us time. getting something going. And I, I am really concerned at 20% inclusionary that we're not gonna be, it's not gonna serve our, our um, employees. And we do want to provide below market rents to, we're looking at 10% of our, our um, employees with this project. So um, I think it's, it would serve our community well. And um, I'm hoping that there can be some look at this ordinance. I know we, we have tremendous need for affordable housing in our community and we also need workforce housing, so. Okay, so if anything, if what, what I'm hearing is just a delay potentially. If and I'd rather not see it delayed because we, if we go to, as soon as we have to make this pencil out so it doesn't take any money from kids. And the way that this project doesn't take money from kids is 
we get it designed and built quickly so that we get rental revenue to pay the, the loan that we're gonna take to make this work. So I'm hoping that it won't be a long drawn out process. Okay, no, I appreciate that. And I, um, I don't know what we could have in place, but I would love to have that fixed before um, today or however it seems um, counterproductive and counterintuitive to not have something in place that would further delay teacher housing. I was just gonna point out that a carve out for workforce housing wasn't examined by the planning commission to my knowledge. And so it, if that's the direction of the council, you would have to refer it back to the planning commission before any anyway. action could be taken anyways. Okay. Right. So you could move forward um, as proposed, um, but if the council were to add language to the 20% inclusionary that exempts workforce housing, you'd have to refer that back to the Planning Commission for a comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. I think that kind of answered my question because uh, my question was how do you legally make this kind of exception uh, for this particular project? Um, this is a huge obstacle to my mind and we will have a second reading and we'll see if we go forward with it <clears throat> where the chips fall there. Um, another question I had was if we have our second reading in January, it was pointed out the 30 days before it goes into effect, um, we could delay the implementation date of an ordinance. I believe that's possible to give direction to do that. Um, uh, I guess my question to the school district is how close are you to completion? Um, and, you know, would a few months um, delay of the implementation be helpful? Or is it still not quite cooked to that? Well, we are, we have a contract that's coming to our board next week mm -hmm. to hire bridging architects to do the design. Our hope is to okay. take it out to bid with for a contractor in the spring mm -hmm. by March. That's mm -hmm. our goal. Okay. Our employees want us to make this happen as soon as possible. It's helpful to have a sense of what your timeline is. That's our hope. <laughs> and, and the other reason I asked that is we just did a first reading on something that the inclusionary requirements um, for a project uh, are those that are in place when I think it's a project is deemed complete. Is that correct? But they are not yet. That's correct. They are not. They are not deemed complete, and the the state law specifies. Um, that even if a preliminary that if a preliminary review application is deemed complete, it's actually silent on the um, the complete application of a formal submittal. However, there's some provisions that uh, state it needs to be interpreted in a manner that um, is as um, supportive of the production of housing as possible. So we would apply that to a uh, formal application being deemed complete for a preliminary review being deemed complete. Those that would fix the regulations in place as of that time. Do you see this as a path to letting the school district's project move forward? Certainly if they, if they have a complete application, anyone who has a complete application um, in place um, in advance of the effective date of this ordinance. So it wouldn't just be the school district, it I would be, that, yeah. yeah. Um, but it sounds like uh, the uh, proposal to sign a contract with bridge housing and then go out to bid. I mean, that it's not, their project is not to the point of reaching that threshold. I, I guess I, I have a question if I may. I, we, I'm interested in making an amendment to the motion or a friendly <laughs> amendment, hopefully to the motion that would have direction that this be heard before planning commission for a carve out <laughs> so that we could have that in place as, quickly as possible. Is there another path to be able to accommodate workforce housing given the new direction around the 20%? So the fastest way, I mean, I, I would say there could be a carve out that generically states something along the lines of a project applicant may present alternative means to provide an equivalent or greater number of affordable housing units. Um, although we already have a provision related to that 
in the code. Um, I'd have to reference that, but certainly uh, we could evaluate whether or not that may um, work for um, this um, uh, particular project because it may say equivalent levels of um, affordability. And what I'm hearing from the school district is they're looking at doing a higher percentage, but um, uh, also higher levels of affordability. So 100% of area median income or 120% of area median income and not focused on just the 80% of area median income. So we could look at the provision, the, the exception that's already included in the ordinance, see if that could um, work. If not, the fastest way would to come up with some, would be just propose some generic language that says alternative workforce housing, um, affordability proposals can be presented to the council for their review and consideration and leave it up to the council as to whether or not that uh, percentage that they're providing is, is adequate. Okay, I'd like to make that a friendly amendment in terms of the language that you suggested. If it doesn't necessarily fall within existing exemption language around affordability, flexibility, that we add a provision as soon as possible to allow workforce housing projects um, to be brought forward to, I guess if I'm hearing you correctly, it would come to the council for consideration for waiving requirements, correct? Right, we would run it through the planning commission. And and have to the the plan. is, that, is that accepted by the maker of the motion? Uh, um, yes. I, okay. I have a, just a, a yeah. point on that. Before you move on, that it was my motion. Motion that we were can you restate that? Sure. So, I mean, you can you can correct me if, if I'm if I'm wrong, but essentially, if they are unable to identify area within the existing ordinance language to have flexibility around um, the affordability components and a waiver or sort of essentially an exemption if there is met affordability within the existing ordinance, or ordinance to meet these workforce housing projects, then they would make that work. If they didn't, they would refer to the planning commission, uh, a waiver that would come before the council for consideration for workforce housing. Can you say it simpler than that? I would, could I make just one comment here? Yeah. And it's absolutely related to this. I think if the second item number two here simply says, uh, priority regarding possible flexibility for workforce housing projects. It may be that we already have it and that would also give direction for, I don't like the idea of doing waivers. Or whatever, whatever or however, whatever's gonna get us there. I don't care about this, the You're language to be quite honest with you. Flexibility rather than acceptance. Yes. That's fine. It's an entirely different. Flexibility. And I would just say priority regarding possible flexibility for workforce housing projects. Does that get us to the place that we can meet the immediate needs, do you think, within the language? Yeah, okay, that sounds fine. Thank so, you. No problem, thank so you number for time. Can I just clarify? Yeah. That number, so, and to, uh, as a priority discussion, um, at the discussion regarding uh, possible flexibility for workforce housing projects intended to. Leave out the discussion in the possible, just. Priority regarding. <laughs> priority <laughs> regarding uh, flexibility for. Yeah. Okay. So does the city clerk have that? So now then the friendly amendment is to have under number two, priority regarding exceptions for workhorse. Oh, flexibility. Oh, I'm sorry, regarding possibility. Regarding Do you want to? Your friendly amendment? Or? Oh. It's been edited yeah. by. Well, it's your, it's your, your, yours to accept. And mine to accept, council member Matthews. Okay, so. And I accept. Okay, it's, do we got it? my second accept. Yes. Okay. Thanks All for right. asking. Councilmember Crown. I'm, I'm uncomfortable um, with the notion of workforce housing not being defined. Um, the various levels of affordable housing is actually defined by HUD, you know, and housing and urban development. Um, and I know HUD doesn't define workforce housing, do they? And is there a definition for workforce housing? Well, I think we have a couple of options. And one thing, I, since we're talking specifically about Santa Cruz City Schools, is um, uh, Superintendent Monroe gave me a copy of, of their performer that they're, that they're working on. And we'd actually also discussed previously when we were working on AB 411 of actually setting aside some funding for them. So there is a gap if they were to meet the 80%, uh, the, 20, the 15%. So I'd love to sit down with them. And they have you know their salary schedules for their teachers and to really look at what their needs are as far as their performa. Um, but typically what you do see, um, because there are different definitions um, of workforce 
workforce housing. You know, the moderate definition is typically up to 120% of AMI, but for workforce, you often will see in certain communities, particularly those in high cost of living areas, and we would potentially be one of those, um, that it goes up to 150% of AMI. Again, um, with our existing ordinance, even with that, you still take certain percentages of that. So it's not something that I could say exactly at this point exactly what that would be. We would need to go through our current ordinance and how you calculate that and come back to you with those numbers. But I think having the opportunity to sit down with Santa Cruz City Schools and go through that, um, we can pretty quickly sort of clarify what the needs are for the project. I have a question for Superintendent Monroe. Um, do you, can you say what percentage are you work, are we working with up to 150 percent the AMI? I, I couldn't. I'm sure it is that high. We a lot of our kind of the conversation among our young teachers is how many of them are paying more than 50 percent of their income in rent, and I know that's a reality throughout our community. But in the, I think it was March, USA Today came out with a study. Santa Cruz is the worst place for a young teacher to, to work in the country. It is the least affordable with salaries compared to cost of living. And um, we have to do something. I'm, I'm really happy that you're going forward with this project. I'm, the only concern I have is if we don't put any kind of affordability on it, what, what are the covenants involved in like, okay, the first teacher gets it. What, what, what does the next, like up at UCSC, they have strict um, ways of limiting the sales price and how much, you know, it's not a market rate thing. So if the first teacher gets it, you know. It's rentals. They, and our goal is. are rentals. And there are, our goal is to, to put people, we're working with our bargaining units to determine term, but we're thinking seven to 10 years with the goal of supporting people with below market rate rents so they can save money to work. We're working with another program in the county called Landed that helps t uh, education employees with down payments on homes. So our, this is kind of, it's that other step because we've, we've had, uh, I think, six or seven teachers so far buy homes through Landed. But it's getting to the that they're half of the down payment. They have to come up with half of a down payment to make to to get into the community, and that's that's the part that we want this rental housing to support. Um, a percentage of the housing will go to our teachers, and a percentage of the housing will go to our classified support staff based on our total number of employees. We have about 800 employees. Great, and will the school district be overseeing that rental or do you contract it out to? Um, We're gonna hire someone to manage the, the property for us. But it's totally up to the school board how the rents will be set then too, or it's up to the- We are, we're, we, the rents are gonna be set based on how we can pay for, with, there's, there's formulas set out for workforce housing projects um, where that cover the cost of rent and then the cost of um, management and the cost of maintenance. So we need to make sure that the rents cover that cost. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we're, um, we have the modified uh, language at this time, is, unless there's any further discussion, did you? No, just there's obviously a lot of work to be done yeah. <laughs> between now and January, whatever it is, so that we have, a, I think a comfort level that we're meeting a very real need and opportunity here that people have been putting a lot of effort into and um, that it's not just a one-off. We've got some basic principles that we're clear on. Um, and for me, building in the flexibility um, is kind of a compromise to the, the first action that we took. All right, so unless there's no further discussion, we'll go ahead and take the vote on this motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Councilman Brown, do you wanna make your other motion? Make a, I'd like to make a motion to direct the mayor to establish an affordable housing subcommittee of the city council, or affordable housing committee, subcommittee, committee of the city council uh, in the new year in January, beginning in January, 2020. Work for you. Okay. That was a seconded by Councilmember Glover. Did you have further questions? I just had one question, just a little bit about the housing blueprint and all the work that was done. That was my question. I'm just a little bit. I'm not quite sure. What What will the subcommittee? Because I was. I know, like for example, the inclusionary was one of the projects for the from the I believe from the housing blueprint. So I'm just I'm just trying to get clarification on what the subcommittee would do. 
Is my turn? Oh, well, I mean, do you want to answer that question? I, I do. Well, yeah, if I am called on, I'll answer. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, why don't you answer the question, then we'll have Councilman Matthews. So uh, the intention uh, in our discussion was to, um, as a first order of business, to um, take a look at the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee recommendations and begin to implementation work on an implementation plan for those. So I can include that in the motion if you'd like. I think I think so, just based on some of the um, some of the comments we've received from the public, I think um, you know this topic of affordable housing is something we all say. Um, I think it's it's very hard to understand exactly what that means, and I I think several people have mentioned and other colleagues have mentioned this idea of you know trying to bracket that um, outside of the arena goals possibly. So um, instead of sort of Maybe if we could provide a little bit more framing around the subcommittee's work. I'll make a, I mean, I guess I'll make a friendly amendment to have the first order of the subcommittee do a kind of an implementation approach to the year of housing that count, that mayor chased at the time and then subsequent housing blueprint recommendations established um, for implementation. Is that accepted? Okay. Sure. Okay. Councilor Matthews. This is an alternate thought, um, I want to put out the possibility of um, a working group which could include um, two or three council members, but also we have so much talent in affordable housing in this community, both uh, private and nonprofit housing developers. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm just throwing it out as an idea that has people that are hardwired to understand this stuff rather than Let's face it, <laughs> lay council members <laughs> trying to figure it all out. And, and you know, people in finance, I mean, there are a whole lot of people that are really, really professionally um, capable and uh, experienced in this field. And I think including them in a working group, I throw it out to you guys, uh, might get us a more productive recommendation at the end. Do you want to make that into a friendly amendment or do you? I would prefer that given the hour and the yeah. what we have coming up for the rest of our agenda, I'd prefer that we, re because if we do that in a motion now, then we have to think about who would want it, we'd want to have on the a working group and provide direction about the, you know, the composition of that. I would prefer that we include uh, consideration of the establishment of a broader uh, working group, including community stakeholders um, for the subcommittee to bring a recommendation to the council about that. Because hashing it out now, we're... I agree. Not, we don't have okay. time. Okay, so that's including that consideration. That, that sounds good. Well, yeah, I mean, if we could just include in the motion, including the uh, 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 very real possibility of including community members as part of the endeavor. Well, yeah, okay. Great. It sounds like that's... Uh, and that's kind of, I mean, I said including... Uh, uh, Committee will consider the establishment of a working group to include a broader okay. set of community stakeholders. Close enough. Okay, great. Did you catch that? Okay. For the most part, they're going to include some stakeholder input into their work. <coughs> okay, all those in favor of the subcommittee being established in the new year, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and move on to our next item, which is the introduction of the child care impact fee ordinance um, and the um, impact that could have. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> hope you don't mind if I'm up here not presenting. Not. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Sarah DeLeon, Principal Management Analyst uh, for Planning and Community Development. I'd like to stand here so I can see all of you. Um, so this is my first formal presentation to you guys. You guys might be familiar with me through the budget process. Um, I was excited to do this particular topic just because of the lots of different aspects I got to consider and different folks I was able to speak with. So it was quite a quite fun. Uh, oops, let me make sure this is. 
Do I use the clicker, Bonnie? Sorry. Okay, apologize. We're down. Sorry. While she's working on the technical dif difficulties there, um, I'll mention that this was an item that the council um, provided direction on in August to come back uh, within the next four months. It also stemmed from Housing Blueprint Subcommittee work, um, which was to establish a um, child care impact fee. And um, then it also stems, uh, that direction stems from the general plan, their actions in the general plan. So there are a series of uh, policy frameworks that uh, and council direction that got us to here today. Exactly. Thank yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. So um, a part of my presentation is I really wanted to explain the journey and path as to why the recommendation is what it is. Um, the first part of that recommendation actually in introduces the ordinance to, imp to get the child care impact fee. Um, the second part of the recommendation where you guys are basically being asked to um, delay the actually implementing resolution, which I identify the fee rates, as well as the fee management to the meeting where we'll introduce the public safety impact fee, another fee that you guys have been discussing through the action labs. Um, I'd like to provide the next few slides to kind of give some reasoning and background as to why that delay is important um, today. So. So first, an overview. I know some of you are probably really familiar with impact fees, especially the subcommittee that dealt with Action Labs. Um, Tiffany Wise West actually presented on the public safety impact fee and probably went over many of these points. But I think for the public and the general journey I took through this process, it's important to reiterate. Um, impact fees are, are fees on new development, essentially. Um, they are not meant to meet our existing deficiencies. They are to serve the new population for new or expanded facilities. And as I just learned, to maintain existing facilities. Um, they're not a new fee. Since Prop 13 and Prop 218, jurisdictions have really required to diversify their revenue sources with those changes. And as part of that change and moving towards impact fees, a lot of lawsuits, to be honest, came from that transition, which gave to light our Mitigation Fee Act, which basically outlines all of this stuff as to where these fees, how they can be used, how they have to be implemented, the nexus studies required, as well as the accountability for jurisdictions, which includes five-year annual reports, where we describe the nexus and relationship of those impact fees, um, and annual reports as well. So, <clears throat> So our main issue today is, like I said, we cannot address our existing deficiencies. Um, however, with population growth, we could potentially have that gap growing. So the South County of Santa Cruz has actually identified a 30% shortfall of childcare spaces. Um, and if we don't do anything today, essentially that gap for new population will continue to, to widen. Um, that brings us to some of the goals and actions required as of our general plan that Lee has mentioned as well. Um, our general plan for the city actually identifies child care as a community concern, not one that's private, as you may have read in the staff report. We have an entire goal dedicated to accessible, high quality child care services and facilities. Um, we even mentioned specifically that one of our goals is to implement uh, the child care impact fee as part of supporting the regional, state, and federal efforts for funding those services. Um, our city general plan, as well as the needs assessment that I attached, provides other information as to the benefits of early child care education, economic education, reduced public costs. Um, if you had a chance to read the assessment, any part of it, then I just wanted to kind of pull out those important pieces. Um, so I did a lot of coordination with the county I spoke with, I hope I don't get her name wrong, Emily Bailey, I want to see, B-A-L-L-I. Um, and they did a lot of work. They've had a child care impact fee since 1991. They recently completed a nexus study to update that fee and its rates. Um, I really appreciate what the county's done with this study. They actually intended the study to be, to be used by incorporated areas within uh, the county itself. Really great and forth, forethought for that. I think it really identifies their point that, you know, child care needs are are not stopped at our jurisdictional boundaries. Sometimes county residents are working in our city and dropping off their kids there and vice versa. Um, so I think that was really their intent of, of putting that line in their nexus study for other cities to adopt it and become part of the solution overall. Um, their study basically analyzed the demand, 
on non-residential and re residential development spaces for childcare. Um, I did take a look into their methodology, and this is one of the biggest points as to why the delay. In the methodology, um, in this Nexus study, the data that was used was actually specific to the unincorporated area. And because of the law related to this fee and just general due diligence, it's important that we're accurate in the data we used. Um, so I did a quick calculation based on what they're doing with our incorporated data. And our percent um, of children, is, which is a number they use in their methodology, is actually a bit higher than the counties. So it just, I, I didn't go through the full analysis just yet, but I think it does open the door to the fact that additional analysis needs to be done and our data should probably be used so we really understand what our fee range should be. Um, so that's point number one. If there are no questions to this point, I can go to fee management, okay? Um, I know it's, there's a lot on the screen. This kind of resembles my thought process and all the scattered thoughts with all the options. Um, in your staff report, I gave you alts one through three. Um, basically, alternate one provides the most control for the city, also the most work, all the way to three, utilizing the county as a resource and very limited control with the setup they have now, which we'll go into. Um, the two is really just the middle ground that I'm hoping as I go through this, you can see what it provides and it's number two is also going to be my recommendation. So some of the thoughts I had to go through, you know, what would make us most effective essentially in trying to implement this goal. Um, how could we provide city input? I imagine council would wanna make sure that in some way or form, you guys are providing input as to the applications the county receives. Um, I had a legal question to our attorneys as to whether the county could even complete five year and annual reporting for us. The answer was that they could, the law is broad enough to allow for that, so that's fantastic. Um, I couldn't ignore the, as much you know, as we're in the same county itself, there are, are obviously differences between the city and county. And so that triggered that incorporated data and the methodology, number of bedrooms, all those sorts of differences. Um, and then also thought processes came up as to what our existing impact fees are. Um, so that's what kind of those questions is what triggered the alternatives before you. Um, I wanted to go over the county program. I did not provide the, their procedures in there, so I'll go briefly over that for you. Um, they do have an annual application process for the funds that they collect for their existing child care impact fee. Um, those applications are open to all licensed child care, child care centers to expand or maintain their existing levels of services. Um, they award their funds through low interest deferred loans. They create agreements between the provider to make sure that they are providing services for a set amount of time. And then if they do, they don't have to pay back the loan, which is cool. If they don't, they have to pay it back. Um, they also have some borrower responsibility written up in their procedures um, as to how the county is holding the providers accountable, making sure they have their insurance requirements, their licenses are still um, active and so on. This doesn't at all go into the detail of additional workload they have. They transit, translate their applications from English to Spanish. There's a number of outreach annually and forms that they're reaching out to those providers to complete. But I wanted to at least give you a, a general <coughs> overview of what they're doing. And a general overview to their approval process. So um, Emily Bali is the Deputy Director for Human, the Human Services Division. Um, this information, so first with these applications every year, the Human Services Commission, which is a subcommittee of that commission made up of a, a grouping of these folks bulleted here, is what helps create the application review committee for these child care projects. Um, the application review committee goes through all of those and essentially brings those back to the full Human Services Commission for approval and then essentially straight to their board. So flag went up that I was like, oh well, city would have to be somehow you know, connected in through there. But broadly, this is important, an important slide because as part of the development of these management options, specialized expertise. I do not have children, number one. Um, I do not have a social services degree or background, so really relying on the experts of the county and their connections I thought was important to see this slide right, right here. 
Um, I did have an opportunity to email, Google, I Google search providers within our city jurisdiction. I came up with about 14. Um, that limit, number is limited because it doesn't address family child care homes. We exempt them currently through our business license process. So it would be very difficult for me to, to find those in some way. But this is at least focused on the child care centers within our jurisdiction. And in talking with six of the 14, they all actually had the same response. Um, housing concerns for their employees, keeping people there. Concerns with existing maintenance costs was huge. A lot of them aren't actually intending on expanding because they can't maintain their own facilities as they are today. Um, and even if they were, the you know high cost to find a new facility and just in their existing where they are now, there's just limitations, just no room to grow out. I did um, speak with Barbara Griffin. She's the executive director for Campus Kids Connection and she was so kind to provide pictures of the photos or the photos of an application she submitted, I believe last year, that helped her expand with the child care fees, a portable as well as playground services at Santa Cruz Gardens Elementary. Um, so point being that the process is working with the county. Um, she did mention, you know, additional outreach and maybe some additional time, but that's all things that I think could be worked out. I also spoke, or I didn't, but Lee, and I believe Sarah Fleming had a developer's roundtable meeting where they discussed the child care impact fee. Um, and they had their concerns as well, which you've been hearing about inclusionary and et cetera, so I won't go too far into that. Um, but they had concerns about the sheer number of fees and everything they're doing to the cost of development for them. So in hearing what I have and considering, you know, local data to understand our needs with our demographics and population, Hearing what I have from the developers and hearing what I have from the child care providers, the first piece for the delay of the recommendation is to not continue to create this fee in a silo. Um, the child care impact fee and the public safety impact fee that you guys have or will be discussing hit the same group of people. Um, so I think it's important that we look and provide the time for that nexus study to be done so you guys can adopt those rates together to understand a more comprehensive um, view of what fees we're adopting for de against de the development. Um, on a side note, as an analyst, in trying to figure out what impact fees we have, it was challenging. Um, water impact fees, it was really hard to search. So just from a sheer administrative perspective, and I actually tried to draft the ordinance this way unsuccessfully, but we could try again. Um, an impact fee program that actually lists the fees that we have and our administration and management of those fees I think is important. Um, just one from an understanding of the public to know what impact fees we charge. We're not putting them in separate codes. It's kind of all together. The state law is broad in general, so we can write less ordinances, which would be nice if you just put all the broad stuff in the beginning. Um, so that's another reason for doing them together and comprehensively, just the administration generally and looking at the rates together. Um, for in what, what I heard from the child care providers, this fa facility plan idea came up. One, because I saw it in our general plan. It's an actual action that's called out for developing a facility, a child care facility plan. I think that would do several things to help <laughs> our child care providers and ourselves and planning for the future, um, guiding them to the areas best for expansion. I think the uh, Campus Kids Connection is a great example because they use existing facilities that we have schools across the county and to expand in the facilities there and share. So I think it's a really nice public-private partnership there. I think a facility plan could help us guide that further within our city. Um, and also just better assess our local needs as to where our workers are, number of workers, um, et cetera. So those in totality <coughs> brought me to the recommendation of that alternative two for city county collaboration. Um, I think this, no matter which you decide, I would highly recommend that we do a memorandum of understanding with the county to really situate city council's approval process, um, to provide us some certainty for the procedures that they do annually for their application planning. Um, and before all of that, that we, the first recommendation, if you guys are to adopt that impact to you for childcare, is to first complete a facility plan with those funds. And then once that's complete, join the county with their existing program. After all, they are the experts. At that point, we would have our localized data informing the methodology and the, and the fee rate. And then we'd also have a plan to help guide where those facilities should be. That was it. <laughs> well, I wanna thank you for the presentation. 
I, for one, am just really excited to see this come back to us. This was something that was in the housing blueprint, um, subcommittee recommendations. Um, we heard briefly a little bit about how hard it is for teachers. It's even harder for early childhood uh, providers and facilities is a huge issue and this is one way jurisdictions can play a role and developers really in supporting um, our population and our community as a whole. So this is a really, a really big deal. I also just wanna give you a shout out and appreciation for the health and all policies reference and then the acknowledgement that it fits within this broader general plan. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the work on this. This is uh, really great to have before us at this time. So any questions before we open it up? Yeah. Um, could you go back to the fees page? It was one of the more recent ones, that one. Yeah. Um, this is one of the questions that has come up for me in earlier discussions is what's the totality of the fees? Because we also have park fees. I mean, right. And I'm sure there's more. So Yes, and so I think when we bring back the actual fee recommendations, we can bring some sample projects that show here is everything that this project would be um, required to pay from to the city and also to outside agencies. I mean, the school district, for example, has uh, impact fees that um, we don't collect but are still a requirement of the development. So we can have that comprehensive um, uh, look at here are all the fees for this project, for this type of project and that type of project. And here's what it would be for the proposed child care impact fee as well as the proposed public safety impact fee and the council can weigh those collectively. Well, I, yeah, I think that's just really important. Each of these uh, in and of itself has a very clear rationale, but collectively it is a huge amount of money. So um, yeah, that, that will come back to us. Um, on the facilities, um, plan, is that what you're calling it, facilities plan? My impression, and those more familiar with the field can correct me, um, my impression is that facilities for um, childcare are somewhat opportunistic. Someone has a home, they decide they're gonna do, that's their home. They don't say, oh, I'm gonna buy a home in this area or rent a home in this area because that's where the need is. Is that a correct, um, I would think so, and the, the, the action in the general plan is so broad, and I'll be honest, I don't have the expertise in that facility plan type of area. So when I read that, it sounded more to me as an understanding of where existing expansion could go using our existing public facilities like schools, um, like, um, I'm sorry, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, um, to help guide you know, potential areas where expansion could happen a little easier as opposed to doing it in your home. Um, I personally had some hesitations with private homes until I heard from the county that they do those contracts of services because I was like, well, you, you just renovated someone's house. How do you know they're providing services? And sure enough, that con loan agreement resolved that concern, but I thought similar things. But it's more of a guiding of using existing facilities because the idea here is Impact fees typically help other public facilities. So why don't we you know, compound that help by putting the child care facility in the other existing park public facility, for example, they have their own parks fees so that we're improving even more you know, that, that area. Two birds, one stone, I guess. Well, this will be a future discussion. Potentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, question. I just had a question about the ordinance. Sure. Um, yeah, the fee adjustment section, is that something that um, is is kind of used, used in other jurisdictions? Is that sort of Correct, as well as uh, dictated by state law as well. And um, we have to have certain options for, for, for flexibility, okay. um, so. Great, thank you. And I guess my other question, because um, you're looking for direction tonight on the um, sort of the administrative structure. Yeah, it, I'm really looking for, you don't have to make the decision today. It took me some time in answering further questions to even gather my own thoughts on the recommendation, but I'm very interested in your input and where you wanna go with that. And we can bring that all back together as well if you so decide that that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I appreciate the, the logic to have sort of this mixed kind of um, alternative to mm -hmm. integration because mm -hmm. we do want to leverage systems. We know that we're a small county. There are a number of people in the field. You know, I, I'm sure that we can make it work for our city and for other jurisdictions. And that was my other question when I was looking at the alternatives because it, it does seem like alternative two might be a, a nice 
kind of model or you know thing to pursue. Um, but I noticed that, for example, it looks like the county was had a significant ask last year. I think it was 450 some some odd thousand dollars worth of uh, requests for their loan program. Um, so when we're pooling pooling together the larger population of need, um, you know whether or not we get a sense of how that may impact either the success of um, you know uh, centers here and within our jurisdiction versus. But I but I think just based on some of the the things you've outlined here, uh, it's 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 compelling to look at that partnership also on this really important topic and work with the county who does have um, additional expertise with regards to evaluating these facilities as well as is really documenting the need through their work. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess those, do you see any issues though with, you know, the, the, the amount of pooled resource versus do we get into any issues with the jurisdictional boundaries there or not? I, no, I'm I, assuming most child care centers would, they, they, um, they pretty much house kids, you know, all from all over the county. So if you live in Santa Cruz, but you're in Watsonville for work, right. those centers would be servicing any kind of um, kids from any parts of the county. Well, I think this is where that memorandum of understanding really yeah. comes into play. Right. Um, <clears throat> and at least outlining responsible parties from each jurisdiction. Because while I can stand here and say that we will ensure we were com will communicate, turnover happens and you don't know who's left sometimes. Um, but I have no problem in regards to your capacity question. If they are overwhelmed, it doesn't mean that staff over there won't reach out to us to say, hey, here's your applications for your jurisdiction. Can you help us develop the report? Um, so I don't see a problem with capacity as long as communication is open and responsibilities outlined in that memorandum. Um, additionally, in speaking with the deputy director over there, in regard, they were agreeable and excited about us potentially joining the program for that pooled investment. Um, and they also stated that, I know I noted in there that maybe there'll be administrative costs from them, but um, from talking with Emily, if we can keep it consistent with the reporting they do now, which is they provide the application or you know the report on consent and there's no heavy workload, then she's like, most likely that's a, a mute point. So just FYI. Okay. Great, thank you. Happy to hear. Unless there isn't other questions at this time, we'll go ahead and see if there's any members of the community who want to address us on this item. Would you please? everybody. Um, thank you for your community service. I really appreciate the work you do. Um, my name is Donna Safran. I own Midtown Montessori and it's a small child care center, 25 families. And I'm the recipient, I know the center is the recipient two times from the um, child care community development fee from the county and I am located in the city. So I just wanted to say that they actually sprinkle it around. Um, their reporting is really easy for child care providers. Uh, I am a center based program. I didn't just open my home. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine. <laughs> Can you imagine never going home from work? Um, <clears throat> but I have a beautiful center uh, that serves those families and they commute over the hill. They come, my staff comes from Watsonville, so the original topic that I heard about that I didn't come here for was the affordable housing. And I mean, my staff sit in that traffic every day coming back and forth from Watsonville. So I just wanna give a shout out for affordable housing as well in any way, shape or form. And that I believe that childcare does need, it needs, a little extra. I, it helped me when I was building the center. They gave me a sizable grant. It's a forgivable loan. And they also helped me when my heater was broken. And it's two grand that I couldn't come up with in a second. And they were able to help with that. So, and those are just like really tangible things that um, help on a human level. So, thank you. Okay. Seeing no other members of the committee will go ahead and return for council action on this item. Um, thank you for your work on this. I think this holds a lot of potential and a huge, huge need in our community and um, is a great first step to getting us to helping meet that need. So, um, okay, Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Myers. Um, when this idea was first proposed, it wasn't clear to me where will that money go, <laughs> however much it is. Um, 
because we have heard over the years so much about the uh, need for um, fair salaries for child care workers as well, which is a huge deal. Um, but this, I, as I understand, is aimed strictly at capital improvements for either um, expansion or renovation improvement, et cetera. So I'm very comfortable with that and looked over the list of the uh, recipients um, from the 2019 awards. They're just really practical things that a small, either if it's a nonprofit or a, a home daycare would be, as you say, very hard pressed to just come up with to um, keep the facility um, appealing, safe, and up to date. So um, that to me is a, a nice finite target <laughs> for this kind of a, a program. Um, do I understand that the awards for ours would go to child care facilities in the city? Is that that's fully, fully the intent. I was looking for it, just didn't see it. Okay. Um, well, and then when did you think this would come back early next year with the public safety? I'm so glad you asked. I have a timeline. <laughs> <laughs> so assuming it's okay to pair it up with public safety impact fee, um, we're introducing today. I would like some time to finalize and bring, you know, prepare the MOU for you guys to review as well. Um, I provide, put a little bit about six months in there that would be happening simultaneously as I'm working with the county to develop the MOU. Um, the responsible party and police can be working towards their nexus analysis for the public safety fee. Um, and hopefully with your recess in July, introduction and implementation of you know, each of those in August and the fees effective in October. Great, thank you. With that, I'm happy to um, make a motion for uh, approval of the recommendation. Second. second. Okay. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's not gonna, well, he can second, but he has the only Okay, so that's true. So we'll go ahead and have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings, <laughs> and the recommendation includes alternative two, just for clarification. Okay. Great. Any further discussion? Councilmember uh, Brown. I just want to make a quick comment and say I really appreciate uh, the work that you put into this and the clarity of the presentation was really helpful to see. I also think that um, working with the county, partnering with the county is, is really going to be, uh, make a, this is very effective. Um, as we move forward, I know I've worked with the local child care planning council in the past and others, those other entities really do have the expertise and they have had this program up and running for decades now. So um, I, I think that that is a great way to approach this. I wanted to thank you also. I, I loved your enthusiasm and the sort of just straightforward manner you brought to the presentation. It was um, really well done. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to thank you and also actually just um, thank the county publicly as well for the partnership. I think this is a great example of, um, you know, just local government working together and really solving a really uh, important problem for, for folks who are taking care of our kids. So, um, please express our appreciation to the county as well. And we'll do that too, personally. Thanks. Definitely, I'm, I'll echo that. I know that they created this report in a way that would be inclusive, so to encourage um, other jurisdictions to join in and just recognizing how critical it is that we collaborate. And this, I also appreciated the reference to health and all policies because I think this is what that's about in terms of um, collaboration in regards to having our mutual interests and in, in community well-being met. And although a small, um, a potentially not huge way to influence uh, childcare, it really, the, the costs get carried over generally to the um, to the clients, which is then the families, which then it contributes to the imbalance of affordability in our community. And this, as we're seeing a demographic shift, this is a way for us to offset that um, using a, a very practical tool. And um, and hopefully the developers know that they're contributing something much bigger than, than just a fee. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and maybe take the vote. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously, thank you. Okay, and we have one last item before we conclude this afternoon's agenda, and that's ADUs, and maybe take a two-minute pause, if we could, sure. for a restroom break. Sorry. Looks like Uh, you know, we have uh, Yeah, so it, so it was a parking lot. You don't need to.
anyway, let's just, I want Thank to get you. the heads up on that. Well, we can, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started. We are on the last um, item for our afternoon uh, council meeting agenda. We have an adjournment time at 5.15, so I'll just go ahead and remind the council that we'll be adjourning this afternoon with uh, around 5.15, um, and we'll go ahead and try to get through it all, and we'll kick it right over to our, our staff to start the presentation. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning and Community Development Director, and I've got Sarah Noisy with me, the Senior Planner. She's been reviewing uh, the many state bills that were adopted this year as they relate to accessory dwelling units. And um, we have a series of changes proposed for you this evening or this afternoon that include both an urgency ordinance to um, have our regulations take effect immediately and um, also first readings for two other ordinances, one which would go to the Coastal Commission and one that we can have an effective uh, date without having to proceed through the Coastal Commission. So I'll turn it over to Sarah. Good afternoon. I'll try to keep my presentation to about 15 minutes. Um, this, I, I apologize in advance, there is a lot of minutia included in this, so we're gonna keep it high level. If there's anything that um, council members wanna dive into, we absolutely can make time for that. Um, but I'm gonna start by assuming we're gonna take a high level view of all of this. So just really brief background, the city of Santa Cruz has been a leader in ADUs for decades. We actually had an ordinance that led the state in creating ADUs. Um, and then we just have made a series of updates to our um, local codes uh, that <laughs> went, that were last heard by your council in February of this year that um, removed parking for ADUs, um, created different standards for conversion ADUs, and then allowed um, family members, immediate family members to qualify as an owner occupant for the purposes of our owner, determining owner occupancy in our code. And then we also adopted a whole suite of changes that were required by the state law at the time. So um, the state is very concerned about housing. Um, there were over 100 bills this session introduced related to housing and land use. This is just a um, sort of overview of the ones that existed as of April. Some a subset of these has passed and we are now um, grappling with how to implement. So uh, related to specifically to ADUs, there were three bills that were, um, that were passed. The, based on the way that these bills become laws, the relevant section that we read in order to draft our ordinance was uh, came from AB 881, um, and we worked currently from section 1.5, and section 2.5 comes into effect five years from now, and basically that's just about um, the, remove, the prohibition on owner occupancy standards. Then there are two other sections from the other bills. Um, AB 68 contains the standards that apply now for junior ADUs, and then um, SB 13, contains language that requires jurisdictions to delay the enforcement of um, certain building, of any building code provision under certain circumstances for ADUs. So we're gonna go through this legislation. It's broken down into um, really five sections and then an urgency ordinance. So we're gonna start with development standards. The state law says that um, ADUs attached to single family homes can be limited only by being 50% of the home to which they're attached. We can't also have another maximum size limit other than that. So um, then it also says, the, the bill says later that site standards can't limit an ADU to anything less than 800 square feet. So what we end up with is essentially for attached ADUs, um, they can be 50% of the habitable area of the main home or 800 square feet, whichever is greater. For detached ADUs, we can keep our 10% of the lot size as long as it's 10% of the lot size or 800 square feet, whichever is greater. So this does represent an increase in size that would be allowed on many of our um, single family lots in the city. Um, we're also recommending that we adopt a size standard for conversion ADUs. This matches our existing policy interpretation that we've been allowing. Um, if there's an existing structure that is um, you know, larger than what we would allow a um, new construction ADU typically to be constructed, um, we're all, the only size limit we're placing on that is the maximum allowed under state law, which is um, 1,200 square feet. So we're um, recommending that we codify that at this point. And then um, the lot coverage standard um, for ADUs has to be um, eliminated because it's inconsistent with the language in the state law and it wouldn't allow these um, site standards to apply on the lots where they have to apply. So also in the legislation, um, ADUs can't be limited in height less than 16 feet. We can't require replacement of um, any parking that's removed for an ADU. And um, this is a little bit of a controversial read. 
Um, but they, the, the state law deleted the only reference to two-story structures that was in the state law. Um, and we did get a letter from Assemblymember Ting's office sort of arguing our read of this um, section. And this was a piece that we struggled with a little bit. And you'll see when we get to our hype <coughs> on two-story ADUs, we do have a, I think we have a little bit of, we've taken a little discretion there. We're making an interpretation of the law. Um, so, you know, this is a place where, you know, there could be different opinions and different standards adopted in other jurisdictions. So, um, you know, the change in height limit is not a big deal around here. It went from 15 to 16 feet. Our setbacks remain at three feet for single story structures. Um, there's this piece about, uh, for attached ADUs, we have this piece in several of our code in our um, zone districts where as the building gets taller, we require the setbacks to increase. And, um, that makes sense when you're doing, you know, like a multi-family structure that's like up to three stories tall, and it's um, more challenging when you're talking about a single-family home that's kind of that's built on a multi-family zone parcel to kind of hold it to that standard. It creates some kind of awkward building envelopes. So we're recommending that we delete that in the case of allowing ADUs. Um, we're just adopting the piece about parking, and then when we get to this piece about two-story detached ADUs and the setbacks that we're going to require. Um, we, so, so we struggled with this a little bit. Um, the, we don't get, I, so I sit in advanced planning and I don't review projects and so I don't get complaint calls about projects very often. When I get complaint calls about projects this last year, they have been about two-story ADUs that are five feet from a property line, from a rear property line. Those, like, those are the ones that, that get to me <laughs> where I sit, which is, so um, based on that, based on um, a few conversations that we were able to have with uh, you know, a couple of designers, um, we feel like this is the right place to land where we would say when an ADU is two stories tall and it's facing an alley, we can have this reduced setback four feet, which is you know what the state law allows. Um, for an interior lot, um, if, it's two, if it's two stories tall, that portion that's over 16 feet, um, we really feel that should be set back 10 feet from the rear property line. Based on the correspondence that we received from Assembly Member Tang and rereading the law and kind of you know hearing out their logic argument, um, they're arguing that you could do a two-story ADU in 16 feet. So we're willing to add that to our code that if you do an ADU in, in 16 feet, you can keep it to four-foot side and rear setbacks, um, as would be sort of which is the text of the law that we have to allow a 16-foot structure. In talking with our um, you know building folks, that's hard to do, it would have to be concrete construction, it would have to kind of have a flat roof, so we're not really expecting any of that, but I do think that will allow us to be in compliance with HCD. Yes. A super quick question. Yeah. Is 16 feet at the half point of the... Um, so for ADUs, is... we measure to the peak. Okay. Yeah. For other structures, we measure to the midpoint. So. Um, Further pending legislation, um, we can only use ministerial building permit processes. Um, so that's essentially a building permit only application. And then there's a whole list of situations that the city is obligated to approve. And so that includes with a single family home, an attached ADU, a conversion ADU, which we discussed. Um, we were already locally allowing an expansion of conversion ADUs in the state law. We could sort of offer the state that idea and now it's state law. Um, and that the amount of expansion changed a little bit. Uh, the state created a junior ADU, which, I'll actually, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. And then we also have to um, approve a new construction detached ADU up to 800, 800 square feet. So we've added language our, to our ordinance to be explicit that we are only requiring a building permit for all ADUs. Um, there are a few limited circumstances where, well, for all ADUs, um, and then in certain circumstances, if um, a site would trigger, would under normal circumstances would trigger the need for um, say a watercourse development permit because they're too close to a creek or a slope variance because they're too close to a, a 30% or greater slope. Um, we have to allow them to build an 800 square feet, square foot unit, even if they are within closer proximity than we would typically allow. So we've written an accommodation into our code to allow them to go up to 800 square feet. Um, if the project applicant, for whatever reason, isn't satisfied with 800 square feet and really chooses to go to, you know, their maximum that they're allowed, 1,000 or 1,200, and then they're choosing this, um, you know, site plan for 
other, you know, for reasons that are not clear to us, then they have an alternative site plan that wouldn't require this other type of permit. Um, that's the only situation when we would um, require them to get a, a, any kind of discretionary permit. So that's kind of complicated and tied in knots, but I promise we worked with the um, city attorney on drafting the language. And the crux of it is there's a very few situations where we might require um, an ADU to go through a discretionary process, and that would be at the election of the applicant. It, that would only ha they have a clear path to building an 800 square foot ADU with only a building permit. Every, every residential lot in the city now has, now will have that um, opportunity. Um, and then we also, um, so expanding conversion ADUs, um, previously that was, our expansion limit was 120 square feet and now it's going to 150. And then um, we are adding a sort of a clarifying amendment to a code section and this is in your replacement pages that you got, um, that we had had in their language that said uh, that the you can expand your conversion ADU, but it can't exceed the size limit of a new construction ADU. So we're <coughs> deleting that because it's the size limit of a conversion ADU because it's a different size limit. And then um, based on the correspondence that we received yesterday, kind of pointing out this, um, you know, this allowance for expansion and you know there's this debate about whether we can have a size limit at all for um, conversion ADUs. We believe that we can. We've cleared that with HCD. Um, so we've added a clarifying amendment about how you use that expansion area um, in a conversion when it's close to that upper limit. Are we all having fun yet? This, this is minutia. This is really what we're, this is like, we're deep in it. I, I apologize. So. Um, also, further with ministerial permits, multifamily structures. So now, family, multifamily parcels that are zoned for multifamily that are developed with multifamily, you can now also add ADUs. So you can add ADUs that are conversions. You can add up to two um, new construction or detached. The state law says detached new construction ADUs. The staff is actually recommending that we just say two new construction ADUs, especially um, with some of these smaller multifamily projects that are you know, duplexes or triplexes, existing places, it might make more sense to attach the ADU to the, part, to the existing structure rather than build it as a detached. So um, we don't see any reason to not allow that as an option. And then we've just added ADUs that are now an allowed use in any um, zone district that allows residential uses where there is another residential use on the parcel. So, um, and then this is the other part of the replacement pages I've handed out. Um, this is about removing the date that's associated with existing structures. Um, we can talk about the ramifications of that if you wanna get into it, but we're just deleting the date from the ordinance. So, um, allowing mixed use on multifamily and mixed use properties and now creating a junior ADU. Um, these are sort of the remainder um, land use policy amendments. So junior ADUs are, small units. Initially they were created to be, they had to be an existing bedroom that was being converted. Now it can be um, uh, this sort of range of options that includes from anything from an existing bedroom all the way up to building a new addition to the house to become a junior ADU, but they can't be more than 500 square feet. They have to be attached to a single family home. Um, they have to have, you know, they have the standard for an efficiency kitchen. They can have their own bathroom or share a bathroom. And right now the way the state law is written, Junior ADUs, we have to require owner occupancy. And then a junior ADU and an ADU can exist on the same parcel, the same single family parcel. And then lastly, um, in the state law, they're prohibiting jurisdictions from requiring owner occupancy on parcels with ADUs that get permits between the first of 2020 and the first of 2025. So, Locally, we are adopting the um, junior ADU standards. The, um, some of our concerns or curiosities that we had had about junior ADUs in the past have been addressed by the state law. We shared those with the state and they made changes in the state law. So now we're happier adopting what their standards are. Um, and it, it is this sort of spectrum of options that you could have to be a junior ADU um, that could provide like real options for property owners to create something at a lower price point. Because it could be as simple as adding essentially a wet bar to an existing bedroom and an exterior door. 
They can continue to share a bathroom if they already share a bathroom, but maybe somebody has a master suite that already has its own bathroom and already has maybe even an exterior door, and then you're talking about putting in some counter space and some outlets. It could be very cost effective in terms of creating a separate sort of rentable space in a home. Um, and then we'll allow a junior ADU and an ADU on a parcel with a single family home and then um, no owner occupancy between um, the dates specified in the state law. When we discussed this with the Planning Commission, they, um, they were really, they were really interested in um, being more proactive than the state. And um, given the timeline that we were on, there was no time for staff to be proactive this year. And um, one of the things the Planning Commission recommended is that we do, uh, the city consider doing retroactive removal of existing owner occupancy requirements on permitted ADUs. So um, that is their recommendation to your council that we lift owner occupancy requirements on all ADUs that exist and all ADUs that might be built any time in the future. So other things that are in the legislation, there's a reduction in fees. We are working with our um, other fee charging agencies to work these into our fee schedule um, in the timelines allowed. Um, we're also now um, figuring out, we're updating some of our building code, uh, our building permit applications and, and finalization paperwork to reflect this um, right that uh, applicants would now have to delay the enforcement of a building code provision under certain circumstances. And then lastly, the state law does contain language that um, renders our, our entire ADU regulations null and void if we're, if we're not in <laughs> compliance on January 1. So that's why we're bringing an urgency ordinance for your council. Okay, so um, I did wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about owner occupancy. So in February, when your council considered ADUs last year, um, we talked about options around owner occupancy and lifting that requirement. And at the time we were considering it in exchange for maybe affordability or at, um, after some period of time, you know, 10 or 15 years of owner occupancy, then we would consider lifting that provision. And I, I think there were good reasons that we had those thoughts at the time and, I th and the situation is different now. You know, the, the state has sort of removed our ability to be um, concerned about what this may do to the for sale housing market, um, at, you know, in terms of looking proactive, looking um, looking forward um, at new ADUs coming online. So the Planning Commission has recommended that we remove that requirement for all ADUs, past and future, permitted and unpermitted. And um, staff is recommending that we conduct the community outreach that your council directed us to do at the beginning of the year. We didn't do it at the beginning of the year because the state law was changing and it looked like we were gonna, you know, they were gonna take owner occupancy away wholesale and we thought, why have this big dramatic conversation and then have the state take the option away? So, um, so that continues to be our recommendation is that we go forward and do that, that work this next year. Um, the other piece that we are bringing forward this at this point is um, this consideration of a provision in the code that requires ADUs to add an additional increment of green building points. We, we have a spreadsheet and, or um, what do we call it? A matrix and points that are assigned to various green building features and ADUs are having to have a higher standard to reach than other residential uses. Um, we conducted, we did an analysis of the affordability, which was what your council directed us to do last year when we discussed this. And we don't think it's very likely that um, a property owner would elect to be relieved of the green building standard in exchange for providing a deed restriction. The payoff period, um, <coughs> it, it, it's, um, it's too much of a hit for not enough of a gain. You know, the, the price point of meeting the green building standard is not high enough to be, to have the relief of that standard create an incentive for affordability. Um, that's our analysis of it. And um, did we have a recommendation on this? is to lift it. The recommendation is to have it um, remain the same as what is applicable to other new construction. So a single family home that is 2,000 square feet is actually required to get fewer points than an ADU that it may be 500 square feet. Right. So we're looking at um, making, as, as uh, basically having a, a level playing field for the smaller homes, which are inherently um, gonna be using fewer materials and less um, energy and, and so forth already. Sure. That is our recommendation on that. Um, okay, so then, uh, as I mentioned, we weren't able to do any proactive outreach on this um, 
this year, given the timelines we were working under, and we would like to en engage with that in the future. So some of the things that we already know we wanna talk about with the community are here on the slide, like are there more options for junior ADUs? What if we allowed more than one per parcel? What if we allowed three in a single family home? Would that be undesirable? Are there challenges with that? Would that be desirable? Maybe that's creating a type of housing that we're not providing elsewhere in another manner in the market. Um, I, I mean, I think these are just interesting questions to ask. Should we allow them in multifamily housing? It seems like you could allow a junior ADU in a townhome and that might work in some situations. Uh, could we allow the, AD, the junior ADU to be attached to the ADU rather than being attached to the home? Um, things like that. So there, there might be other options around that. We're also interested in talking about um, We've already had an issue come up with short-term rentals on multifamily properties. So currently, we would allow um, a short-term rental permit on a duplex, but um, we don't allow a short-term rental permit on any property with an ADU. And this just raises some, some new questions. You know, if you have an existing duplex or triplex that has an existing short-term rental permit, are we gonna ask them to choose between their existing short-term rental permit and whatever business they're running and building an ADU? Because that's essentially the way our code is written now is they would have to choose one over the other. <clears throat> so I think that's worth a conversation. And then we would be issuing, we would be um, working through the process with housing and our department and um, who, whatever other agencies need to be involved to implement AB 587, which allows us to do um, tenants in common where there's a property with an ADU if it's developed by an affordable housing developer, which is a model we have used in the city in the past um, that actually was not in compliance with state law. So now it can be in compliance with state law. The state law has changed, so we want to adopt that into our code. Um, and we just, we have some working out we need to do about the, you know, definitions and some stuff. We have some work to do on that, but we, our intention is to bring that back for your council to adopt. So, um, our next steps, we will be, after um, adoption by the council, we'll be doing our community outreach, both to cover what we have just done, what's changed about the regulations, and then doing proactive outreach um, to begin on other sort of policy items, uh, as mentioned, starting in the spring of 2020. And then the new legislative cycle begins January 7th, and I have just an inkling that maybe there will be other stuff about ADUs coming in the next legislative cycle, so I think We'll get to see each other a lot again about this topic, which is great. So, and then we have a portion of the ordinance today that would have to go to the Coastal Commission for their review. So here's our big long recommendation that is printed in the packet. I won't read it, but it involves adopting an urgency ordinance and then publishing two ordinances for um, introducing for publication two ordinances that would be <coughs> sort of regular ordinances uh, that would come into effect. That, so the urgency ordinance would go out of effect when the regular ordinance came into effect. Um, and now we have Q&A. And here's an 800 square foot ADU. So this is what it looks like and what the floor plan you could get. Well, thank you. Right, <laughs> and I know it's, I, well, I know it's, a, we know it's a lot too. And so um, we'll go ahead and see now if there's any questions from the council in regards to um, some of the recommendations. Sort of my understanding in simple <coughs> terms is how are we kind of bringing um, up to date some of the state legislation that now needs to be in, on the books as well as some of the specific modifications to our local policy. Um, so that's sort of more or less what's before us. Okay. Councilmember Matthews? Yeah, could you go back to your previous one, that one? So this is all bringing stuff up to current code, uh, uh, consistent with state code, correct? It's, it's consistent with state code, and then also what we've had in here are um, any additional modifications to the green building standards, right. Right. Um, which are but local policy. But then you don't have a recommendation here, but it was implied. This whole package of other things, including uh, eliminating the owner occupancy retroactively, that would all come as part of some future discussion. Is that correct? Yes, that's the intention. Council Member Mines. I just have a question. We received a letter um, yesterday from Californians for Home Ownership. Did you guys see this letter? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm assuming with the urgency ordinance, we can't. Can we make further changes or what, what? I'm just curious what your, 
your initial thoughts on some of their comments are. Um, yeah, so we did spend some time this morning um, reviewing their letter and kind of going through it point by point. And um, unsurprisingly, we don't agree with them on everything. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few, there were uh, two things that they brought up that we felt we needed to change, and those are reflected in the replacement pages that okay. you have Thanks. in front of you. So they, they brought up this um, understanding of the term existing as it's used in the state law. They talk about you can convert an existing structure. Mm -hmm. um, and we and many other jurisdictions had interpreted that to mean existing as of the date that the legislation passed. Um, and consulting with HCD, that's incorrect, that it should be understood as in the colloquial way, so existing as of the point of application. So someone could build a garage, six months later come in and say, I want to convert it to an ADU. Um, so be it, that's the state law. And, um, and then the other piece was about size limits right. for conversion ADUs. And um, I also talked with HCD about that this morning and um, they, they disagree <coughs> with this letter. They think we are able to set a limit on conversion ADUs. Um, we could set whatever limit we like as long as it's not less than 1,200 square feet. So we're starting at 1,200 square feet if your council thinks it should be higher. Um, you're welcome to make a different motion. Uh, so, so we did add a little bit of a change about how you how we're applying the um, 150 square foot expansion mm -hmm. to those larger conversion ADUs, and that's as a, a in response to that letter. There's, the comments that they made about permitting are just incorrect. They didn't read our ordinance correctly. Okay. Yeah. Because we do have a building permit only process. Every parcel can build an 800 square foot ADU with only a building permit, every residential parcel in the city. So the first part of the letter, yeah, you you don't agree that their reading is... Yeah, they're looking for a certain structure in our code that we just don't have because we have had essentially building permit only structure for two years already. Okay. So it's, we're just, we're not creating that new today. And so they're, I, I, my, I think anyway, that they're looking for a certain structure in the ordinance and mm. not finding it because everything is already that way for us. So. Yeah, I think they just misunderstood that. So that's the, these changes reflect this. Some, yeah, this that, th those reflect our understanding in consultation with the city attorney about the things that we need to address. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Vice Mayor Cummings. I just had a quick question. I know that we're mainly just trying to bring our ordinance up to state code. Um, I was wondering if there's any opportunities potentially in the future to um, like increase or incentivize, you know, pro, um, ADUs that would be listed as affordable, or if there's opportunities for having um, ways that we can incentivize affordability, I guess, with the production of ADUs and junior ADUs. Yeah, um, there probably are. I mean, I think that, so So one of the other bills that passed this year was um, AB 587, which requires local jurisdictions to put programs in their housing elements that address creating affordability in ADUs specifically. Um, and we are fortunate in that we are not coming up on this first cycle. So, so the state has different cycles for housing elements and different, different regions are on different cycles. And um, the ABAG region, which is the San Francisco Bay Area, um, their cycle is coming up and they're gonna have to comply with that. So we'll get to kind of see what they suggest because it's, it's hard with ADUs. I mean, especially because we essentially have, they've like taken away anything we might offer as an incentive in terms of a site standard. It's like really not much left. <laughs> so, it, then it's, so then it's really about money. And um, that's great if you have it, right? If you have a source of funds to provide sort of I don't know, a revolving loan fund, the county has a forgivable loan fund. Um, that's wonderful. And, you know, then that money, in case of the forgivable loan, you know, one of the disadvantages there is it's, you know, $300,000 and then that serves, you know, maybe eight to 10 ADUs and then you're out of money. Um, so they're just, the trick, the, the issue with ADUs is there's just no economy of scale. Like every project is really individualized. So um, it's tricky. And I am glad that we get to kind of see what other jurisdictions come up with first before we have to write our own standards in, um, or policy ideas. That's definitely something we're thinking about and looking for, you know, we, some folks are looking for, you know, maybe pre-approved plans or some kind of, you know, modular construction can bring the cost of construction down. But then how do you tie that into an affordability restriction that comes from the city? It's 
it's a tricky one. You know, like I think there are lots of things we can do that can bring the cost of construction down, and then that would allow people to charge lower rent and still cover their costs. And I think those are worth worth doing. And I don't know if we can necessarily tie those things to an affordability restriction and an income qualified you know, deed restriction that's then enforceable by the city. It's a tricky one. Thanks. Yeah. No, thank you. We, that's something we've, we've been talking about and thinking about as well. So, uh, Councilmember Brown. This is uh, related. It just occurred to me um, as a follow up to that question from Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, so, we talked about the affordability level of ADUs and the kind of identification of a trend that maybe they're not so affordable in terms of their where they sit in the market rent. Uh, <coughs> Uh, scale, and I'm wondering if that are you, are you conducting any further analysis of that? I thought I remember recalled that that was happening, and because it would be interesting to just um, get a handle when, as we're moving through all this ADU uh, ordinance revision process, kind of get a handle on what's going on with the house the ADU market in Santa Cruz. Yeah, and also I think. Um, for this particular agenda item, because we are now, because the state is now um, kind of requiring us or taking it out of our hands, whether or not we can require owner occupancy um, to see what the effect is over the next five years, I think would be really helpful to have some baseline yeah. information. Mm -hmm. So is that happening? Yeah, so I did actually, I did a survey of, pro of ADU owners this summer and I am still processing the data. And when we when we bring back whatever package we bring back in like the summer, I will include that analysis with there. So, so my initial read on it is that um, ADUs create like a lower cost market rate by virtue of simply being smaller units. Um, but I am not seeing that there's a massive difference in um, the rent for like a studio apartment and a, and a small ADU. It doesn't. It, that's not jumping off the page to me. The one thing that I will say that has jumped off the page in looking at that data is that there are quite a number of people who own ADUs who don't charge any rent. So it's providing housing, an extension of the primary household. So that's a family member that would otherwise be in the rental market. And that is a, like a significant percentage, so. And just as follow up um, to that, um, we so I know we've received, as that survey went out, um, we've received some messages from uh, potentially affected uh, people about their unwillingness to uh, participate in the survey. And sure. so I'm just wondering, if, have you found that you've been able to get a pretty good um, response rate? I, yeah, I mean, we sent out probably like probably 550 surveys and I have 250 back. So that's, I mean, pretty decent response rate. I mean, one of them came back and said, none of your business. <laughs> but that was really only one out of 250. Like a lot of folks were willing to answer our 10 little questions. So yeah, it's unfortunate that people don't want to participate. And um, it would be great if we had better information about the rents that were being charged or not being charged or how they were being charged. And um, I'll bring you what I have when we come back. Other questions? Councilor McCone and Councilor Brent. Two questions. Um, can, can you just say what conversion ADU is again? Yeah, sure, sorry. Um, so a conversion ADU is a an ADU that's created out of um, any existing structure. So it, we have an existing garage on a parcel and someone you know, adds the kitchen and the bathroom and the um, insulation and firewalls and now it, that's a conversion ADU. Okay, thank you. And um, what, can you just sum up quickly the why we're at, why this is an emergency, why we have to have an emergency ordinance? Um, yeah, so is this an emergency? It's an emergency in that um, the state legislation says that if we're out of compliance on January 1, then we don't have a local ordinance. So that would eliminate our local standards for, um, you know, height and setbacks. And, um, you know, we don't have a ton of other site standards, but we do have sort of, standards about moving you know, the stairways to be inside. Basically, we, we don't have a local ordinance as of January 1 if we don't, if it's not compliant with the state law. And what I understand is the staff recommendation is that we only go for five years. Um, on the owner-occupancy? On the owner-occupancy. 
Um, yeah, so that's what's in the ordinance right now, and um, I, we will be discussing that with the public um, when we go to do our proactive work here in the spring. Um, that's one of the, we already have kind of that direction from the council to discuss this with the public about, you know, what are the pros and cons about making it retro retroactive. Um, so that's what we intend and to do. And that's not before us then tonight, right? Uh, no, I mean, if, if there are strong feelings about that, I mean, the Planning Commission had very strong feelings about it and made a recommendation to your council. So, um, you know, the council has that um, option, but that's not in the staff recommendation. That's not in the proposed ordinance. Unless there aren't any other questions, we'll go ahead and open it up to the public at this time. Are there members of the community who would like to address us on this item? Item number 25 um, and our ADUs, please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Thank you, I'll confine my comments to the owner occupancy issue and I'll cut to the chase. I strongly recommend that you just do what you have to do with regards to the state requirement which is that five year period and not extend it beyond that and not take it for further review because your initial impetus for that was because you were looking at the affordability issue. That's not on the table. And to open up this can of worms, I don't think will do anyone any good. This five year lifting of owner occupancy is going to be a sea change. And I think it would be better to just limit it to the state requirement. The, the recommendation from the Planning Commission was not unanimous. And I'd just like to say that I've been here since 1983 at the seven hearings for ADUs, and staff has always said that it's a balance. And the restrictions and limits and size, it used to be 500 square feet, so the market rate's going to go up, and they're now 800 square feet. The balance was the, the most, the, the sort of the, what maintained a balance was owner occupancy. So what we've had over since 83 is a sort of a slow progression of ADUs that have become incorporated in the neighborhoods and they have had an impact, but it has not been dramatic. 56% of our houses in Santa Cruz are non-owner occupied, and it's only money for those folks, and I predict that with owner occupancy lifted, there's going to be quite a dramatic impact on our community. Um, I think that uh, speculators will uh, buy up houses, and I see time's running out, but the main point is that a property with an ADU, the value goes up which makes it harder for first-time home buyers to buy that property. I had a lot more, but I hope you won't do the owner occupancy beyond the time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Oh. I'm Cindy Ferenzi, and I'm actually a big fan of ADUs. We have one, and um, I, I think that the, the issue with the owner occupancy um, requirement has changed because the state has changed that. So it's not the same conversation that it used to be. So I think we do need to have a revisiting of that um, because it has created the situation where you have two different sets of ADUs. You have existing ADUs that went through the whole process of being legalized. And then you have new ADUs now that will be either built or will be converted from illegal ADUs that exist right now into newly permitted ones that don't have that owner occupancy requirement. So the state has already taken that into its own hands, that horse is out of the barn. So in terms of speculators, um, they have every opportunity to come in and, and buy up uh, either a single family residence right now, add an ADU, or an, uh, 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 a single family residence with an existing illegal ADU and turn it into um, something that is not owner occupied. So I, I think that it's really a very different situation right now. And I think you wanna look at also why did the state do this? They did this because they were trying to increase supply. They're trying to help renters, you know, as, as part of their whole packet of, of new laws to help renters. And what the planning commission was saying, all but one of them, 
was that if you uh, uh, open up existing ADUs that are legal to owner occupancy, uh, you know, where it's not required, then you'll have more rentals available because people would be able to move out of the state if they needed to for family or for job reasons. And uh, they were saying immediately we'd have some more rentals and that would help renters. Um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, I think they had a good point there. And also, um, and what the state was trying to do was trying to get local uh, governments to uh, lift some of the barriers to ADUs, and um, I think that it's a good uh, path to follow. I support them on that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Candace again from uh, East Morrissey. Um, I live in a, a neighborhood that has larger lots, and we have a lot of ADUs, but it's all owner occupied, and it's a very civil environment, and there's alleys, and there's you know, access on both sides of the parcel. So it kind of makes sense sometimes to have a single family home and an ADU. But in most cases, I don't know the <coughs> statistics for our neighborhood, but I know for citywide, it's over 50% of the ADUs are for friends and family. And the tendency, and I remember this in, in previous analysis in this discussion, that there was, uh, and I don't remember the percentage, but there was some discussion about the percentage of lower rents that are seen, and you mentioned it's even free. So. Um, to discourage that in any way by encouraging anybody to sort of buy into our market from anywhere, from anywhere in the world essentially, and to buy in, you know, uh, and competing with single families that want to actually have basically uh, an enclave for their family, which is essentially what's happening for a lot of our properties. In some properties, I have three and four generations living in the same property. Um, that's actually pretty common now in my neighborhood. So. Um, I think you don't want to discourage that. Um, one concern I do have, though, is the height. Um, I, it sounds like there's nothing we can do on that, but there is some concern between the neighbors now and some discussion about solar access. Um, if you have solar access and all of a sudden they build, does that mean they can take that away from you? Uh, that's a question I have, and I know that there's not an answer right now, but that is a consideration. And moving forward with climate change, a lot of people are thinking about that. So thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I think it's a good idea to make it possible for uh, homeowners to create ADUs that are affordable. And one of the policies the county has is that all the permits, if somebody agrees to keeping their uh, unit affordable for 20 years, they don't have any permit fees for creating the ADU. Uh, but if, if at any time they start charging mar market rate rents, they have to pay those fees. So I think a, a program like that would be helpful to uh, creating more affordable units here in town. And I, I hope that you can do something to create these kind of units. Thank you. All right, seeing no other uh, public comment, we'll go ahead and return back for council action. Um, Vice Mayor Cummings, Brown, Matthews. I was just prepared to move the staff recommendations without um, including the, and making sure that we don't include the, the planning commission recommendations. I'm prepared to second that. Okay. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Matthews, sure. essentially moving the recommendation, which isn't actually including the Planning Commission's recommendation, but more so involving the community before making that consideration. Correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, I just want to clarify the one thing that's, um, that we talked about that is not reflected in the proposed ordinance is any change to the green building standard. Okay. So as the, pro as the ordinance is written, it reflects today's code. So, uh, sorry, if I could just get clarified. So you're suggesting yeah. that the, in your recommendation, do we need additional language in regards to the green building standard? You, yeah, I mean, your, your council needs to make a choice about what you're gonna do about green building. Are you gonna keep that additional increment that applies to ADUs? Um, if so, that's the motion you've made, that, that maintains our existing standard and our existing code. Um, or if you'd like to um, delete it, then 
that needs to be part of the motion also. I just want to make sure you're doing that intentionally. Okay. I, I, my understanding is that's in the recommendation. Um, it, it's the bottom of is two that, here. Is that explicit? Is that it or? Does that cover what you're describing? That is that it's included in the agenda report, but just for full it's disclosure, just, making sure that you all are yeah. aware, that would delete that section that requires the additional points for right. ADUs. Okay, which made sense to me. So I support that if that's what's included in your. Is that what you understood as well as the secondary? Yes. Okay. Can you get okay. clarification on that, Lee or Sarah? Do you guys need that in the motion language? No, no. Or is that... if, if everyone is clear, then I'm okay. fine. I guess I was the only one that was confused. Sorry. No, no, no problem. Okay, Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Myers. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment. I'm going to support the motion. I was prepared to make it um, and just say, you know, I think that given that the state has um, kind of taken control of this situation, you know, this is the responsible thing to do and to adopt as an urgency so we can maintain um, our local ordinance. And um, and I also think that with respect to the, um, the five-year period, I'm, you know, I understand where the Planning Commission is coming from and I understand the desire to have an ongoing community conversation about that. But I do think that um, we ought to ask ourselves the question, I mean, is that responsible public policy to incentivize um, in investment in our housing market in this outside investment essentially is what we're looking at here. Um, and the owner occupancy uh, rule I think has rightfully um, appropriately and effectively provided some balance for that. So um, I think that we should, we ought to just go with what the state is requiring us to do now and see what happens um, as a result of that and and what the state opts to do in the future. I was going to offer an amendment, but I don't, I don't think it'll go, so I will. Councilman Matthews. I just wanted to raise um, the issue that uh, Scott Graham um, mentioned, which was a county's, the county's program. That to me is one of those issues that can be um, dumped into the future ADU discussions. I also mentioned that a member of the public who brought up the the um, issue with height and blocking solar or blocking sun on properties because as we're going greener and we're you know installing more solar panels on houses if a house is to go up or what have you and it's blocking the solar the potential for another house to receive solar energy just taking that into consideration as you know how we might want to address that because it could cause conflicts in the future as it has in our recent larger scale development. Yeah. Council Member Brown. I just wanted to follow up on what Council Member Brown said. I just, um, for the record, this I think this action accepts the state mandate, which um, for the record would really have profound impacts on this community. I think we should not vote against any, uh, or not vote for an approval of uh, the removal of the owner occupancy for all uh, past and future ADUs until the larger community has weighed in, which I, it seems like that's the direction we're going, so I appreciate that. Okay, great. Unless there isn't any further discussion, we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time. We'll reconvene here at 7 p.m. for oral communications and the evening session. Items that have not been on today's agenda. Um, oral communications is about a half hour, so we intend to conclude oral communications approximately around 7.30 p.m. I just wanna thank the community in advance for um, the flexibility this evening. I'll go ahead and maybe wait for a little bit of attention. I'll go ahead and I just wanna thank you in advance for uh, your flexibility this evening. Tonight's meeting is quite unique in that we are generally on this final meeting for the year, um, have reserved the evening meeting for ceremonies as it relates to the transition from mayor to vice mayor and mayor incoming. 
And this meeting today is unique in that we had a lot on our agenda. We've been um, meeting since 9.30 a.m. this morning. We wanted to make sure we were able to capture all of the items and um, have a limited time allotted for um, this evening's item. And I appreciate in advance your respect and um, awareness of the kind of the unique circumstances of tonight's meeting. I also want to thank you in advance for your adherence to our rules of decorum. We feel strongly and I feel strongly that everybody, regardless whether or not we agree with their opinion, has an opportunity and right to speak to us. And it's my job and it's the job of the mayor to ensure that no matter who comes before us, that we allow their opportunity to speak to us without threat or intimidation or disruption. I want to remind those that if I do see or um, observe and have to issue a warning because of um, disturbance in our proceedings and our ability to move forward with council business, I will go ahead and issue a warning. If I see that continue, I will ask you to leave. I, I don't want you don't want to do that. And so I hope and um, appreciate your respect in advance for not um, uh, putting me in that position and hopefully allowing our decorum to proceed. Um, so at this time, we'll go ahead and open up oral communications for any item that has not been listed on today's agenda. Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Hi, I'm James. The person I want to ask a question to is not in the room. It's the city attorney, but that's okay. Here he comes. I just want to say it's been a pleasure to witness everything that's gone on, gone on in here. It really has been a pleasure. But my question that I have, and it can be answered at any time, is why is it that a citizen cannot ask a question during this time in regards to what was on the previous calendar? That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. <clears throat> My name is Lee Brokaw, and I would like to call the council's attention to the respectful workplace conduct policy. All employees, volunteers, and council members enjoy a, po a positive, respectful, productive, work-free environment. And it goes on to talk about how the council members as well as employees come under the respectful workplace policy. After the last council election, council members Cummings and Glover were elected and that ignited a little spark in the Matthews builder wing of the party that wanted to call a recall. But they needed to wait six months before they could do that legally and they chose council member Crone instead of council member Cummings and council member Glover. We had just a little bit of a spark and hardly any smoke until the perception speech, which poured gasoline on the ember with the allegations of perceptions of bullying. And I think that um, it would be good if the person who perpetrated that speech would make a public apology because the bullying that went on as that speech went on was that she did not allow either council member that were called out in the perception speech an opportunity to speak and to defend themselves. That to me is bullying from a position of power and a violation of the respectful workplace conduct policy and should have been dealt with that way. The problem that was expressed in the perception speech was a personal problem. Next speaker. My name is Antonio Mendonca, and I'm here to represent the Constitution of the United States. I took a note to protect it. It means it's my, it's my duty, not my right. And I see a lot of criminally insane, politically correct things going on here in America, and especially Santa Cruz, violations of constitutional rights, and politically correct police brutality, police br Military militias mayhem and murder. Okay, hypothermia is not a joke. Health and safety and sanitation is a matter of life and death. Not only people die in hypothermia out there, they're dying of heat exhaustion because you close, politically correct, close area, you can't use a, a tree for shade. 
I see you're all guilty of treason, crimes against humanity, and violating the Constitution of the United States of America. I am take back the Constitution of the United States of America to the people of the United States, plus Santa Cruz. You're all guilty of treason and crimes against humanity. Excuse me, next speaker. Okay, maybe I'm talking about him too, but anyway, as the end of, or Garrett Phillips, uh, Santa Cruz, at, as the end of the year approaches, I don't remember anyone thanking the entire city for closing Ross Camp 1 and 2. Thank you. It is not too late this year for those awful public activists who outrageously accused council members of being fascists or personally responsible for the deaths of homeless people or interrupted <laughs> meetings with outbursts to apologize and make a New Year's resolution not to do it again next year. There are those who believe their goals are so noble it wrongly justifies mischaracterization, lies, and smears of others. Going back to the last meeting, I see now I didn't make it clear exactly how I was mischaracterized by what's called framing by one of the recall council members. I'm not gonna go through all those mischaracterizations like being right wing, as I don't self-identify that way or any diversity, whatever, because my views are kind of cerebral and if he didn't get it before, he's not gonna get it now. I understand it wasn't to misdirect support away from the legitimate recall reasons, but it's beneath the public office to misuse the bully pulpit and offensive to me. The truth is I am a centrist and the progressive left, the self-identified progressive leftist views of some of the council are the extremist views. The only injustice of the recall was that the council member Brown wasn't included. If you wonder why I say what I do, since I really don't ask for anything as the special interests do, it's for me really all about the fact I consider leftism and socialism the two most serious threats to our nation today, the propaganda of which several generations have fallen for now. One more generation and poof goes our excellent nation. Otherwise, happy holidays. Next speaker, please. Well, Justin, I hope as a mayor, you will um, allow a little bit of democracy in uh, these chambers, unlike what we've had for the last 12 months. Um, we can see the suffering that resulted from the manipulation here um, by, for instance, Diana, who is struggling in, next to a wall, next to Ross Camp because she has no place to stay and she was sexually assaulted uh, four days ago. Or you could talk about the 14 people that, uh, um, with Joey who were forced out of the parking garages into the rain in the middle of the night. Or the police raid, the, the Santa Cruz Police Department did this afternoon over at, at Paradise Camp. And the fact that you can find people living in every doorway because of the manipulation and the corruption of this city council during the last 12 months, and particularly during the period of uh, <clears throat> since Watkins has been mayor. So we're really hoping that since I supported Justin Cummings in that election and paid my own money to put out information to get you elected, my belief was you might actually stand up for homeless people. This is a critical moment in history to stand up for, the, for tenants and for homeless people. And so it, it's, um, I just hope that you uh, are start to act a little differently than you have during as vice uh, um, uh, mayor. And uh, you know, just a shame that we have to see this kind of suffering day in and day out. And I, I urge you to support a resolution to reopen Camp Phoenix and let people manage that successfully as we were for five days. We were the only ADA compliant t toilet in downtown Santa Cruz for five days. So you, you can make history as you said in your post this morning You're by actually down. doing something You're on Human down. Rights Day to help the human rights of the people that live on our streets and our community. Thank you. Good evening. Um, at, at the last city council meeting, the vice mayor was chosen on the basis of an appeal to honor, to, on, to the honor of a strong tradition of mayorships and vice mayorships being passed to council members receiving the most votes in recent council elections. After the council meeting, I felt bemused witnessing council support for a declared tradition by council members associated with the recalls of two colleagues. From childhood 
through my voting life, <clears throat> I understood that the recall process <coughs> provides recourse for the electorate, to the electorate to remove corrupt elected officials from office. This is an understanding widely widespread among the citizenry. At home, researching the history of local recalls, I learned that a recall fever is sweeping the United States in the words of a past executive director of the United States Conference of Mayors. An organization so concerned about the abuse of the recall process, they decided to make a film about it. Like the recall now underway in Santa Cruz, quoting, in most cases, recalls aren't based on any allegations of criminal wrongdoing, end quote, reports an article in Governing Magazine, which describes itself as the nation's leading media platform for state and local government leaders. To honor another strong, important tradition, I look forward to the new vice mayor and each city council member declaring their opposition to the frivolous recalls. The traditional purpose of recall law is to keep crooks out of office, not to suppress legitimate political representation. <coughs> Hi, <clears throat> I agree with that last gentleman. Um, <coughs> these, these two men just were defending the homeless people with a lot, lot more concern in their hearts than everybody else that was listening at that point. And maybe they raised their voices a little, but it was not sexual harassment. I know it's sexual harassment. In fact, I was almost killed in a parking garage. And I do not like parking garages at all. And I do not want to see our library turned into one. And no one has ever told me what's going to happen to those trees that are over 200 years old in that beautiful parking lot over there that houses our lovely farmer's market, which is the best thing we have in our community, if you ask me. And uh, as far as maybe that building in the middle of the Pogo Nip, the last time I hiked in there, it still had Schwarzenegger's name in front of it. Uh, 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 you ought to check it out. But I'm worried about the ticks and, and the poison oak, which I always seem to get when I hike in the Pogo Nip for very long. I guess I get them from my dogs. But um, that building by the, um, the, uh, the tennis courts out there, can we maybe somehow renovate that and turn it into a homeless community home and give our people some place to live? The winter's gonna get nasty. Climate chaos is upon us. It's all Trump weather now until we get rid of them. So we gotta get on it and give the people something to look forward to, something to hope for, a beautiful place to live, and I bet the drug and all of the needles and things will go way down if we give everybody happiness. Thank you. Next speaker. <clears throat> Members of the community and the city council. There's a nasty new normal setting in around us. Today, Lancaster City Council votes on outlawing free food distribution, banning groups like Food Not Bombs on the sidewalk. Same old NIMBY pretext, you know, obstructing the sidewalk, litter, visual blight, and undefined hazards to public health. The real reasons, those unsightly tents and the unsightly people sleeping in them that seem to be in the vicinity of Food Not Bombs groups. Next Friday, the reactionary Roberts Court Trump's Supreme Court will consider whether to reconsider the Boise versus Martin decision. That case, and the reality is of Santa Cruz's rich folks only rents, has forced cops and rangers to dig deep into their pocketbooks, their ticket books actually, my apologies, for other laws than camping, it's our pocketbooks they're digging into, to drive away visible homeless people. Interfering with property value and Christmas business, the traditional reasons for driving them out of sight. As rents and real unemployment have worsened, their numbers have grown, and new myths have become accepted dogma. People outside are best, are now viewed as addicts, alcoholics, or loonies, required to label themselves as such to get services. Survival tents in Salem, Oregon, 
So city council there trots out a new homeless ban, which they call a camping ban. Like in Santa Cruz, with no shelter option provisions, at least there's more brutal honesty there. Here we saw in May, Vice Mayor Cummings and the Watkins majority buy the Susie O'Hara, Megan Bunch, plenty of shelter lies. Same fake narrative was used to close Camp Phoenix at Ross recently and to duck any winter shelter action tonight. But your eyes tell the tale each day. Elderly and disabled women and men on the streets, friendly police driving homeless out of parking garages into the rain night after night, and the news tightens on all of us, or most of us anyway, as the cliche goes, as the cliche goes, if we do not hang together, please do not interrupt my last sentence. Your if we do not up. hang together, we will all hang separately. Your Thank you. Up. Next speaker. This is a, I'll just remind those that are here, this is for oral communications items that are not on today's agenda. If you're here to speak to the evening item, you'll have an opportunity to do that at public comment. So this is for not um, items that are not on today's agenda. Please, you have two minutes. Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. <clears throat> I have a habit of saying things people really don't wanna hear. I mean, all different kinds of people. And I simply say, if I'm wrong, show me where I'm wrong, because calling me names and making threats, short of killing me, is not gonna shut me up. Where do I start? Robert Norris just told us, as did many people, homeless advocates here, uh, what we need to do for the homeless. I have previously suggested what the homeless can do on their own behalf that would greatly enhance their uh, welcome uh, to everybody else. And that is simply clean up your own crap. Don't leave it in the forest. Don't pretend you care about trees when I've been in the forest doing forest work and I've seen what you've done to the forest. So please, Clean up your own mess. Clean up your fellow homeless person's own mess if they won't clean it up. Where else do I go? Uh, Doug, Drew Glover, you got a 1619 thing there that refers to slavery, which of course white people are uniquely guilty of, which is not true. Furthermore, if uh, white people uh, massacred the Indians when they came over here, which they did, which they did, uh, shouldn't immigrants at least from overseas not come over here uh, now that the white people have done the dirty work for them? I mean, think about that. Don't criticize white people if you're gonna come over and displace the Native Americans yourself, plus all the kids that you have when you get here. Where else do I go? Okay. Let me say something on behalf of Muslims. Muslims did not do 9-11. Jews did 9-11. If you go to, I told you you'd be mad at me, show me where I'm wrong. <laughs> Wikispooks.org right, right, and you'll see what up. I mean. Your time is up. All right, I'll, I'll just go ahead and um, remind those that are here for oral communications. This is for items that are not on today's agendas, but to, to, to this is also for items that we as a city council have jurisdiction over. So I'll go ahead and ask that we come forward and speak to those uh, related type topics for another 10 minutes before we move on to our evening session. So oral communications will <coughs> conclude at 7.30. Why don't we go ahead and the next speaker, please, you'll have up to two minutes. That was quite an act to follow. Um, my name is Sarah Minildi, and the reason I came is I wanted to strongly express my support for Drew Glover and Chris Krohn, and how much I feel concerned. One gentleman here made a lot of sense to me. He said, what's bothering me the most is that these, this recall process, I voted for both Chris Krohn and Drew Glover, and I respect their stuff. But even if you don't, this idea of just recalling them is so bad because I think it leads to a new authoritarianism. And that is what is bothering me. And I, I see a lot of problems with that. And um, I mean, I, ranting doesn't help. Privately, I rant, but this is just really, really awful. So I encourage anyone who's listening anywhere here or on TV to please, um, when it goes up for a vote in March, to vote against the recall, please do. Um, that's why I work the elections, and um, while it doesn't make me some expert, you have no idea how hard Gail Pellerin and all of us work 
to ha keep broadening the base, keep opening to everybody. You don't have to have an ID in Santa Cruz to vote. You can vote at all sorts of paying polling places. You can do this and at the same time avoid voter fraud. And it is such hard work and it's so like this and then this and this and we work from six o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock at night, we're volunteers. And that gives me a very great sense of Americanism again because we're losing some of this, this intense hostility between those of us who are poor and people who have money in this county is appalling to me. My family, it, it, we're the old Minildi family in SoCal and they've been around since God was a pup, you know, and Santa Cruz didn't used to have this hostile atmosphere and I don't feel that we need that. And lots of political diatribes don't help. But I do think that we need to vote. We need to have our vote respected. I feel like it's somebody said, well, Sarah, I'm sorry you voted for Drew and Chris because we're taking that away from you. Thank you. And the woman with the um, blue vest will be our last speaker. Go right ahead. Hello. Um, this year we'll in May. Pause your comments. Serge, if you're interested in speaking, I advise you to line up to the left and you'll be our last speaker. And, um, and if that's, if we get to, if we are able to get to, she'll have a chance to do that. So why don't you go right ahead? Okay, go ahead. Hello. Um, so this year in May of 2019, it was estimated that anywhere between 2,000 and 3,200 people are uh, home experiencing homelessness on any given night here in the county of Santa Cruz, um, making Santa Cruz one of the highest in, in the country. And that was a quote by a ABC7 News. Um, I'm just here to say that we will accept nothing less than a roof over every houseless person in America. We are here to end homelessness. Um, and we are asking for your help to help get us some type of housing before the people have to take it upon themselves to figure something else out again, such as the Phoenix camp. And eventually that's what will happen. And we'll be back again, just like Drew had stated before, and we'll be talking about this uh, in you know, future meetings. Um, and so I just really asking for your guys' help. We all are, we're all asking for your guys' help. That's what the community is saying to you. Uh, another thing, uh, Alicia couldn't make it here tonight. She has, um, uh, she's a guest speaker on, on a radio station, so she'll be here at the next meeting, and that's all I wanted to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. And those, and those interested in speaking on the evening item, you'll have an opportunity at public comment, and that's the Community Advisory um, Committee on Homelessness. So this is items not on today's agenda, oral communications. Please. Go right ahead. Hi, my name's Jim. I've been around this community for about 30 years. Um, I want to speak on the issue of decorum. In the 30 years I've been around this county, decorum in the council has been pretty much friendly for most of those years. I had took exception with Chris in his first year running, or his first term, spoke with Keith Sugar multiple times back then, and didn't really have a problem. But after his last term, you know, heard from staff members that they weren't necessarily comfortable with interacting with them. What's been obvious within the last couple of years is the decorum has declined. And that's the point of the recall. It's how people get along. It's the attitude you show towards others. It's how you interact with staff. Those things, you know, getting back to people in the community. You know, we've heard multiple times over multiple weeks that people message Chris, and actually Chris over since the recalls come about has actually been much more amenable to the community and that sort of thing. Glover, not so much. Um, so that's been obvious and I think that's kind of one of the key points of the recall is how people treat each other. And going back to decorum and decorum in the community, you hear that people in the take back community or the people that don't necessarily like finding needles are you know anti-homeless, anti-this, anti-that. No, you know, they don't want kids stepping on needles in parks. They don't want homeless communities right near their house when crime spikes up. They raise these concerns, they're attacked by the activists. Sorry for looking back. You know, it's decorum, it's a communicate conversation. Cynthia <coughs> knows that, you know, I'm not always the best in email. And, you know, that's gone on to Bernal and Condotti have seen that as well. You know, so I've got my own issues, but as a council, working with staff, working with the public, that's important. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hey. 
I always get nervous. Um, I'm Crystal Olson. I come in peace. I just want to um, uh, say a couple things. I wanted to ask why um, there's no vouchers being handed out when it's rained for five days in a row and people are soggy. I want to know, like, if it gets become freezing, is anybody going to get a hotel voucher? Like, I, it's my understanding that um, it was said in court that you guys would make sure that people had a safe place and. Um, the Ross camp saved me, like in all honesty, that is what saved me. Thank God for the Ross camp last year. And I don't know, I'm nervous, sorry. I just want to say that like, where is this 2020? Like, where's the compassion? The hate is so old school. Like, if we could just have a spot where we can put the homeless so that everybody's safe. My best friend died. She was a firefighter. She wasn't a she was somebody, and um, it means a lot to me to see, you know, people out on the streets in the pouring rain for five days. Um, I'm blessed. I got into Paige Smith. I'm in a house, but um, that comes with difficulties as well as bed bugs and um, other things. Um, just trying to move forward, and I hate seeing my people. I don't want to see anybody else die. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Last night, I saw a movie. The title of the movie is Good Night and Good Luck. My name is Elise Casby. I'm a community activist here. The title Good Night and Good Luck was a reference to Edward R. Murrow, one of the greatest journalists in the history of the United States of America. He's quite thought of as a hero. And the reason is, is that while he was at CBS, he was a television personality. He was a newscaster. And um, he took on Joseph McCarthy during the McCarthy era. We are seeing McCarthyism right now, right here in Santa Cruz. Same thing Joe McCarthy did over and over again. He would take people apart, making up accusations, making up claims. He did this from the Senate, actually, and he got amazingly far with this. It's known as the McCarthy era. Most of us have at least heard of it. And I don't think I'm being too strong here. Decorum is not a law. Decorum is behavior. I could be somebody who couldn't walk and I could try to crawl up to the microphone to speak. I could be dirty. Some people might have a problem with that. That does not matter. I'm a human being. I'm a citizen. If I'm a citizen here, I have rights. And those rights have been under assault ferociously since Barack Obama signed away our constitutional rights um, with the NDAA, NDAA National Defense Authorization Act. A lot of people don't know that. Please look it up. Technically, we do not have habeas corpus and other rights. We need to stand up to this McCarthyism. Like Edward R. Murrow, the only way that this is gonna stop this accusations and hearsay, there was feces, there was blood, there was this, there was that. We need evidence, solid, concrete evidence. Good evening. I think every time I get up here, I talk about the same thing. Essentially, my first time ever had to do with becoming a sanctuary city and having homes for people. And I'm back on the same subject as I often am, as many people are. And I want to talk just a little bit tonight about the resolution that Cash is presenting to have a second camp in addition to the River Street camp. And as we know, we're asking for something very, very hard. It's not gonna be easy. There's a lot of NIMBY, there's not a lot of other problems. So I want you to put yourself in a certain position. First of all, last meeting or recently, you all voted for health in all programs, I think it is. And don't forget what people told us over and over again that night, that homelessness is one of the major causes of ill health. And so that's something we've all 
along with you because we voted for many of you. That's what we wanted you to remember. The other thing I want you to remember is when those rains hit after Thanksgiving, and maybe you were in your car, maybe you were running from your house to your car, maybe you didn't have to go out at all if you were lucky, but just remember how, how great you felt knowing that there was a dry place, maybe a warm place, and that you were gonna be able to sleep dry, I hope, and um, I did have my roof leak on my bed one night, so it doesn't always last, but usually it does. So please keep those things in mind because we are here trying to speak for many people who will never come to this mic. And so we get up over and over again and we know we're getting through to you, but then you have your own other forces going on. So I beg you, thank you. Thank you. I had something else, but I'm just gonna make this super short. I'm the person who spoke before and right at the end started making the anti-Semitic comments. I think we should make some comment that that was not okay, because I don't think the free speech allows for any kind of comment because you've called out people on SHIT. So just as a, as a city and as a city council, that wasn't okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll go ahead and conclude oral communications at this time. Um, we have uh, two items on our evening session. So for those that are here to stay for our evening items, um, we welcome you. And we also particularly welcome the members of the CASH and our co-chairs. So tonight's evening item is the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness and it's our initial status and action report to City Council. For members of the community, I'll just go ahead and remind you about procedurally of how this will go. We'll have a presentation from our CASH um, co co-chairs will have an opportunity for staff um, to answer any questions that the council may have following that presentation. I'll ask that our council please reserve their questions until the presentation has concluded, at which time once we have our clarifying questions answered, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment for members of the community who want to address the council on this item, and then we'll return to the council for action and deliberation. I ask that you um, uh, respect our uh, present present um, I just want to say um, from the very beginning, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your time, uh, for your volunteer hours, for your commitment to serve our community. We've given you a lot. You've rose to the challenge. You've dedicated hours. You've created subcommittees. You're here before us this evening, and we have only gratitude for your service to our community. So thank you very much for taking the time to present. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question, Council Member Cohn? Could we get a sense of how many folks are from the cash that are here tonight? Sure. If they could raise their hand. For those who are members of the cash that are here tonight and want to be recognized, we extend our gratitude and thanks to Thank you, you as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of Council, my name is Candace Elliott, and this is Taj Leahy, and we're the co-chairs of the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. Uh, the committee has 11 members. Six of us have a lived experience of being unhoused. Uh, we would like to thank you for the opportunity to be of service to our community. Uh, additionally, we would like to thank both city and county staff uh, community members and service providers for their help and dedication uh, in this work that we've been doing. Houselessness and living outside are complex social issues. Our work has required us as a committee to bridge differences of opinion and to find alignment and solutions that meet the needs of our community. Uh, just a little background on what we have done so far. Uh, so the catch has met every two weeks since the later part of July of this year. Uh, community engagement has been an integral part of our work. So there have been opportunities for community engagement at the beginning and the end of each meeting that we've held and then after each item um, that we have. We've also held meetings all over town, not all over town, but in various Good locations. Places throughout town. So we've been in uh, the Vets Hall, the um, Harbor High, Loudon Nelson, and the community police room. Tony Hill. Tony Hill. Uh, so 
we're trying to provide the community with many opportunities to come to us uh, on this issue. Uh, we have created different subcommittees. You can see public health and hygiene, safe sleeping and campgrounds, and public engagement or community engagement. Um, the members of our subcommittees have met with a lot of different service providers, including um, you know, 1220 River, um, Salvation Army, uh, Housing Matters. Uh, we've met with business owners and housed and unhoused community members. And tonight's recommendations um, are the beginning of our work. So we're coming to you tonight with our immediate recommendations and we'll be coming to you twice in 2020 with our mid and long term. And I see that that says March of 2010, which is in the past, <laughs> but it'll be March of 2020. <laughs> um, all the recommendations that we bring to you tonight have been vetted by the full catch. Uh, and you know, despite differences of opinion and uh, real disagreement that we have and, and have had, we've been able to move almost everything by consensus. So that, that tells me that the diversity of opinions that there are in our community, which I feel are reflected in the members that were selected for the catch, you know, that there's some hope for us to move forward. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn it over to Taj and we have nine recommendations for you tonight. All right, well, jumping in, thank you again, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Um, thank you, staff, uh, for your uh, support. Um, so here we go. Um, so we're recommending to the City Council to continue to help fund the 1220 River Street um, Shelter Program, being that it's a working program. So let's continue to do the same thing. Um, <clears throat> there's not enough capacity in current shelter programs. So we'll talk about that more later. Um, so that's pretty much the end of that. Uh, just continue to fund that particular program. Candace? The second recommendation is to create an additional or multiple additional managed low barrier ADA accessible emergency shelter programs to be opened this winter, either inside of the city limits or with shuttle service to the city if the shelter program is outside of the city limits. And there are a lot of different um, types of shelter that there are that could be fulfilled by this um, recommendation. We also recommend the shelter program to include ongoing feedback with regular meetings between the management and the community. Um, and you can see you know, the, the estimated cost of this type of program and revenue source as well, and the community engagement that we have done so far. Uh, a note about that particular item is that the shelter program, <clears throat> including ongoing feedback, with regular meetings between management and the community. It's it's basically to get at this sort of contention so that there's one oversight and also um, that there is an opportunity for people to adjust um, accordingly, whether it be community members, neighborhood um, people, um, or people that are actually in the services so that everybody's voice can be heard. Um, okay, so recommend, uh, we're recommending relocating the shuttle pickup site for the Laurel Street, oh, shelter program. This has, happened. I believe it's going to be moved to the sh um, sheriff's office. Is that correct? So yay. <laughs> when already. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next recommendation is uh, for two additional ADA uh, portable toilets with hand washing stations uh, in the downtown area. Uh, we recognize that there is a, a need for a larger number of um, toilets and hand washing stations throughout the city. And this was in reference to the Loudon Nelson restrooms um, and trying to um, kind of manage that uh, situation just in the downtown. Um, also, you'll notice that these are open 24 seven. Uh, we've had a lot of dialogue about what this would do for anywhere that it's at. Um, and we've gone from having them open at nighttime or having them open just certain hours of the day. Um, but it came back that maybe having them open 24-7. Um, Sorry, my kid's in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, thanks. Is that me? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, and we're recommending that the Loudon Nelson Community Center, center restrooms um, remain open only to patrons, uh, such as the council has moved already. We're just sort of saying we back that up currently. Yeah, we talked with um, Tony Elliott and various <coughs> members of staff and found that it would be cost prohibitive to open them up to the general public. 
Uh, the last kind of immediate recommendation that we had is to expand the catch by one individual. This comes from kind of a wanting to expand our capacity place. Um, I think that, you know, if we could have more than one, that would be great, but um, one would be excellent. Did you want to add anything there? No, not to that. Thank you. So our mid and long term recommendations. So the first one is uh, related to creating new shelter programs, that there be input and feedback between management, the community, and organizations representing homelessness um, when you're creating and um, implementing and sustaining shelter programs. Uh, the next one is that we recommend that City Council fund a comprehensive community engagement program to include facilitated meetings across the community and across demographics and constituents uh, with an independent or specially designated facilitator. So um, we have a public engagement subcommittee, but we only have so much capacity uh, to do this work, and we think that it would benefit our city to have a real comprehensive deep dive into this um, issue across all segments of the community. And so at our last um, meeting, we did a small process like this, which was basically getting people into small groups and having people that wouldn't normally talk to each other actually talk to each other. Um, and the, the vibe in the room, to speak a little hippie, sorry, um, it was palpable, it was, it was a good moment. And I think we all feel like it was necessary and, and moved us as a community forward and with a small notch. So this is why we're thinking, let's do a bigger version of this. That's what this item is. And then the, the next item, recommending creating one RV sewage dumping site. This, I believe, has actually already been completed and um, won't be able to be opened for another year, um, but has been built. Um, the last item on this slide has to do with the camping ordinance, um, which we will be returning um, to you about in 2020. Um, okay, so we're asking that you uh, approve these items, please, um, which are the additional portable toilets downtown. Um, again, backing you up on what you've already decided about the Loudon Nelson restrooms, continuing to fund the 1220 River Street um, camp. Um, additional shelter be open this winter, if possible, that would be wonderful. Um, the covered pickup site, we already have that going, which is great. And another seat on the catch would be fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, and participation in discussion of new shelter programs and the facilitated community engagement, the RV dump station, we think we've got that handled, so thank you. So, and then additionally, to indicate additional high priority issues um, that you have that you would like the catch to address, uh, and then to schedule items to return for deliberation with specific target dates. And again, we would like to thank you for having us here this evening and giving us this opportunity to work for you and with you and with the community. Um, and we'll give it back to you now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And on a really quick personal note, I wanna thank the incoming mayor um, thank you for your service, thank you for your commitment. Thank you, current mayor, for your service and commitment. And thank you everyone on the council for your service and commitment to our community. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both for your presentation this evening. But beyond that, thank you for your dedication and your commitment to serving our city and for your work and countless volunteer hours. I also, also wanna acknowledge we have um, Former Assembly Speaker Pro Tem Fred Keeley, who is volunteering his time um, here with us this evening as well. So thank you, Mr. Keeley, um, and all of the cash members that are present. We're gonna have an opportunity for public comment, and so I'll go ahead and acknowledge that then. Um, I wanna thank you for the presentation. Um, at this time, we'll have an opportunity for the council to ask any questions, not only of the cash members, but also of our staff, as well as Mr. Keeley, if we have additional questions for the presentation. But again, thank you for your recommendations and your work. Are there any questions from the council at this time? Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your work. I'm really impressed with the amount of work you've done in this pretty short amount of time, the, um, the time that you have all spent and, and really putting together a uh, process for communi real community engagement. On that note, 
I um, wanted to ask you to get your thoughts on the on item seven, the recommendation to create and implement. Um, Oh no, that's the wrong one, I'm sorry. The recommendation, it's number eight, <laughs> sorry. Recommend that the City Council fund a comprehensive community engagement program. So um, it would be great to hear if you all in your uh, developing this recommendation had much of a conversation. We don't get that in your action minutes, which I did look through. Um, but uh, what you all talked about in terms of how we might go about uh, structuring that, um, it'd be great to, hear from you about your thoughts. Sure. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so I'm on the public engagement subcommittee and we've had a, kind of a lot of talk about what that could look like. Um, I have recently gone through a, a public engagement uh, session with Puma, the Progressive Urban Management Associates who are looking at the downtown business improvement districts, uh, it, which included meetings with key stakeholder groups, uh, there was a survey. Um, so this type of formal public engagement, I think would be a great um, way to go. I, I think also maybe to get a little more to what you're saying as well, um, it would be a pretty comprehensive and widely publicized um, meeting of the minds, if you will. Um, as we've all seen, there's there's a lot of contention, just to call it what it is, um, and we feel like one of our jobs as the catch was to kind of um, harmonize all the forces in our city. And so this particular item personally might be, I feel like might be one of the most important things that we do. Um, and so it's gonna be pretty large in scope, um, yeah. Maybe if I could just briefly say, is this also one of the, um, and then I'm looking to you, City, uh, city Manager Martine Bernal, the roles of the new incoming kind of position around the homeless manager position, sort of facilitating the engagement process, et cetera? Oh, yes, of course. I think uh, the role is would include uh, assisting in, in that regard and also uh, really being out there in the community uh, involved with the various uh, stakeholders around this issue. I would, I would say yes. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks for the presentation, Catch Reps. I know it's been a long road since July with all the different meetings, and I'm sure more work than maybe some, some of the representatives or members were anticipating. Um, so uh, really excited about some of the recommendations. Uh, there are other ones, of course, that are a little bit less awesome, but that's just my personal opinion, and I think maybe shared from others. Uh, just curious, you mentioned in the beginning that um, the decisions that you were making were able to be achieved through consensus, which is really great. Um, were all of these recommendations achieved through consensus? No. Can you tell me more about that? I don't have those, I don't believe either of us have those notes with us, but we'd be happy to send them to you and to the whole council. Okay, great. And um, they are in the meeting notes that were attached. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was just curious because, um, you know, and, and also just how has the experience been working through the process? I mean, in your opinions as co-chairs, do you think everyone's felt heard and engaged throughout that process? Um, I think that's an excellent question, and thank you for asking it. Um, <clears throat> it mirrors exactly what's happening here in City Council. Um, at times it's been contentious, at times it's been quite harmonious, um, and everything in between. Um, we have, as co-chairs, we've tried to make sure that every voice is able to be heard and that everyone comes to the table, partly because personally I feel if people's voices don't get heard, they just get louder. And so if we can, um, usually we, we try to get consensus, but if, if someone says, you know what, I don't agree with that, then we vote on it and it's a democratic decision. But it's usually logged that, okay, well, somebody didn't agree with this, and then we move forward and try to uh, have a spirit of, um, Corroboration. I don't, the, yeah. There's a word in there somewhere. Sure. <laughs> Synergy. Synergy, yeah. Synergy, right. Uh, that's great. And is it a 50 50, so is it a 50 plus one voting thing, or how do you, what's the process with that? Uh, yeah, no, it's just uh, by um, majority. Majority? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so it dep it's, they're in our bylaws, it's so it's either a two-thirds or a simple Sorry. majority, depending on the item that we're voting on. Yeah. Okay, th yeah. that's wonderful. Um, I just, the reason I ask these questions, there's a reason, right, for all this, uh, right. is I've been just contacted by uh, multiple members of the catch uh, with regards to concerns expressed about the uh, process, as well as the f uh, feeling heard, specifically, and one of the troubling ones most recently brought to my attention was the decision or recommendation on the Loudon Nelson bathrooms. So was that a 50-50 vote? Was that a two-thirds majority vote? So I don't, again, have that information in front of me, mm -hmm. and you can That's okay. it, find it, a, it but yeah. I would like to say that that was not one of the items that we moved by consensus, so we did have a vote on it. Right, yeah, um, I, it was just I was contacted um, by a concerned member of the catch who is someone who I believe is currently uh, having experiencing homelessness, mm -hmm. and uh, they had expressed that they had been outspoken verbally and physically providing props and other kinds of things to push for the reopening of the bathrooms, but had felt so disregarded by the process and unheard in the in the body that they had decided to stop attending the meetings, which is when yeah, the vote was held on the Loudon Nelson bathrooms. And it's my understanding that if that person had been there and voted against the recommendation that came forward, then you would not have been able to achieve your two-thirds majority. Uh, and that recommendation to keep the bathrooms closed would not have come back before us on the council. So it's, uh, I, it's, it's a little disconcerting um, just to have that experience shared with me from someone who is currently experiencing homelessness, who are the voices, in my opinion, that we should be centering around this process. Um, so, I'm dismayed about the Loudon Nelson. I understand the logic and the arguments that we heard from the staff from Loudon Nelson, as well as the um, director Elliott's perspective and the costs associated with it. But uh, understanding this process, understanding the purpose of the catch, and then also to have not only that member but other members as well come to me and um, express concern about the process, uh, it it's. I think maybe we could work towards addressing that in the future, moving forward, to make sure that doesn't happen again. Ideally, I've made sure to stay at my at a, at a distance just to not interfere with the process but I think that um, since we're talking about it and you're here for a report today that we should bring that up and have it be on the record that we can maybe focus on that a little yeah bit. so I think that there are two points that you're making mm -hmm. the first one is related to the Loudon Nelson Center bathrooms in particular mm -hmm. and council can make whatever decision Absolutely. you would like to make related to the bathrooms. The other issue of someone being a part of this committee and not feeling like they can be engaged mm -hmm. is something that we're aware of and endeavoring to work on. Um, and uh, we, we hope to be able to reconcile with this person. Great, and there's, mo well, there's multiple people on the on the body that have approached me about it, but hopefully it gets addressed, thank you. Yeah, um, as you, I think, may understand from the deliberations that happen on this council, that we're not always in agreement. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes uh, our votes go one way and sometimes they go another way, and that is the process that we have decided to participate in in this country as our, as our process of governance. That absolutely, and I don't think um, we should be discounting the importance of democracy, but also in a body that's specifically made up to address the issues and needs of people experiencing homelessness, to have those on the body who are currently experiencing homelessness feeling like their voice is being ignored, unheard, and then advocating on a specific issue, and when they are not present to have that issue brought forward for a vote. So just, just put it out there, and hopefully we can address that, and I don't have to hear those complaints anymore from the members of the catch. Um, so uh, with regards to your recommendation to add a new catch member, um, who, what, where, how, what are your thoughts? Is it a person? So we have asked that the catch be able to decide how and who, um, right. so we don't necessarily have a particular person in mind. So but what we would like to do is look at the makeup of the current committee and see where there is some lacking experience and then fill from that. Uh, okay, and um, let's see here. I guess uh, there was a question that came up when I was looking at the agenda report. Was the the number cited at the twelve sixty per month for the two porta potties? Is uh, it's my understanding that's for both bathrooms? I'm sorry. Say that again, please. The 
$1,260 per month that would be allocated for the opening of the two 24-hour bathrooms and sanitation yeah. stations. Those will be for the two. Do you, did the catch talk about locations for those yet? Uh, we have talked about locations, but we thought that might be better put in your court. Ooh. Uh -huh. And also <laughs> I want to say about this particular thing is that this is a, it's a bit of a pilot program because uh, partly whenever we have thought about putting a restroom in a particular location, you can imagine the amount of uh, feedback, negative feedback that would come from that. And so, it, you know, we kind of want to, let's, let's get one, let's get it happening first, mm. see how we can bill it as a good thing, because of course it will be, and then do more as, as that one gets started. So again, so this is sort of a pilot program, just a beginning, it's a start. Wonderful, I'll stop there for now, but thank you for those wonderful answers. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilmember Myers, did you have a question? Uh, Councilmember Glover asked most of the, I just want to thank you for your service though. And um, also just, I know this is a huge <coughs> for your committee members and it's a t really, really tough, hard subject to dive into. Um, I'm really impressed with the work that you've done to date and um, just want to thank you for all your time and your effort and uh, hope that we can you know, move forward and keep up a productive focus on our houseless population for the next few months and get some ideas uh, solidified and activated. Thanks. Thank you. Do you have a question, Councilor Ricker? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I hear it's more, you've bit off more than you could, might want to chew. Uh, <laughs> people have been telling me there's a lot more hours involved and I appreciate your service as well. Um, question I wasn't gonna ask, but it just came up was, why are some of the um, votes majority and others are two thirds? How, do, how, how does that work? I misspoke. Candace can speak to that better and Fred could speak to so that better. So they're all two thirds. Sorry, do we have a member of staff who is here who would like to come up and speak about the bylaws? Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Hi, uh, Megan Bunch, City Manager's Office. We, um, the catch put together a set of bylaws and I believe the, it is two thirds majority. We can look it up and confirm for you guys and um, you're welcome. We can give you access to it, it's on the website. Um, and there's bylaws for the subcommittees as well. Um, so we've got two separate bylaws associated with the catch and I believe it to be two thirds as you stated. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, and um, picking up on what uh, Councilmember Glover, the, the 1,206, I'm glad to see that these two porta potties are ADA because the ones we have out right now are not necessarily ADA uh, accessible. Um, why 1,260 a month? What I checked in with a couple contractors and they said they're paying between 125 and 168 a month for the porta potties. Why are we looking at two porta potties for $1,260? It looks like Megan's coming up to Sorry. answer that question. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. The, um, the, those numbers came from the, um, the rate that we are currently being charged for the, that service, and it includes, I think, the difference in price is the service. So if you're getting service daily, it radically increases the, the cost, the total cost. And so that's where that came from, and we chose to put those numbers in there as a service daily based on the existing porta potties that are 24-7 um, that are in the parking lots currently, and the, um, after speaking with parking, they made it clear that we need service. If we're gonna put <coughs> something out for 24-7, we need service daily because they won't be usable um, if we're not servicing them daily. So I, I'm assuming that's where the cost differential probably comes in. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, going Sorry, back. I'm just gonna go ahead and pause. I didn't see who made that statement, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you reserve your comments for when we're gonna have public comment. At that time, we'll be able to ha hear from the community. We do have limited public comment, but that will be your opportunity to speak to us. And at this time, it's now for council to have Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and continue with council questions. Go right going now. back to um, the porta potties at Loudon Nelson, I heard from a member that it was eight to four, eight votes in favor, four against. Uh, one vote would have you know, changed that. Um, did, um, and, I, and I heard about the cost from uh, Tony Elliott. Did you all talk about volunteers possibly picking up the slack and using a volunteer program rather than um, having, you know, letting the cost, you know, win out? Yeah, definitely. That's something that I specifically spoke about on multiple locations. Um, when traveling out of the country, I've seen that model in other places, specifically in restrooms. So it was something that I brought up. Um, there are various channel cha challenges to that, as well as financial challenges as well. This is um, this was the recommendation that our subcommittee put for, forward at the moment. And again, 
these are just our beginning recommendations. We want to continue working on some of these issues. This is not the end of the story. I'm sorry it was such a close vote. Um, on, on the one about 1220 River Street, uh, I'm understanding that we're going to start moving people February 15th. I mean, what, do, do we have another place for that? And how's that, you know, how, what are you thinking in, t in those terms? Looks like City Manager Martin Bernal wants to speak to that item if you want. Right. So the River Street, uh, I believe it's mid-March that uh, is sort of the deadline for uh, the Water Department to be able to start their project there. So we're currently working on an alternative site for them, but that has to be obtained by mid-March. When, when do we have to start thinking about like getting asking people to change locations? Just we're so that now. folks are aware. We've of been that. doing that for some time. So yes, right now we're working on that right now. Thank you. And why do you um, the one on uh, adding a member? What, what's the thing about? What do you think about adding a member? Why is that? Uh, why do you need another member? I didn't understand that exactly. And I know the workload is heavy. So we. We had two members who have decided to um, leave the catch, and we have added an additional two members. One of those members um, that we added is a person who has a lived experience of homelessness, which we felt was a very important voice, a, an additional voice to add. Um, but we feel that we've also, um, that there could be capacity for us to bring on someone who has a little more experience with um, policy development and, you know, navigating um, different levels of government and this kind of work. So that would be 14 members or 13 members? 13. 13 total. Mm -hmm. So right now you have 12? Yes. Thank you. Um, so g going over to the um, uh, sewage dumping and Looks like if I could pause you, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Chrome, it looks like we have Megan here. Sorry, we have 13 members currently, so it would be go, oh. it would go up to 14. 14. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what? It sounded like you said you kind of like glanced over. Oh, another year we'll have a dumping area for RVs. I mean, why? Why are we waiting? And why can't we have a dumping area? Why can't we use that even during construction? Why can't we use that particular site? Looks because like we have Ron, Ron I've Francis. talked to a couple of plumbers and they said that would, that doesn't seem like it'd be a difficult thing. We'll go ahead and invite up Ron Prince to answer that question. Feel free, come right forward. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, Ron Prince, City Manager's Office. <clears throat> I'm working with the, uh, the Water Department and I've talked recently to the project manager and we're gonna try to figure out a way <clears throat> to actually create an access point for that. So we're working on that. I don't have a guarantee that we can pull it off based on <clears throat> where the equipment need, needs to stage uh, on the site during construction, but <clears throat> no, I think, you know, I'll, I should have an answer for that in about a week or two. Do you have any idea why we can't use the Yacht Harbor uh, where the RVs dump now in the Yacht Harbor? Yeah, they, they told us that they're, they're at capacity and because we did check into that specifically. Yeah. And they said that there wasn't really an option uh, due to, I guess, the infrastructure, the, the size of the, the lines they have and, and, and whatnot. So they're, they're just keeping that for just a few RVs that I guess that park there or camp there. Thank you very much. And I want to compliment you on the use of trying to get a more comprehensive community engagement program with the Wisdom Council and stuff. Thank you. And thank sure. you for your service. Yeah, thank thank you. you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Unless there aren't any additional questions at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. Mr. Keeley, please come forward. Do you have some additional comments? Madam Mayor, members of City Council, my name is Fred Keeley. Uh, it's been my privilege to serve as essentially the, the presiding officer of the catch. I do not have a vote. The mayor council asked me if I would do this to help in essence manage through the catch's work. Uh, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to an action that the catch took that is not in the report to you, but the catch asked if we would make you aware of their response, and that is this. This goes to the question of the referral that you folks made of the camping ordinance to the catch. Uh, Mr. Condotti, the city attorney, briefed the catch on the Boise case and uh, the degree to which the county, excuse me, the city's ordinance is uh, could be uh, at odds with that. It was a lengthy presentation then the catch at 
the last meeting that they had, which was last week, uh, debated and discussed this issue at length about what you had sent to the catch uh, with regard to the ordinance and asking the catch to return with their thoughts, advice, and counsel at a meeting in January. In that regard, the catch interpreted uh, the information they've received from both from Mr. Condotti as well as folks who uh, spoke to the catch uh, during their meetings to essentially see that the Boise case, which precipitated your desire to have the catch look at the ordinance, uh, the catch is convinced that there are essentially two aspects to that. One is any or this is a layman's interpretation, so I'll try to do it that way, uh, and, and certainly willing to be st to stand corrected on it. It is the catch's understanding that essentially this issue has two component parts to it, that you can have a city ordinance or a county ordinance or a local government ordinance, which defines where and where not you can camp, sleep, uh, et cetera. Uh, the import of the Boise decision seemed to say that the degree to which you can regulate that camping activity corresponds directly to the opportunities truly available for folks to have a place where they can, in fact, camp or be outside, sleep outside, et cetera. So the catch's interpretation and what they wanted me to convey to you is that they're pleased to take on any assignment that you send them. Their thought is twofold. Number one, they would like to be able to come back to you with both parts. Uh, rather than only on the ordinance with both parts, which is to say, if you're going to have an ordinance with, with restrictions and limitations, then where is it that you can be? Uh, that that's what the Boise decision was about. Secondly, that in order for the catch to do its due diligence in that, they are requesting to be able to come back to you in February rather than January, because from their view, we're sort of, they are sort of finished for the year in a sense and will regroup. So if they could have a bit more time, that would be helpful. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Keeley. Okay, well, we can uh, go ahead and revisit any kind of action that we wanna take um, after we open it up to public comment, unless there are any additional questions at this time, we'll go ahead and do that. I'll just, um, remind the community that we have a sort of a unique uh, evening tonight and it was advertised on the agenda that the public comment on this item is gonna be limited considering the fact that tonight's um, evening is really dedicated to the transition of mayor to mayor, to, from mayor to the incoming mayor and vice mayor and we really wanna acknowledge the ceremony of that. Um, you will have opportunities to speak to us on this item in um, future uh, meetings and we respectfully ask that you um, um, remember that and um, and we'll go ahead and maybe reduce the time to 90 seconds tonight so that we can try to get as many people as we can in um, be within that half hour time frame. And we'll go ahead and open up public comment on this item for, uh, for a half hour. And then we're gonna go ahead and close that and return back for council action and deliberation and then move on to the ceremony of the transition from mayor to next mayor. So um, we'll go ahead and invite those who wanna um, speak to us on this item, Councilmember Glover. Motion to um, re kind of uh, bring time back to two minutes and, and have public comment go until there's no one left that wishes to speak. Second. Yeah, there's a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crone. Any further discussion? Yeah. Oh, okay, Councilmember Glover. Yeah, just uh, to speak to it, it seems inequitable, wrong, undemocratic, strange, um, and just inappropriate to be cutting public comment on issues that are incredibly important and that we're gonna be taking action on. There's people here obviously that have come to speak to the issue and I think cutting it prematurely without even knowing how many people are here to speak is rather insulting to the public that came to address us on the item. So that's why I think we should at least give them the opportunity to speak. All those in favor to extend the public comment time, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. So that fails with Councilmember Crone and Glover voting in support. Brown 
Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Myers voting against. So we'll go ahead and stick to the time frame that was originally advertised in hopes that also the community could reach out to us in advance. We'll go ahead and conclude public comment on this item at 8.45, and we'll try to hear from as many people as we can within that time frame. We do welcome to hear from you at additional times and um, definitely recognize that this will likely include uh, recommendations to have additional comments for further items that will come forward. Councilman Brown. If I could just make a quick comment because I didn't make it before the vote. Um, I, I just want to say that um, this item obviously is of critical importance and deliberation on it and uh, the, the council's actions about how to proceed on these items is also critical. Um, however, we did receive notification that um, tonight the agen it's agendized as receiving this report and that um, action to be taken on these items will come to the council for discussion and there will be opportunities for people to to weigh in at that point and and I hope that we agree to move forward on this community engagement process so that uh, where there will be ongoing opportunities so that was my yeah. reasoning for for um, not supporting extension. In general, I really think that people should be able to have their voice heard, especially on this issue, and we need all voices at the table. Right, and I appreciate you providing the additional context. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start at 90 seconds. Um, feel free to go forward. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to show you guys that while I was standing here, someone brought me up some donations of ponchos uh, for the unhoused community. And I'm very grateful for that, but I'm still disgusted with you guys and your lack of um, action. Uh, you're getting ready to take a six week break, it's my understanding, and we still have people that are vulnerable. They're out there on the streets. Their stuff is getting swept on a daily basis. We have no alternatives for people to go. Um, I heard someone say adequate shelter alternatives should be discussed at the same time as the ordinance. I wanna stress adequate, like um, opening up the VFW, providing another 40 beds or something, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna fly, that's not adequate. If you wanna criminalize everybody for acts of survival, you need to have some sort of alternative, you need to have a place for people to go. Shame, you know, shame. You guys are getting ready to go and enjoy the holidays. You had a lot of time. You had a lot of time to make sure that people wouldn't be suffering on the streets and, and they're still gonna be suffering. The bathroom proposal was for six restrooms. It wasn't for two. Keith with Food Not Bombs even found people to pay for them and he only asked for a permit process to allow them to be placed. We know where they're needed. Um, so, you know, not to irritate anybody, but we've known that for a while. That's already kind of been established. I feel like you guys are backtracking. You can do better. You owe it to this community to do better. Meanwhile, I'm working really hard, but I feel like you guys aren't. Thank you. Hi. Should I just start? Yeah. Um, so I'm on the catch. I'm in the community engagement subcommittee. Um, my name is Amy, and I just wanted to add a couple of items to the report, um, one of which is that one of your um, instructions to the catch was to look into the wisdom councils, and that's an ongoing process. It's taking longer than we thought it would take, um, and so that's part of the um, recommendation that we've made to look into facilitation, both in terms of like a contracted person to do community engagement and possibly also a wisdom council. So we're still looking into that. I wanted to let you know. Um, my understanding, I mean, this is a life and death kind of a situation that we're talking about for the population that is sleeping outside at this time. And there's so many assumptions and so much vitriol flying back and forth that I think the community engagement part is really super important. And the staff person that's coming on board um, would probably spend, according to a police department staff, for about 20 hours a week on an extensive, say, six session community engagement process. I just wanna give you a sense of that piece. Um, I also wanna say that on December 17th, our next meeting, um, we have another community engagement, like active session. Um, on camping and safe sleeping. And so eventually you're gonna get to siting and that's when you're really gonna need the community engagement piece. And I think, I just wanna reiterate how important I think that is on this issue. Um, and it's sort of like everyone's, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, my name is Catherine Herndon and I just wanna read four sentences 
from a new book I'm reading from the library called How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi, K-E-N-D-I. It is outstanding, and I've read many books on this subject. This one, it's brilliant and very engaging. I highly recommend it. These sentences do not refer specifically to racism. They are relevant to what we're talking about right here. Americans have long been trained to see the deficiencies of people rather than policy. It's a pretty easy mistake to make. People are in our faces. Policies are distant. We are particularly poor at seeing the policies lurking behind the struggles of people. Please change your policies. Thank you. Phil, Phil Posner, um, I just came back from Mexico. In Mexico, in front of, or next to every uh, toilet area, bathroom, hay personas que se sientan, there are people who sit there and they offer paper and they get a few coins. There are so many opportunities for catch, not, I admit, I think you did a lot of work, but there's so many creative things that Ketch could have considered in terms of the porta potty issues, the bathrooms. I'm, for example, very puzzled why porta potties 24 7, but not a loud bathroom where you could have someone be monitoring it. Lastly, I'm here especially to thank Drew Clover and to wonder how many of you from Ketch and this city council read the impassioned, committed statement that he wrote out of his own personal experience. You are about to, as you have to so often, deal with issues of suffering. In order to know what suffering is, you need to feel it. You need to experience it. That man did, and we owe him a great debt of gratitude. Uh, Nicholas Whitehead, an earlier city council signed on on behalf of the city to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which definitely states that in any country in the world, people have the right to shelter, health care, and, and such. So um, we should be adhering to that. Um, I believe advice was given to certain city council people tonight that making any decisions, important decisions about shelter might violate the Brown Act. The Brown Act is a human creation. I think we have to act on higher principles than that. Um, you know, there was a building available in, in the town for shelter space, but a very high official in your city government told me <clears throat> that that was not going to be used. It was not gonna be opened in the middle of these storms because it was too small to meet the demand. That's a very strange argument to hear. Um, large shelters are inherently dangerous. I, I've been helping a homeless uh, disabled woman and she was attacked in one of the principal shelters in town and her leg was slashed open. You see, it's to do with size. You can't monitor the safety of everybody unless it's real small. Um, another homeless friend of mine, Rory, was arrested three times in one day for trying to seek shelter from the storm under, under a, a, a parking garage. That's, incre that's incredibly crazy. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and ask our next speaker to come forward. You'll have up to um, a minute and a half. I um, respectfully request that those who are in the audience just uh, remember that you'll have your time ideally and um, to give the respect to those who are speaking before us at this time. Go right ahead, you have 90 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna re talk really fast. And thank you guys for doing your presentation. And Fred, that was awesome. And you're super clear about stuff. And I know you guys are a little nervous. So there were a couple things that, I, yeah, you are a little nervous. And so I'm gonna do add a couple of details on it. Um, the bathrooms, um, our committee actually did talk about a spot and one spot by Loudon was something that we had talked about. 
not particularly voted, but it was sort of a conversation we were having. Um, and the 1260 doesn't include damages, but the damages is part of what's being considered for Loudoun. And the, so that number starts getting inflated, but the bathrooms are stored to seeing small. So just to be clear on that. And it's just a pilot program of two to see what sort of damage happens. So maybe we'll do more. Um, and the cost for Loudoun is the 80,000 for cleaning it at lunchtime that the library uses for an external person, but Loudoun has their own maintenance guys. It wouldn't actually be a cost. So just putting out those numbers are a little interesting. Um, the, you guys never voted to actually close the city, the Loudoun bathrooms, and it was something I tried to explain to the catch sort of repeatedly, and as somebody said today with ang being nervous and stuff, that they still think that and that wasn't something that you had said before. Um, uh, please direct, so we have asked for other uh, siting and another program, so we actually need you to direct staff to find it so that it actually becomes happening. Okay. Your time is up. And that's Your it, time I guess. Is up. Thank Thanks you, next anyway. speaker. Please come forward, you'll have up to 90 seconds. All right, how are you guys doing today? I'm Cena Roach, I'm on the catch committee. Um, I've been slacking the last couple of weeks. I've been having some personal issues. Um, when the catch first started, uh, you guys brought up the uh, opening up the Loud Nelson bathrooms and I distinctly remember that. I brought that up a few times in the catch and I see that it was not dealt with the way that it should have been dealt with. Um, and so there I proceeded to go ahead and bring in a sign that said the bathrooms were closed and brought in pee bottles for everybody. And I understand that that was probably not health-wise, but I mean, that's what happens when you can't go pee. You have to go pee outside in a bottle. And I supplied everybody with a bottle. And it's really simple, open the bathrooms. It would not have been an anonymous, uh, or not an anonymous, but a, a, a na anonymous vote had my presence been there had I known that it was going to be voted on at that meeting, I would have made my presence there. Um, I'm going to stick to opening up the Loudon Nelson bathrooms. There's no reason it sh they shouldn't be open whatsoever. Why can't they follow the protocol of what the library is doing? It's really simple. It's just open the bathrooms. They have, they have people there that clean already. You could have somebody standing there holding their IDs while they're using their restrooms or their personal property long enough for them to take a leak. Not get loaded, but take a leak. It's not difficult. Open up the Loudon Nelson bathrooms for everybody, period. That's all I got. Speaker. Members of the community, thank you and members of the city council. Catch offers n no survival assistance as the worst weather hits, just ideas for the city manager to put on a future agenda after the winter toll of suffering when council returns to second Tuesday in January. Catch says two portable toilets. We say, and I suspect I speak for Huff, open the damn bathrooms and parks, Loudon Nelson, and set up immediate porta potties at survival encampments. Common sense, as NIMBYs use cops and rangers to chase homeless around the city, stealing their survival gear as they go, move the porta potties as well to each encampment so that you keep things as clean as possible. Catch says, continue the costly River Street campground. I say, spend 99,000 per month on 1,000 to 2,000 homeless people outside, not just 60 people. Catch says, open a winter shelter. I say, more talk and a little late. Winter is here and council's retiring to its warm bedrooms. Catch says, relocate shuttle pickup site to an indoor sheltered location. We say, open the parking garages for shelter throughout the winter. Demand the police lay off and stop moving people into the rain. Catch says, one RV sewage dumping site. We say, sure, and stop harassing RVs whose only crime is parking on public streets. For anyone who really cares, support direct action groups like Food Not Bombs, Warming Center, Day Nair Shelter, and the Santa Cruz Homeless Union. Give directly to homeless people themselves. Your time Keep is your up. ears perked for the next mass survival encampment. Your time and is support up. individual camps now. No, time we know up. your time is up, yes. and we thank God for that. Yep. Okay. okay, next speaker. All right, we're gonna go ahead and remind the community that this is an opportunity for us to have public comment. 
Um, we may not agree with anything that, and frankly, I don't agree with some of the things that are said, but we have an opportunity to hear and we will respectfully listen to them because that is our democratic process. I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you adhere to our rules of decorum, whether you agree or disagree with the person who's speaking to you, speaking to us. We're gonna go ahead and conclude public comment at 845. You'll have 90 seconds and we'll try to hear as many people as we can within that time frame, please. Hi, Brent Adams of the Warming Center Program. Um, I, I love the possibility of community engagement, a community study group. Um, you are from the community, community, but it's really hard for me to meet with you all and present uh, what we're up to. I'm a citizen and we looked at the void of homelessness and people dying outside and I started the Warming Center program. We're six years, we just did 90 people. <laughs> I'll say it again, 90 people slept on our floor last week. That's 90 people who didn't have to sleep out in the pouring rain. That's what community members did. We had 25 volunteers the night before, 25 volunteers. The night before that, 20, that's 75 volunteers. That's community. Um, another need, storage. We have 250 people on our shel shelves right now. We place that in a neighborhood. When we talk about the difficulty of siting porta potties, I think we're exper experienced in how to site things. I, so we have a lot of community engagement, but what I want to reflect is this group uh, seemed seemingly a, a, a fixture of the, the city manager's office. There's city managers in, in the room. Um, I've been trying to present to this group for months. I have been denied. I'm not quite sure why. As somebody who runs a nonprofit, serves homeless po the population, sure, they're, they're meeting with all the major players who are city uh, partners, but when we want to really look at what's happening within the community, what the community can step up and do, here are the community members denying community members. I, so I really hope that we can make an on honest presentation to this group about something that's really happening in the, in the community. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm one of the little people around here, homeless, and that man has done an amazing, amazing thing for me, and I appreciate it. Um, the city council here, I don't know about all y'all. Have you ever slept on the street? Try it one day from nine o'clock to five o'clock. Figure out where you're gonna get your Starbucks. Figure out where you're gonna get a pair of socks. Figure out where you're gonna take a shower. One day, I challenge all y'all to try it one day. The things that you're used to, figure it out. Live one day in our shoes, just one day. One 24-hour day. And please, be kind. Because all us homeless people, we can all get it together and pour our money together and get a place to live and whatever. But you people are, are just like high and mighty and whatever. One 24-hour day. Figure it out. It's hard. And that could ha happen to your child. Your child may end up homeless someday. You one paycheck away from homelessness. And thank you, Drew. You're amazing. Thank you, Brent. Next speaker. I agree with everything she just said. But being vile and having social media bullying like the homeless union, union is here does not do anyone any good for any homeless person. So if you want to stand up for the homeless people, be a good person and do not speak bad, put pictures of people's homes and family, you've got to be a viable person. So you want to get our support? Be a good person. That's all I have to say. Alicia Kuehl needs to watch what she says, what she does on the internet. Everyone else, all these people, you cannot put us down. You think just because we own homes and we own businesses and we own things, you think we're rich? We're not rich. We are struggling just as hard as you are. And if you get online and you post pictures of 
people's families and their children, you are no one to look up to. Next speaker. Next speaker. Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and see if our sergeant of arms wants to go ahead and interrupt that. This is not an opportunity for any of that. Okay, okay. Why don't we go ahead? And, all right, we're gonna go ahead and ask that we adhere to our rules of decorum. You'll have an opportunity. To, okay. All right, Alicia, I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you keep your voice down. You're gonna have an opportunity to speak to the council at that time. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we're gonna go ahead and, and count that as a disruption. We're gonna go ahead and ask that you have an opportunity. You're next in line, you'll have your chance, you'll have your 90 seconds. You already spoke. Oh, you already spoke, forgive me, never mind. You already had your opportunity to speak. So we're gonna hear from anybody else within the next 15 minutes. All right, you'll have your chance to speak in 90 seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and ask that we respect our fellow citizens in speaking to us at this time. I wanna thank the members of the catch. I think that they are really working hard to to address complex issues, as they said, and to bring a lot of very different opinions together. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because of the time limit, so I just will speak rather relatively fast. Um, Mr. Fred Keeley is a great facilitator. Um, however, he has said he is not supposed to address comment content. He is absolutely forbidden to address content, and in fact, he was here tonight addressing content in front of you all. The reason I'm very concerned about this is that we need to have an absolutely neutral facilitator. A lot of times assumptions are a way to bring in content. Two thirds of a vote is a super majority. This is very hard to get. It is actually quite undemocratic. I, I prefer in terms of democracy, a straight 51% majority to 50%. Public comment should be in the minutes of catch because it is a community group. The group was created to bring in the community. Public comment uh, has been pushed to the end to make it more difficult for, un for sheltered people, uh, excuse me, people in shelters to attend. Not that that was the point, but it makes it difficult for people who need to get to back to shelters to attend, and it also leaves the shelter po people in shelters out. Staff person should not, this new staff person should not be another volunteer. I wanna say that a person who's homeless needs a sleeping bag like this. Nothing <laughs> but this will even begin to keep somebody from getting hypothermia okay. at night. Thanks, Elisa. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. They also Thanks. need a mat and they also need a tarp. All right. Please come forward. Hello. Um, I want to just sort of bring something up that I think gets ignored in these conversations um, because everyone sort of spends their time trying to get people to care about people who are homeless and in situations worse than them. And frank if, frankly, appealing to human decency doesn't always work. I just wanna remind everyone that with climate change and natural disasters, anyone could be homeless at any moment. So even if you don't care about other people, out of self-preservation, you might wanna start thinking about long-term survival shelters in the city. <laughs> Mr. Graham. Please come forward. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. I'd like to commend uh, Councilperson Glover on actually going through with the challenge and spending a night outdoors um, and coming to an understanding of what, what the struggle is that people are going through. Um, when the catch first, uh, you were first talking about this before, you voted on it, I recommended that this group go through the other commissions that have been brought together on homelessness and look at the recommendations those groups had and pick one or two of them and implement them immediately. Well, that didn't happen. Anyway, um, as far as more shelter goes, there's the, uh, guard, the armory. I ran into Joe Hall at the uh, Thanksgiving dinner and he told me that there's not even a reserve unit in Santa Cruz anymore. So I'm not understanding why the armory's off the table. He told me that Gavin Newsom could open it. So I'd like Fred, because he's probably got Gavin's phone number, to call Gavin and ask him to open the armory. Thank you. 
Hi, Mayor Watkins. I was the one who yelled the loudest for you at the Women's March. <laughs> I thought you were progressive. I, apparently you're contra, contra progressive. And I wonder if Koch or you have thought about criminalization. America has 600% more women prisoners than the world's average. 500% overall. So have you considered releasing 80% of city and county prison prisoners before you make one more law to criminalize people? Ask Angela Davis. She says we should get rid of all prisons. The county jails are not humane. They're cruel, they're unusual, they can be torture. You lose weight, you're cold, you're mistreated, you're not loved. Warrants for people for sleeping is contra-progressive. Ask Angela. Thank you. All right, next speaker. City Council members, Mayor, thank you. Um, and thank you for your time. Um, I was super optimistic about the CATCH program being able to bring together all these disparate, um, our population. And I'm, uh, it's really distressing for me to see the um, personal attacks that are happening and the pointing of the fingers and there, there seems to be a lot of the same things that I heard a year ago being discussed that are still on the table and still not resolved and I get it that it's like super complicated and there are no easy answers but, but I agree that the emergency shelters really need to be at the top of the list. People should not be subject to hypothermia in any community, especially ours, we have, we have such a wealthy community. And so to have people sleeping on the streets, you know, in every doorway, like has been said, it's, in my opinion, it's unforgivable. And as a housed person, I don't have the answer. I feel extremely fortunate that I was able to get in when I did, and I'm hanging on just barely. I would have been at the catch meetings if it wasn't for like health issues, but I really, I feel like that needs to continue to happen and to expand. And if you can bring in more community members, I would suggest maybe having the meetings at the homeless shelters so that people can be involved. And, um, and I would ask the, the public to just stop being hostile. All right. Are there any last uh, members of the community who want to address us on this item who haven't already? A few more minutes for public comment. Okay. Seeing them, we're going to go ahead and return back to council at this time for um, action. Um, essentially, what I understand, and I'll feel free to have our city attorney clarify any further, is our, um, our sort of the choices before us are essentially to receive the report as well as the presentation from our chairs, co-chairs. Thank you for being here and doing that, as well as to um, direct any additional items as it relates to some of the recommendations to be placed on a future um, agenda those actions will not be taken at this time. Is that correct, City Attorney Kandati? Yes, the agenda <coughs> description is very specific. <clears throat> um, maybe counter to what people would like to happen at this evening, but the Brown Act requires a brief general description of each item of business to be transacted or discussed. The two items uh, of potential council action listed on your agenda this evening are receiving a report and oral presentation by catch co-chairs Candace Elliott and Taj Leahy, and two, direct the city manager to place catch action items on one or more city council agendas for action as appropriate and as soon as possible. <laughs> so essentially what that means is the council can't take action that a member of the public having read the agenda and considered what actions were contemplated uh, would not be on notice of uh, this evening. 
Okay, thank you for that. Um, so once we have our uh, deliberations and um, we're concluding this um, item, I will um, just sort of for process, I want to explain to those in the audience, if you're sitting in a um, uh, one of the seats or sort of the rows there that have a reserve sign on it, we're gonna go ahead and take a five minute break after we conclude this item. I'm gonna go ahead and ask those who are sitting in those two front rows um, to move back if you'd like to stay for the ceremony portion. Those rows are, uh, uh, essentially reserved for family members um, as it relates to the next item, which is our ceremony and the transition of the mayor. So um, just kind of wanted to give you a heads up about that. We'll have a five minute break after we conclude this item. Right now we have um, a directive to take action as described by our city attorney. We'll go ahead and hear from Councilmember Glover and then I'll go ahead and acknowledge Councilmember Brown. Thanks, you know, something struck me this afternoon <clears throat> when we started our afternoon session, because for those that aren't with us normally on afternoon sessions, we start by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, which I have mixed feelings about for various reasons, but uh, one of the, 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 the last few words really stuck out to me with, with liberty and justice for all. And I thought it was really interesting, especially because we were gonna be having this conversation tonight around homelessness and really asking this body as well as the community, what do those words mean? Uh, what is the point of starting our meetings with making this pledge if we fail time and time again to achieve <laughs> liberty and justice for all or even seemingly make any movement towards that? Now this report tonight can totally be perceived as movement. So it's wonderful and I thank the catch again for their time, energy and volunteerism to make it possible. But in the agendizing of this issue, why, and this is an, a question that I'd love an answer to, why would it be agendized for us not to be able to take action on it? It seems, especially as we are as has been said uh, in the very beginning of winter, which we've already seen our first big storm, and that the city council is about to go on a six week vacation where none of us are unhoused, so we're all going to go and as was mentioned, sit in our warm homes while people literally struggle on the street. Why is this agenda item not up for uh, action? And then, uh, you know, the, the woman that came to speak to the, at, the, at the podium that thanked me, that was because she called me the Saturday after Thanksgiving. She's 62 and retired, soaked to the bone, huddled outside of a, the subway on Pacific Avenue, calling me literally sounding like she was about to die uh, without any access to food or uh, sh shelter or warm clothing to be able to transition into. There was a distribution by Food Not Bombs, which this city has failed to support consistently, and the homeless union and the warming center. So I called all three of those representatives and through their leadership, we were able to get her up out of the rain into Alicia Cool's RV, taken over to Food Not Bombs where she was able to get fed and donated warm supplies. But why on a Saturday after Thanksgiving, <laughs> props to them, props to them. So why, on a, why is it that I as a council member on a Saturday after Thanksgiving am I receiving phone calls from 62 year old women in the freezing rain because we don't have adequate shelter to be able to provide for her? That is abhorrent and unethical and immoral in so many ways and yet we have this agenda item with a committee that's been working since July to bring us these recommendations and yet we know what the recommendations are gonna be because they're provided to us in the agenda report but instead of having an agenda item that we can move on, we can't move on them. And then additionally we heard, you know, this was like the icing on the cake and I love that he did this. So props to Rick Martinez. I don't think he's here right now but props to Rick Martinez. He, for those that weren't watching, had his retirement speech today because he's leaving the city after like 30 years of service and he's a, a good guy, I, I really appreciate him. And he used that time at the podium to encourage us to break away from the NIMBY narrative and stop using political self-interest that has stopped, uh, stopped us from providing necessary resources to people that need it. So why, again, I, I ask for those that built the agenda, for those that wrote the agenda report and decided on this item tonight, why are we not able to take action on it? Whose idea was that? 
Well, I mean, I can go ahead and see if there's any city staff here that wants to speak to that or if any of the um, city mem city uh, staff who's been staffing this process want to address sort of the process as to why it came forward in this way. My understanding it was to be brought forward as an update and with sort of a summary of recommendations that we can accept and then we can agendize for action if we so choose and agree with the cash. And so um, for me, in terms of the process, that's sort of how it was described to me. But if anybody wants to elaborate more from our city manager's office, you're welcome to uh, do sure. so. Uh, that's correct. The purpose of the item, what was scheduled was an update from the cash. That's what's been on our uh, items for council uh, agendas for some time. And, <coughs> and they had uh, scheduled that and they had worked hard to, to bring forward an update to you. Uh, and, and recommendation. So that was the intent of the item and that's been the intent of the item for, for some time. Uh, now the report, uh, I believe, was written uh, by the, the uh, cash committee members and, and with the assistance of staff. Uh, so there was, the report was written uh, by them. Um, and, uh, but again, I think the purpose really was to provide an update and also recognizing that some of the items or recommendations require additional work and so to be able to really move on them requires that they come back to you in any case. So I think that was that was the other consideration. It was sort of a practical consideration uh, in addition to the fact that it was an update. Okay. I just think it sends a very troubling message. Uh, and whether, I don't, I don't know whether this was the catch's intention. I mean, maybe you or the staff members associated with writing the report can kind of enlighten me as to why uh, this was not written for action of any, so for the immediate, just for example, the immediate items, which are the things that need to happen right now, why are those not agendized for action? Well, it seems that you've heard the response from no, the No, from the city manager. I appreciate that, Mayor, but I'm asking that because that was deferred to the staff and the catch that wrote it. So now I'm curious to the catch and the staff, why? Why are we doing this? Well, it looks like we have Fred Keeley who wants to speak to this, item, this process. You'll have to excuse me. It's just, uh, it is incredibly troubling that it, I, some of these recommendations I brought forward in February. So the fact that it's gone through this whole process and now we're at the last meeting of the year before a six week break and we're not even able to move on them. So can you explain to me, Fred? Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council, council member Glover, uh, thank you. Uh, the catch serves uh, at your wishes, uh, you established them, you asked for reports uh, as quickly as possible on those things uh, that you may want to take action on. And in drafting the report, the catch wanted to bring to your attention a large number of items. Absolutely. It is really it, the view of the co-chairs and the catch, and I am simply, as you know, <laughs> trying to uh, process and help on facilitation. It was the intent of the body to get those in front of you for your consideration and deliberation. How you as the council choose to operationalize or not operationalize any particular recommendation is beyond the purview of the catch. Mm. So what they were trying to do, uh, I always say they, <laughs> because it is the catch rather than, than myself, is what they were trying to do is respond in a timely manner to exactly what you had asked. How things happen in, in essence for action in front of the council if you will, if I can use this phrase, is above our pay grade, if you will. Right. So what we were trying to do is get well thought through or what the catch thought was well thought through set of recommendations for you. How you handle those uh, is your business, is how we saw it, rather than us presuming that it was the catch's business. So that was how that report was structured that way and presented to you that way. Absolutely, um, and I appreciate that, Fred, and thank you thank for you, your vol volunteering and help to facilitate it. Um, I think it doesn't seem like I'm receiving the, the answer to the question is that why is it made and written in a way that we can't take action on it tonight? I get that the catch wrote their report with that inclination, but what is it that stopped those that were reviewing it? Because I'm not involved in the agenda setting process because we have a very closed and restrictive agenda setting process and this is the second time that's come up this evening or this, during these meetings, but why were the people that were involved in that process not proactive in making sure that we could take action on these items, even if it was putting together another agenda report saying to analyze and move on catch recommendations. 
I guess I see our city attorney ready to speak on this. I will just say this is the opportunity to make a motion to agendize whatever you want in terms of the direction you want to have in terms of action. In six weeks. And or to schedule a special meeting if you'd like. It depends on how you get the votes. So that's how that works. Um, if you want to speak to the process beyond gonna, that, you're welcome to I was do going so. to say that I, <clears throat> um, it would be speculation for me to uh, opine on why the agenda description was written the way it was. I suspect um, that the intention probably was not to restrict the council from taking any action tonight. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that, but, um, but I have to deal with the technical uh, compliance with the Brown Act and making sure that the public has adequate notice of the actions of business that are going to come before the city council. And just to echo what the mayor just said, um, how quickly the council moves forward on one or more of these recommendations is really up to the council. Yeah. And so we're at within the, time the constraints of the Brown Act. So we're at the time now where we're really to um, either to receive the recommendation. We we thank you for bringing your work forward to us at this time and this evening um, to um, consider some of the recommendations that you're proposing. We have before us come at a future meeting for action. And now's the time to receive a motion if we'd like um, to move anything forward, Mr. Bernal. And just just to add a little bit more. The many of the recommendations that are before you are things that we're actively working on as well, so they're consistent with, uh, so it's not gonna hold up. Like for example, we're working on uh, additional alter, uh, shelter capacity, we're working on a uh, River Street shelter. Uh, and so uh, we will continue to work on these things. And so the delay, you know, there shouldn't be a major delay in, in implementing some of the major implementations and, and others require the, the cashier's work as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have Council Member Brown and then Council Member Ryan. Thank you. Um, so, that was, uh, thank you, uh, um, Martin, for bringing this up because that's actually a question that I wanted to ask. Get, you know, I am very concerned about the fact that we um, are not, that we have not expanded our shelter capacity and um, we are looking at a cold and probably very rainy winter. I mean, it, the deluge began as we were finishing our last council meeting and it went through that, that whole weekend and I thought about that every day. We did nothing and um, people were left out in the cold and in the rain and you know we're not taking action. So it is very much on my mind. Um, and so I wanted to ask the question and maybe you can just tell, say a little bit more about um, what may happen in the interim before we are able to take action again with respect to uh, shelter capacity. I know that there have been some discussions and I, I just like to, to better understand what might happen between now and our first meeting in January with respect to that. Um, another question I have is about, uh, if I could just put them out there, um, uh, our, um, I made a motion to um, include, to, to fund the warming center to provide some uh, interim or some you know, fu funding to, uh, some immediate funding to allow the warming center to operate its program. As um, Mr. Adams suggested, they are um, preventing hypothermia and by providing uh, indoor place for people to be um, almost all volunteer. And I know that that kind of morphed into having a discussion with the county about um, jointly supporting the program. Um, my intention there was um, not to cause any undue delay in this from the city's end. And so I'm wondering if you can uh, just say something about the, you know, the possibility of moving forward with what I believe was the intent of my, uh, my motion to get that funding to the warming center so they can operate. Um, it, it, this would be $10,000 for like now or whenever we can release the funding, uh, pending some obviously um, dealing with the logistics through April, through the winter. I mean, this is the time period. So if we wait and to sort it all out, the winter's going to be over. And the intention was to just provide some funding. So if I could get a response on that. And then thirdly, um, thank you, Mr. Keeley, for um, representing the position of the catch on our recommendation regarding the um, how to deal with the camping ban. And um, because that is exactly what I have been hoping that this body would do. And we'd love to have the catch's help in helping us move forward in that way. And so I'm wondering, given that was kind of a request and our last direction was 
to come back in January. Um, we had initially initially said just refer it, and then based upon an inter a discussion with staff, staff said, you know, we, we really need to move forward as quickly as possible. Um, if the catch is telling us they need till February, can we act on that net tonight and just say yes, February? You know, we can. Is that possible to do? What you may do is direct that an item be placed on a future agenda. So you previously directed that the camping ordinance be brought back to the council for consideration at your second meeting in January. Um, you may modify that to direct that it be brought back at a later meeting. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Did you want to speak to the- Sure, sure. With respect to um, your other two questions. So uh, the staff per council direction uh, has been feverishly working on identifying and trying to put in place additional uh, shelter capacity. And uh, the direction from council was to uh, work with the, the county, uh, request to submit to the county. They responded with uh, uh, an interest in assisting and working with on doing that. And so we have been really spending the majority of our time really doing that, uh, looking at uh, uh, essentially uh, options uh, that are available to us, including the VFW, uh, the armory, uh, and doing all the due diligence that's required to make those things happen. So that is our focus, and uh, uh, we are proceeding and hope to have something uh, open up as soon as possible. So we feel like there's uh, uh, some uh, uh, options that are available to us, uh, and we're working on uh, figuring out all the, the options for that, uh, and we'll bring that back to council um, as, as, as soon as we can, and as soon as we have the, the uh, information and everything that we need to be able to move forward. Um, so that has been the priority, and I think we, we, we definitely feel pretty confident that we can get something going here <coughs> during the winter um, session, uh, this, this winter. Uh, with respect to uh, the warming center, uh, council also did ask us to look to work with the county on whether they would be interested in helping to fund that. Um, I believe um, we are, we've reached out, um, but have not, uh, and then council also said, uh, that if uh, the council is in addition, you wanted to uh, uh, move forward uh, as well. And so we would have to bring that back to you as well. Okay. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Glover. Um, Tony, correct me if I'm gonna go off the wrong direction here, but I'd like to make a motion to direct staff to move forward immediately with item number four in the cash report, number six, number three, and number one, with number one um, reporting back with proposed locations and conducting necessary outreach, and to request the catch provide their input regarding the cap camping ordinance on date certain, the February 11th council meeting. I direct staff, Tony, versus? To move the, forward on bringing those items back to the city council for action. Right, That's would be, that would be the, that, that would be the, the, I mean. Yes. Okay, I'll go ahead and second the mo motion. Council member Glover and then council member Matthews. And just regarding. Well, council member Glover and then council member oh. Matthews. Thank you. Uh, so just to understand that motion, was it all of them? Because you went through different numbers, but is there one on there that you don't want staff to agendize or bring back at a future meeting? You wanna repeat the motion? Yeah, if you could just repeat the numbers. Right, so for the immediate, which I would place as our next council meeting, um, but in, with the understanding that staff is actually working on many of these items, actually number five, I believe was completed today, as far as I understand from the Board of Supervisors. Um, and then I believe number two is sort of a decision <coughs> point. Um, so that leaves us with number one, which is the ADA toilets, toilet, portable toilets. Number three, number four, and number six. And with the addition of um, camping ordinance coming back as well. Okay. Um, in terms of number seven, um, 
And number eight, I'm understanding that um, the subcommittee has a, some additional work to do. So uh, I'm, I'm a, I believe the cash is supposed to come back to us again in February, is that correct? Uh, I believe it's mid-January. Mid-January, mm -hmm. okay. So if there's more, if there's <clears throat> more um, direction in terms of especially number eight proposal, then we could move that forward in mid-January. Unfortunately, I think that's part of, we're sort of in this framework tonight. So um, I'd like to see something move forward. I know it's. I think you could uh, direct staff to put in place or to put in motion um, a process necessary to bring those items back for council action. So. And, and if I could, essentially what I'm hearing um, as the proposal, which is, of um, mirroring a lot of what is right. before us on this screen. Yes. And for the communities, uh, if, if we want to display that. So I in put in, in terms of putting in motion, I would like to basically, th that staff should actively and immediately begin working on these and bring them back. Okay, okay well, uh, thank you for that clarity. Um, in that case, then I'm going to make a substitute motion to uh, approve action and provide guidance uh, on the nine catch recommendations, save the ones that have already been completed or are no longer relevant to come back at the first meeting in January. That's what my motion was. No, I'll, I'll, well, uh, excuse me, I, I, I believe I uh, miss, or, or let me rephrase that. What I understood you say was that there are some in here that are important, but maybe we should push like seven and eight or eight and nine back I'd really like it to be holistic where all of them are gonna come back for action and implementation uh, on the, the first meeting in January and move the um, and move the conversation of the camping ordinance to the second meeting in February or something like that. Because the way that you, at least the way I heard it and the way it was framed was that it was kind of unclear as to which ones are coming back the first of January. So I just wanna either, you can confirm that that's in your motion, they're all supposed to come back the first meeting in January, save the camping ordinance in February, or I'll make that alternative motion, or substitute motion. Can you confirm that? If I could maybe interject, my understanding is I think really the, um, there's a lot of alignment uh, with interest by Councilmember Glover and by the proposed motion Councilmember Myers made. The exception is essentially incorporating nine as to um, kind of the higher priority for feedback or response to. Is that an, an eight given? But I think that was referenced as an interest area, knowing that there still needs to be a little bit of work done. So I think we're really close to seeing eye to eye here. Yeah, yeah, that's why I would just want to, if, if uh, the motion can specify that all of them are supposed to come back in the first meeting in January for us to take action on, except for the campaign ordinance in February, then sure, that's great. Otherwise, I'm gonna put forward a substitute motion. Okay. And you can, can you confirm that? Um, it looks like City Manager Martin Brunel wants to speak a little bit. I, I just wanted to clarify. I think, I think the only reason why they wouldn't come back in July is simply because the catch January. needs to do some work before that's they, what I mean, I'm sorry, in July, January, is because the catch needs to do some work before they come back to you. I think that's the, that's the constraint. It's not, I think the immediate ones would come back in January because that's what they're recommending, but the others, uh, they want to do some work and then bring back, bring that back to you. And that is their recommendation. That was my understanding was that which is why it would Based be on the report tonight from the cash that eight, eight specifically, and it sounds like nine is in process. It may or may not be ready, but it, it certainly is. If if it is ready, we could we could hear it. But I just want to make sure that I'm not creating um, a report back that says we need more time. I'm trying to just respect what the cash said tonight, which it sounded like eight, the subcommittee was still working on the, the actual community outreach approach. Number nine initially was described as having potentially it being a year away, but we got a report from um, staff that that, might, that timeline might shorten. Um, so my intent is to try to move what I think is the most immediate recommendations from the catch and make sure that our staff does not stop working on these, but that we are able to receive these um, and accept them or provide further guidance at our, at our first meeting in January. So um, especially um, with regards to, to siting and 
and other outreach as necessary to, to make these things as successful as possible. I hope that's clarify, clarifying a little bit about the intent. Sure. Yes, yeah, specifically with regard <laughs> to item number eight, um, we were looking to have the funding allocated. Um, so that could, if you are comfortable with the catch deciding the method of uh, community engagement and can allocate the funding to us, then you could move forward with that item at this time. If you would like for us to present to you what the community engagement would look like, then yes, we would need more time for that. My intent would be the latter in my motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and that I think reflects what I think is brought before us as well. Okay, Councilmember Matthews, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Brown. Um, I too think number eight is not ripe for allocation. And some of the margin notes that I wrote down are um, how to structure it, um, uh, what's the end goal, who are the audiences. Engagement can just mean a whole lot of things. And there will have to be engagement on many of these individual proposals as well. So uh, I would like um, comprehensive deep dive is still vague in my mind. So I think work on that. And really what's the purpose, who's engaged, what's the process and what's the end point. Um, regarding number six, which is recommending a catch, um, add a member with cash discerning, determining the nomination criteria. It's been interesting to see that the whole catch um, uh, advisory group has morphed quite a bit from what uh, was originally designated by council. Um, there was a whole selection process by council looking for a certain range of diversity. And then after that, two more individuals with lived homeless experience or experiencing homelessness were added. And then this is another one. So it, I mean, personally, I would rather to take a step back and you said a couple of people have left, you know who they are, <laughs> but we don't. So I'd kind of like to see, given the original intent of setting up cash, uh, who's serving on it now? What are the um, attributes that they bring to it? Certainly, what do you feel you're missing right now that you'd like to fill in some blanks? But I would frankly like that to come back to the, to the council if there are gonna be added members. I think it's the council's decision, frankly. That was the, in, that was the um, <coughs> original impetus for setting up the cash. So it's kind of a mid-course adjustment. So I would prefer to not um, um, give that one the sign off. That's number six. Um, it does <laughs> seem to me that number nine, if <laughs> if amazingly we are we, that, and that's the um, the uh, sewage dumping site. If that is miraculously a week away from a solution, um, it seems a shame to have that wait a really long time. Um, and I don't know, city manager, um, if you th feel there's um, possibility of taking action on that in the interim. It's a question. Uh, wh which, which item? That's the sewage, sewage dumping, dumping site. site. Oh, um, I think that's, uh, maybe Ron can answer it, that it question, be, I think. It may be a surprisingly near solution, and yet it may not. But okay. it, for the I, think, I think in general, we, we're definitely very interested in doing that. There is a need for that. So I yeah. think, uh, you know, I, I think from the staff perspective, trying to do that is something we're very interested in doing. So we would proceed with doing that as quickly mm -hmm. as possible, for sure. Rob, before maybe you go ahead and give your response in the interest of trying to get us moving forward with this, well, there was I'm maybe sorry, a potential, no, 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 I just want to ensure like, so there was a potential to maybe have a friendly amendment to the original motion that instead of the cash identifying an additional member, that that would come before a council subcommittee for consideration. Is that correct? or correct characterization of what you're suggesting. It was, a, was a council subcommittee that set up that the, the cash? It was, yes. yeah. And okay. I would accept that. Yeah, I, I, I do, do think it's important to try to continue the, the breadth the of, yeah. of uh, okay. and as the second people on the couch. Well. couch. Okay, so that's a friendly amendment that's been accepted by the maker of the motion. Okay, please run, go right ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say that uh, I, I'll be working, actually, we're working on all these yeah, simultaneously, yeah. and almost every one of them, with the exception of perhaps two, to, in order to be successful, are gonna take some public engagement. <clears throat> mm -hmm, yes. Some of it's gonna be small and quick. Sure. Some of these will obviously take much longer. <clears throat> so we are working 
on every one of these. <clears throat> so with just a couple of exceptions, and, and there's certainly the, the RV dump station, I'll be able to find out quickly okay. about that. And the intent of the catch was if this didn't work out, they'd like to have some other <clears throat> location. So yeah, I'm, I'm working on every one of these with catch, <clears throat> but public engagement's critical mm -hmm. if it's gonna mm -hmm. uh, succeed. Sure, thank you, Ron. Okay, great. Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilor Brown. I think one thing that maybe we're not really you know, reflecting back on in the recommendation is that um, the second part of this recommendation is to direct the city manager to place catch items on one or more of the city council agendas for action as appropriate mm -hmm. and as soon as possible. And I think that um, what might work is whether it might be good for the mayor to work with the city manager given that, um, you know, we have, there are a lot of items that we previously wanted to come back at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to really think about right now in this moment, what items are coming back on that agenda. And given that we've been trying to do a better job of, um, you know, like managing the time of our agendas that p putting all these items on the first agenda in January, and given the fact that some of these items as well need more outreach, that by creating this flexibility, by having these items come back as appropriate and as soon as possible, that we are working within the spirit of trying to get all these, the, the items that need to come back immediately on the next agenda, the ones that need more outreach, providing enough time for the members of the catch to do that outreach. And then with respect, and I think with respect to um, the, um, the item related to the camping ordinance, I would wonder if there might be um, a friendly amendment would be to have it come on or before the second meeting in February, which allows the flexibility for it to come either earlier, but no later than that second meeting in February. Fine with that. Okay. So and there's um, a friendly <coughs> amendment to incorporate the um, uh, ordinance language and cash input on that, as well as the SOPs that accompany that um, to come back before the council um, on or before the second meeting in February. Um, just really want to respect the intent between behind what Vice Mayor Cummings had just said, that within the recommendation is to work with the city manager to place the cash action items on one or more city council agendas for action as appropriate and as soon as possible. And that might vary depending on where we are with things. And so um, for management of meetings and opportunity for really trying to access those coming forward as best appropriate, that makes the most sense. Mr. Keeley, did you feel like you needed to add to this? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I would call the council's attention to the following concept. The report, uh, each one of the items is presented in a, in a very uniform format. What problem are they trying to solve? What is that solution? Uh, how much might it cost and so on? One of the reasons that the catch structured the recommendations to the way that they are is this, that although folks experiencing homelessness happens in the city, it is the catch's view that not all issues associated with that are the city's responsibility. That some are the city, some are the county, some are the state government, some of the federal government, and what they're trying to do simultaneously is get up to speed about which belong to whom. And so uh, one of the ideas about when you schedule it is that you could see from the catches report, uh, here is an issue that may solely be the responsibility of the city. Well, then that's going to follow a certain path to get to you with analysis and so on. Many of them, however, are, uh, the catch views are joint responsibilities, if you will. City has some, county has some, standing in the shoes of the state government, the health and human services and so on. So that's why, uh, partially why, uh, the recommendations are structured that way, but also why you may need, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to tell you what you may need to do. Uh, it may be important to then collaborate with those other levels of government. So you're doing your part, but they're doing their part. So when I, items come before you for action, you get your share of the responsibility in essence. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we had a, did you have, I think we had a clarifying question. If I, and I'm trying to remember who I had. I, did Councilor so Brown, did the, you have additional? And then I had Councilor Myers and Councilor Glover. The question about the uh, camping ordinance return was that clarified. I accepted that. Was, that. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, Councilmember Myers and Councilmember Bennett and Councilmember Matthews. Question about um, recommendation number four, which is additional um, low barrier ADA accessible emergency shelter. There is a an estimated cost. So I think one of the things I'm we've got both action items and then within those action items we also have budget estimates. So I'm mean, it's it's sort of a little bit confusing the presentation in terms of how to so in the my intent in the motion would be that if a shelter did become available, um, assuming that this cost is within our budget this year, that we wouldn't not open that shelter for six more weeks. So I mean, I I, I mean I think that's our intent, correct? I mean, we if, if we can get a shelter open in the next couple weeks, we will get that shelter open. Is that, is that, Tony, is that appropriate? Do I need to make, if, this if, is a very kind of difficult situation because we sort of can make a motion, but we can't really make a motion. But you know, let me just, if I could, maybe right. Tony, if I, if I can, you know, two weeks ago, we actually did prioritize that for right. staff. So I don't know if that, this is complimentary and it's encompassed in here, but you've already had direction from the council to move forward with seeking al additional winter shelter. Yeah. At, at a, so we've already made that motion and given that right, direction. Is that correct? Okay, so that's the direction that's already I been provided. I just wanna clarify Thank for the for public that. so that it's clear that if a shelter opportunity was to be able to be negotiated sooner before you know we we reconvene in january that that shelter opportunity would be pursued is that correct yes although i want to point out that as mr keely pointed out that uh, particularly for with this and one we have partners that we have right. to work with also with so right so they have their processes we have our processes and so yeah that would be the that's the other sort of factor around yeah that. i'm sorry i didn't yeah clarifying that you know this this could very much be a, a county city yes but the council has been clear let's get something going as soon as possible that's that's our intent and our desire but we have to work within the constraints. Council, yes. Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Matthews. Thank you, I was driving on River Street today. Uh, 415 F River Street is vacant. It's the old antique shop uh, across from Bay Federal and the Gateway Shopping Center. So that may be something that y'all can look into. I can't give direction, but just so you know, 415 F River Street. Um, and I, I just wanna speak briefly to what the Vice Mayor did, said, uh, I can understand and appreciate where you're coming from or trying to do, uh, but the language is very troubling as appropriate and as soon as possible. Now, that was where a lot of the conflict in February started was because of this claim that we didn't want meetings to go too long, we didn't have time in the agenda to agendize all these topics gonna take a long time to talk about, and it really sounds like we're going down that route again, brother, uh, to say, as appropriate and as soon as possible. I think we've heard from people in that are living the experience that right now is appropriate and as soon as possible <laughs> is literally the first meeting in January unless we do a, a, a new meeting so, or a special meeting. So, and even if it's just a report back about the process that's been made thus far so we can give additional direction or understand from the community where the catch is coming from as, we move into this new year and no matter what happens with this agenda or this motion, it's very troubling that there's the possibility that other things will be prioritized outside of human rights. That's, I, I get, the city has a lot of things to deal with, water, trash, you know, all the other kind of stuff, trans, transportation, but I don't think that those should take priority over some of the people that are suffering the most in our community. So I uh, implore you when you as mayor uh, this next year are building the agendas, you do not subscribe to that excuse of the meeting will go too long when dealing with issues of uh, human rights. And then also, you know, I, I'm a little troubled by the, the the removal of number six, I believe, which is the addition of the new catch member, because I do agree that the catch serves at our direction and uh, we were involved in the original appointment process, but we were involved in the original appointment process to ensure that there was diversity of representation, which is achieved now with six members uh, currently having lived or uh, currently experiencing homelessness. And it seems that we should give the catch some form of autonomy to be able to decide on the direction they wanna go with new people they wanna bring on without having to go through the council process because that'll only slow them down. I mean, if they meet, when do you meet next? 
Next week. Next week. Okay, so they meet next week. That means that next week they could have the conversation of adding someone new that will take some of the workload and help with their policy direction and move things forward. And this is the problem that I have with this body, is that we start with these great recommendations and then they slowly get whittled down until we have something that we can't take action on and even the things that we can uh, support them taking action on, we remove from the motion. So I'm just, I just have to say that. I wanna put a word of uh, hope for the vice mayor as he transitions into the agenda builder and point out that I think that we should be supporting them and adding a new member and not restricting them to have control over it. Okay, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings. Council okay, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Brown, and maybe we can go ahead and take the vote. Oh, uh, Councilmember Cummings. To that me. particular point, I think it would be entirely appropriate for the cash to consider uh, what qualities they might like to add to their membership. Um, and um, individually um, convey those suggestions, either individually or collectively convey those suggestions to the council committee. Just think when we appoint uh, all of our commissions, planning commissioners, parks and rec, water, all of them, if someone is forced to resign, we don't ask that commission to replace them, it comes back to us yeah, to replace. Okay. So, um, and then in terms of the uh, cash comments on the uh, any revisions to the camping ordinance, at the time that we directed that to go to the cash for comments, we also directed that it go out to the community at large. I think when you remember when that was on our agenda, we got um, comments from every direction that people wanted time to think about it and comment. So I think the, um, we, we wanna make sure that we are inclusive in our outreach for comments, um, certainly to the cash, but to others in the community who are interested. Okay. Yeah, great, Council just to keep that in mind. I want to agree with Council Member Glover on the point about allowing the catch to appoint a, another member. It's a request they're making to us. This council will recall um, that when we set up this committee, um, I actually was very determined to have the council um, consider additional representation of from unhoused people. And at that time, it was argued that we ought to leave that in the hands of the catch, and that mm -hmm. is what we did. And so coming around now, I would say that I think given the work they're doing, um, that and they, the request has been made by them, that since that was insisted upon in the past, we ought to be consistent and, um, and respond to their request by allowing them to, to make that determination. And they also could do that without having to wait until January. I think I'll just comment a little bit on that and see if maybe I can uh, see if we can. So, for example, there's one 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 position on the cash that was expressed by the council motion was um, someone who works with homeless youth, and I don't know that that's actually a member member on your uh, committee right now. There's others that there's other categories of membership, <coughs> and so. Um, I think it is important the council did create the cash. Um, there was intent around the membership. There was intent around the various sectors. There was intent around, frankly, the expertise that could be born in a group, a device, diverse group of people. And I think that that's, I think more of the intent is to make sure that, you know, the original working intent of the committee is kept and is, um, you know, consistent through from the beginning to the end of the process. Um, it's so I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna continue to to keep number six out uh, of the of the motion current concurrently. I would offer that we could break that out and make a motion um, to direct the cash to review the. Um, intended membership list and to work with the staff to review that, uh, review our existing applicant base and potentially also do um, targeted outreach to fill some of the um, open, open uh, seats that were described in the original, in the original intent for the committee. Um, that might be, and, and to bring that recommendation back to council. If I, if could you I want to respond, go yeah, ahead. And then we'll I mean, go ahead. That's and have very a different than saying uh, the council subcommittee is going to um, appoint another member for the catch. To say that the catch might actually work with the with the city staff or uh, to to try to come up with a candidate. That's a very different 
thing than than just cutting them out of the process entirely. So I'm fine with that. Okay, great. So it sounds like we have a compromise, which is great. Thank you for that. I want that as a separate motion. Uh, do you feel comfortable with incorporating that as I'm, how I'm you're happy to incorporate it in the So that was a friendly motion. amendment to the main motion made by Councilmember Myers to um, work with the cash, work with the city staff to identify those areas and then come up with a recommendation. And my intent really is the, for, to not disrupt the cash's work. I mean, it sounds like your your group has been ebbing and I think it's important that we not lose additional members. I think it's important that you keep doing your work. Um, if we interject, um, and I really think I wanna express the importance of actually really honoring that list and looking at that list very intentionally. Um, it's an important list that was thought out both by the council as a whole in our discussions and also the subcommittee. Um, so the intent is really to have that diversification on the committee, and so I hope that you know we'll you'll take the time to to to, to relook at that list, um, to do that work. Um, so yeah, do you okay. want me to restate the motion? Well, we'll go ahead and acknowledge if Councilor McCrone had anything else that he needed to add, and if not, we'll go ahead and then move to the motion to be restated and hopefully take a vote. Thank you, Mayor. So um, if I understand right, then they can work on that at their next meeting, work on selecting another person, or is that what you're saying? Is that, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, we are deliberating. Can you repeat what you said? So I'm just saying, if a uh, council member's saying that you all can work on getting another member at your next meeting. Okay, great. I think Thanks, I recommendation thought we were waiting for a motion. We're kind of watching okay. to see what I happens. I think essentially what, uh, if I could maybe interpret, my understanding is essentially saying, we um, acknowledge the interest of adding membership and we're also acknowledging the original intent about, about having a breadth of experience and representation, given that we're hopeful that the catch can take that into consideration with any kind of recommendations or outreach for additional membership in consultation with staff. Does that essentially cover it? Okay, is that clear? If I, if I may. Do um, not mean picking an, a, a member at your, at your meeting next week? I, I think we're all seeing eye to eye here. We want to have a diverse, um, diverse voices on the catch period. Um, I think what, why this actually was brought before you was because we felt like we needed to ask you permission in order to bring another person in. There was a lot of deliberation about, okay, well, we want another person, but oh wait, we might actually have to ask. So that's the only reason why this is before you right now. And yeah. we, we want a diversity of opinion and thought and um, resources. Thank you for that. The other okay. issues I have, uh, you talked about funding the warming center. Well, are you gonna include that in the motion or? It's not my motion, so I was not intending to include it. I was planning to recommend another motion after this is after it's concluded. Okay, okay. and um, what about the Loudon Nelson bathrooms? Um, it's, it's pretty. Uh, I'm she's moving the cash re recommendation. The cash which recommendation. Is not to open the, reopen this. It was an eight to four vote, and the one person just came to the podium and said they missed the meeting, so if it was a nine to four vote, they would have been recommending that they open the bathrooms. Um, the uh, five million dollars from the state, uh, the cash was talking about, um, we, we all gonna, wanted to recommend some, pro the, 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 I guess the, the application is due February 15th. Are you all gonna come forward with uh, recommendations for that? Do you need direction from us? Are you directing your question at um, the cash at this? Yeah. Okay. Do you feel you clear about the question? Bring Megan or report? Ron uh, okay. back forward. Yeah, please, absolutely you can. Do you wanna repeat your question? Because I understand that the, there's um, $5 million available in state funding, but we have to get our applications in by February 15th. And I was wondering if the cash wanted to, you know, input on that. Uh, Council Member Crone, uh, if I may. Um, talking to the county, they haven't actually developed the process. They're not sure if they're doing RFPs, what they're doing, so it's too early to understand the glide path on that. We do know the February 15th uh, date looms, but until the county decides what kind of process they're gonna implement. Um, you know, I think on your list here are things that would qualify for, uh, to include in an application, but I think we need to see know, how they're gonna go about it. Last year they did the big elaborate RFP process and we just don't know if that's gonna play out the same way this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and maybe take the vote at this time. Do we feel the need to repeat the um, motion before us? Either? No? I have to watch the committee friendly amendments. I have to watch the video. Okay, 
Okay, so um, thank you again, cash members, for being here and sticking with us, as well as Mr. Keeley. We'll go ahead and take the vote. Motion by Councilmember Matthew, I mean Myers, seconded by myself. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Councilmember Brown. I'd like to make a motion that we agendize for the first meeting in January consideration of an allocation of $10,000 to the warming center for the Second. So there's a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover to have that as a future agenda item for consideration for allocation, Councilmember Crone. Would you be willing to add a friendly amendment to put the Loudon Nelson bathrooms on there too? Um, I think n not at this time. I, I think that that's a, co a longer conversation we have to have. I, I did want to clarify that the fifth, the other, the vote that would have the basic, it wasn't a, a vote to actually open the bathrooms. The additional vote would have blocked um, because they wouldn't have had a two thirds majority. So there was not a majority um, uh, view on the, the catch that we move in that direction at this time. I think it is a bigger conversation about the budget and I'm absolutely willing to have that conversation. I don't know that January 14th um, is the time given that we didn't we, Thank you. we referred it to the catch and, and they said, don't do it. So I, I, I'd want to honor that. Thank you for that correction. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, that passes with Councilmember Matthews voting against. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, before we go ahead and um, we're going to take a five minute recess. I'm going to go ahead and ask that those who want to stay for the presentation of the um, uh, outgoing remarks from mayor, incoming remarks and swearing in of the next mayor and vice mayor, you're welcome to stay. If you are family and um, connected to uh, Either of these folks that uh, need to have uh, some reserve seating, those are available for you in the front. If you're not here for that process, I invite you um, at this time while we have a brief recess to um, leave and we'll reconvene in about five minutes from now. Okay, thank you. Of uh, this evening's agenda. Um, so we have two presentations and they are um, first, the remarks um, by myself as outgoing mayor, and then we'll go ahead and move right into the swearing in and remarks by incoming mayor and vice mayor. So we'll go ahead and just jump right into it. Okay. Um, so I, um, as mayor, will just take a few minutes to make a few remarks, but before I do, I have to display my derby girl mayor name. And um, mayors who uh, uh, are, during their term, are given a derby girl uh, name or derby person name, <laughs> depending on your gender. <laughs> For me, it's a derby girl. And so my derby name was Mayor Swatkins. <laughs> so um, this is just a recognition that I will answer by either as former Mayor Watkins or former Mayor Swatkins, depending <laughs> on the uh, location. Um, so in, in, in all seriousness, I, I really just have a few remarks that I want to make and then I um, will graciously hand over the gavel. I really want to say thank you. And I wanna say thank you that to the people of Santa Cruz. I am so grateful um, to have been your mayor this past year. It's been a privilege and an honor to serve um, the city and I uh, thank you for making our city so wonderful. I wanna thank our city staff uh, for the commitment and dedication in serving our city. We have a stellar staff, whether it be at our city manager level, parks and rec planning, SCPD, uh, fire, public works, who am I missing, water, <laughs> all of them, every single one at all levels. I thank you. You know, we are one of seven that are part of hundreds who serve our, our community and serve our city and I thank you for your service as well. Um, lastly, I wanna thank my family and um, my husband, Brandon, who's here, um, our daughters, Evangeline and Winnell, um, who are five and nine, uh, my parents, Michael and Ann, my brother, Justin, my in-laws, and um, all of our village. And I, I, I say them and I mean it when I say that I hold them here with me every time I'm here because it truly takes a village for me to be able to serve. And I acknowledge that and I am most grateful for that. 
Um, I really do try to balance adhering to uh, governance and try to be a leader who listens to members of the community, um, who is reflective and um, demonstrates to community members and to our children that we can lead and govern from a foundation of respect. I have a few reflections from this past year I'd like to highlight and I was reviewing some of the comments that I made in the incoming year and I'm really, I'm really proud of these highlights. So this past year I had an opportunity to meet with community members, coalitions, youth, seniors, nonprofit, health, education, business, and environmental partners to create a vision for a healthy, sustainable, and equitable community. And as I sure everyone in this room knows, the issues facing our city are extremely complex, whether it be affordable housing, we just heard an item on homelessness, climate change, transportation, social mobility, aging infrastructure, you name it. And it all requires collaborative and upstream solutions. And I um, want to say I am so proud of our commitment to move the Health and All Policies Initiative forward, which we had the second reading this afternoon of that ordinance, because it holds really truly unlimited opportunities to integrate preventative policies, to increase government efficiency, and to factor community well-being into every single decision that we make. And I will continue to champion that initiative moving forward. And similarly, we had the Children's Fund, and also earlier today, we adopted a method to move forward with the child care impact fee. And that's a really great example what, of health and all policies in action. And I cannot wait till the day comes when I get to see the children who were able to access our parks and rec programs who may not otherwise have been able to or had early childhood development opportunities for the same reasons. Those are the types of investments I'm so, so proud of this past year. I have to say that I, um, ha I have experienced incredible strengths of the city and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge our observed challenges as well. And the tenor of some of our council, member, council meetings, excuse me, at times uh, really does parallel some of the national political atmosphere. And our work is to passionately advocate at all levels for things that we care about. And at times, sure, have some of those contentious conversations. Yet I feel we undermine our commitment to a thriving community if we allow caustic discord to dominate our meetings and discourage our community members from engaging in public discourse, participation, and service. And, and moving forward, I encourage all of us in the community and on the dais to seek compromise. And I say you can seek compromise without compromising your values because we know that unyielding positions will always hinder forward progress. And truly, frankly, that's foundational to our democracy. So as we transition, it's my hope that we can recalibrate and affirm our common purpose. We live in an incredible city and we all play a role in con contributing to the community well-being of our beloved community. Whether it be we're celebrating a business opening or supporting a nonprofit or seeking collaboration with a community partner, it's these moments that always remind me and keep me grounded of the strengths of our city and at this time leave me feeling truly optimistic for the future of Santa Cruz. So I will say in conclusion, it's been my honor to serve as city, the city, it's been my honor to serve as your mayor. And as I move from mayor to council member, I commit to supporting a successful transition. And as I, in a moment, hand over our gavel or this gavel here to our incoming mayor, Justin Cummings, and then future mayor, um, incoming vice mayor, Donna Myers, I want to remind us all that their success is our success, it's a shared success. And I implore the community, I implore this council to support them. I commit to supporting them as we now transi transition into this next chapter for our city. I thank you all for your service. I thank you all for your uh, support in me as mayor and I wish um, the next chapter to be successful and it's my pleasure to now hand over the gavel to our incoming mayor and vice mayor. So thank you. Thank you, Taj. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
please, we'll go ahead and now introduce the next section of this um, item, which is to have the swearing and remarks of the mayor and vice mayor. And I'll go ahead and hand it over to our city clerk. I don't know who goes first. Is it the vice mayor sworn in first? First, and we'll do the swearing in, and then I'll swear in um, Mayor Cummings, and then they can take the receipts just after that. Okay. I, Donna Myers, do solemnly affirm, do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, the Constitution of the State of California, against all enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic, that I will bear, that I will bear, true faith and allegiance, true faith and allegiance to the Constitution. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the Great State of California, that I will take this obligation freely. That I will take this obligation freely, without any reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon, discharge the duties upon which I am about. To out which I'm about to enter. Close, yes. Close enough. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I, Justin Cummings, do solemnly affirm, do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution, Constitution of the State of California, against all enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic, that I will bear, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, true faith and allegiance to the Constitution, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution. Constitution of the State of California. That I will take this obligation freely. I will take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or, pur or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. On which I'm about to enter. <laughs> I guess we'll start by remarks from our vice mayor, Donna Myers. <laughs> well, it's it's late in the evening, and I want to um, really let Justin um, enjoy his first uh, his first few minutes as mayor. But I do want to just say a couple of things and a couple of thank yous. Um, it is an incredibly um, exciting and terrifying thing to be become a city council member. Um, and so your first year is really spent um, learning in so many different ways. And um, you really learn how quickly you don't know really what you're doing, um, even from minute to minute sometimes it feels like. So I have many thank yous um, to offer tonight and I just wanna run through those very quickly and I just also just wanna close with one little statement. Um, I really want to actually thank uh, Council Member Cynthia Matthews, who's been in these chairs at different parts in her career here. Um, I think I have learned a lot from her in terms of she's always seeking to try to make something work. And um, I've seen her 
work on motions um, over and over here in her chair and try to teach the rest of us how to, how to make a quality motion. Um, she's also bold enough to tell us very directly what she thinks is gonna work and what she doesn't believe is the right thing to do. And um, I've learned a lot from her honesty. I've learned a lot from her mentorship. And um, so I just want to thank you. <laughs> I want to thank my colleagues here also tonight. I've learned a lot from all of them. Every, everyone brings a different perspective to, this, to these seats. Um, different family perspectives, different economic perspectives, all kinds of, you know, and, and difference is, is the wonder of the world, right? So as a scientist, that's the thing we respect the most when we study nature is the amazing diversity of nature. And we don't always understand the purposes of that diversity, but we just know that that's what makes nature special. So um, diversity is incredibly, in, 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 uh, incredibly um, important for all societies, whether that's nature or other cultures or whatever, if we lose diversity, um, we, we will lose humanity. So um, it's incredibly important that we always keep that in mind as we work together. And I just really appreciate the diversity of opinion, the diversity approach um, that we've been able to experience this first year. Um, I wanna thank our staff it's been an incredibly trying year in so many different ways. And um, I hold our staff uh, very, very high in my heart. And they work really hard for all of the citizens of Santa Cruz and they do their best. And um, I believe that truly. And um, we demand a lot of very um, intensive work from them. And uh, so I truly wanna thank all of you I think your um, leadership in our community and how you um, try to help us solve some of the really hard problems that we have, that we're facing right now um, is really meaningful to all of us that, you know, try to do this day to day. I wanna thank my amazing wife of 34 years. <laughs> And, um, and many, many dear neighbors and dear friends, uh, my brother and his wife and my three nieces that live here in town, um, to the people who come up and give me a hug in the, in, the, in the grocery store as well. And I just really only have, I just have one hope for the year ahead. And, um, and really that is if you see someone you think you may not agree with or hold the same values with, that the first thing you do is you first reach out to say hello with a smile and a meaningful handshake and that you sit down over a cup of coffee or tea or a beer or a cocktail or a meal and you get to know one another and then you talk and listen to one another because if we lose those basic principles of humanity, we're never gonna fix anything in this town or in this nation and it's too important right now. Make this decision tonight. <coughs> Stop calling each other names and start getting to work. Yeah. If you don't get to work. <laughs> not gonna change anything. So Justin and I are gonna make a great team. We're both scientists. And we know there's there's no we know there's no assurity in the things that you do because Science is always a mystery, but if you don't try to, to at least diagnose and get things done, it's never gonna change. So um, I really look forward to working with Justin. I look forward to working with all my colleagues. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. Congratulations. <laughs> hard one to come behind. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to just start by, um, you know, thanking uh, friends, families, members of, of the community for being here. I'd like to also thank my mother, my brother Kenneth, my cousin Kalinda, and my three-year-old nephew Carter for making the trip here for this historic occasion, and for everyone who was able to come here tonight. And also from the, for those of you who are tuning in from their homes, um, it's an honor 
to have the opportunity to serve and represent the city in its highest civic capacity. Next year, we will be entering not only a new year, but a new decade of great importance. For those of us who are millennials, Generation Xers, and baby boomers, 2020 was a distant future that we could only try to imagine many years ago. For the children, teenagers, and young adults of our community, their future will depend on the decisions that we make today. And as we enter 2020, we should all take some time to look back in hindsight, to learn from our successes and improve from our failures, anticipate what is to come, and use this information to help inform our decisions which will help shape our future. During this past year, um, the City Council at two retreats this body, had, I'm sorry, this body had during 2019, there were at least one session during each of those meetings where we discussed what we loved about Santa Cruz and our vision for the future of Santa Cruz. And when the council members and the staff reported out, there was overwhelmingly a shared vision. We all wanted to see a community that was age and family friendly, was environmentally sustainable, affordable, safe, inclusive, economically stable, and embrace people of all races, genders, ethnicities, socioeconomic classes, among many other descriptions. And as the mayor of Santa Cruz, I'm committed to working with you, the community, towards continuing to make this vision our reality. The work to achieve this vision will require patience, dedication, commitment, collaboration, and sacrifice. And it will not happen overnight. It's gonna require considering new and sometimes even radical approaches, adopting strategies implemented by other communities, and sometimes taking a chance by trying something new. More importantly, it's going to require listening to different perspectives and working with people who you may not always agree with to find common ground so we continue moving forward. Santa Cruz is not alone in the many challenges it faces. Having traveled to the League of California Cities meeting this year, both in Sacramento and Long Beach, attended the Democratic State Convention as a delegate, met and worked with numerous regional representatives and represented Santa Cruz at regional meetings, the two most common challenges the communities were facing throughout California uh, were homelessness and affordable housing. Communities throughout California are also trying to do their part to become more environmentally sustainable, and we're all concerned with trying to reduce our carbon footprint to mitigate global warming. However, we all face the challenges of not having enough financial resources to do everything we would like, which is why, although we may not be able to do everything, as your mayor, I intend to work with our community members and regional partners to do the most and best we can with the resources that we have. To me, collaboration is the key to success, and the more diverse the collaborators and collaboration, the greater the potential for success. It is an opportunity to share ideas and gain perspectives that you may not have previously considered and by listening to one another and trying to find common ground, we'll be moving one step closer to bring our community back together. There are going to be many topics that come up in 2020. As we continue to address homelessness in our community, we must strike a balance between compassionate solutions and public safety for both our unhoused and housed members of our community. This is gonna take members from all sectors of our community to come together to address what is one of the single big, biggest issues at the state and national level. As we continue to address affordable housing, our affordable housing crisis, we must work together to create programs that keep tenants in their homes and off the streets, while also allowing landlords to get fair returns on their investments. As we create more dense housing, we must create policies that incentivize the production of more affordable housing so that we can maintain housing for our current residents and our city workforce. More importantly, we need to focus on creating policies that keep Santa Cruz on track to becoming a more environmentally sustainable city. As a biologist, I'm deeply committed to working with our staff to bring forward a climate action plan and work on policies that keep us at the forefront of environmental sustainability. As we move into 20, we must also take the time to stop, listen to one another, and find ways to work with one another. We must stay focused on our shared vision of a safe, environmentally sustainable Santa Cruz and a diverse place where everyone is welcome. And finally, I would just like to say how much this, con this community continues to inspire me. 
In a town where less than 1.6% of the population is African American, you elected the two first African American men and the first open lesbian woman to the city council in 2018. This truly reflects our commitment as a community to electing officials not based on their race, age, or gender, but based on the content of their character. As I follow in the footsteps of our first multiracial African-American woman mayor, as the first African-American man and millennial mayor, <laughs> I will continue to support the creation and implementation of policies that promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and civility in our community. And I, care, and I encourage all people of Santa Cruz, especially those of the younger generations, to apply to be on commissions, to participate in community engagement, speak at city council meetings, and to be a part of our local government. I would like to thank our city staff and city employees for all that they do to keep the city functioning. I've learned an immense amount from working with all of you this year, and I'm really looking forward to learning so much more in this year as mayor. And I also wanna thank everyone in this community who continue to work towards our vision for a diverse, equitable, affordable, inclusive Santa Cruz, and let's be an example for the rest of our country. And finally, I'm looking forward to working with all my fellow city council members. I've learned an immense amount from working with you all and want to find as many ways to continue working with this body. So with that, um, I would like to just say, um, as the incoming mayor, I wish everyone a happy holiday. Thank you all for coming, and we will adjourn until January of 2020.